Paranoid Chapter 101 In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. But war, war is my profession. Unlike these naive Astartes, who view war as a challenge for honor and glory, I am different. Always looking for efficient solutions and conservation of health. Humanity may have numbers, but those numbers are horrifically mismanaged. Most of the times, the numbers work against the Imperium, which is so spread out over immense, mind-boggling distances that it cannot even protect its citizens. And so, I need to use Primarch Khan to protect humanity, while myself figure out a way to save it. Blank genes against the chaos, the genes of the Catacan spread as much as possible for physical endurance, then weapons, armor, and strategy to convert this future strength into striking power. Primarch Khan now wears a catacan style flak suit, with blackstone armor plates inserted to protect vital body parts. Also, a refractor field on his belt, and a catacan style adamantium knife at his hip. He did get to live among my troops for a time, and it shows. The white penitent's robe has been converted into a cape, with the cowl lowered right now. I open my palms, and a data slate filled with real and fake STC patterns appears in my right hand, and a null rod in the other. Were this null batten at all times, Astartes. Half of your brothers have already fallen to warp insinuations and lies. Don't make me have to find you again. The artifact has been sheathed in a centimeter of blackstone as well, by my lamenter master of the forge, giving it increased resistance against brute force. Premarch are very similar to Ogrins, after all, prone to rip off doors or heads in fits of rage, or just by being careless. Plus he might need to smack some demon with it. Khan picks the rod with suspicion, as he knows it would restrict some of his psyker based powers. I won't be able to fight or duel with this, the Primarch complains like a big child. Yes, but you do have your white scar sons to slice things up for you. Now go and talk with the crazy Inquisitor on the Space Fortress. And then, do what you can for the Imperium. Armed sentinels and missile boats I'd say, but then I don't have a say in the ruling of the Imperium. The High Lords might kill you anyway, for usurping their powers with your simple existence. I explain in a gentle voice, and deposit him right next to Captain Thrasius of the sides of the Emperor Space Marine Chapter. My Inquisitor raises an eyebrow at my unceremonious conduct. You would actually punch Sanguinius, like you said. Nothing seems to scare you, not even a pre-march. I actually would, but not in public. Right, Canis? You hamstring the vainglorious father, while I punch his teeth out. With my left hand, of course. I mutter in a cheerful tone, and scratch my wolf on his smart head. Woof, the wolf wonders and shows his deadly teeth, somehow doubting he could bite anyone without grievous damage. Nah, not for real, clever wolf. I just don't enjoy the burden he left on my shoulders. Sanguinius should have sent the invincible swordmaster to fight, or even better, teleported a nova shell inside that traitor's battleship and stopped the whole tragedy in a single blow. But no, why not die in a pointless duel? I commented in a disgusted voice. Rose sighs and waves Ludvias outside, before his blood tears flood the room and make a mess on the carpet. The Astartes stomps loudly as he leaves, and crashes the armored door with an angry and violent gesture. Maybe I was too open and honest, for this universe. Perhaps it is better if you do not return to the Imperium, at all. Your own bodyguard was ready to bite your head off, my girlfriend demands in a cold voice. Exactly my thought, dear Rose. Except for small incursions that would save trillions of lives. Maybe. I still need to visit Sotha once in a while. There are like 900 trillion trillions of Tyranids heading this way and hoping to eat everyone. I grumble in a meeker voice. Also, that fact is very true, and kinda worrying, if not that urgent, not yet. Plus that world engine of the Necrons, when it did come out, I'll really have to come back to Sotha and mess it up. Not for a decade you will not, P.E.F. Lancefire. You are on thin ice, and these exploits do not expunge your unruly conduct, only forgive it, due to extenuating circumstances, the Inquisitor proclaims with an accusing voice. I shrug and hold a finger up. Right. 
Do order these scythes to seal up and tow that Tau battleship they have miraculously captured to forge Metallica. And then, start preparing a large infiltration force of fake defectors from your Stormtrooper regiment. We'll need as many humans inserted into the Tau ranks and pinpoint valuable technology to steal. All of these infiltrators should receive the strongest mental hardening procedure that your Inquisition has. Those ethereals use a type of mind control similar to the enslavers, but I do have a potential material for a mental shield. With those words, I produce a couple enslaver bones and leave them floating in midair. Is this a mineral? No, it's organic but somehow resisting my soul readings. A type of Eldar wraith bone? Rose wonders as she attempts to scan the floating bones and her psyker probing fails. Thus, I take out my bone staff and leave it floating as well. I believe is indeed a type of rare creature's bone. I had my own staff made by a powerful artificier, but those services are paid in precious commodities like greater demons or Eldar avatars. Maybe a tan shard, if you're willing to sell the one in the Pharos. I ask in a teasing voice. She scowls at my words and shakes her head. Again with that kind of outrageous trades. Also, did you have anything to do with those out-of-time Astartes showing up on some Forge worlds millennia after they were thought dead or lost in the warp? I nod slowly. Just like your Inquisitor buddy on the Ajata Fortress, the ungrateful bastard. I traded some captured Eldar and their artifacts, and this person happened to have a collection of Astartes. I also saw an Adeptus Custodes among the shelves, but didn't have anything of equal value to trade. But, that was then, I do have some Dark Eldar now, all their Archons in fact, so I might get a new deal. Her Ordo Zeno's teachings come forward abruptly, as she grabs my chin. What else did you steal from Kamarak? I sob in Rogue Trader pain, and start disclosing some of it. Okay, most of it. I'm just too weak in the hands of an Inquisitor, I'm sure everyone can understand that. Much later, she rests on my chest, all her energy spent in deep but vigorous interrogation. Damn lucky, rogue traitor. Too bad most of your collection cannot be put to use. You'd burn on the first pyre the Imperium could throw. And we're very good at setting up pyres. Rose complains as her hand measures my increased musculature. Not yet at Astarte's level, but getting there. Maybe a decade or five. Mind shields, Tau enslavers, and null rods. I don't even have access to such a rare relic, my beloved murmurs in a completely fake pity. She just wants one too. I shall trade for this guy's best work then. A staff that's both a mind shield and a warp shield, and can also fly or crush tanks with one blow. Maybe a mind shielding Rosarius too. And the same for Janice and Victor. Who knew that having a big family will be so expensive? I complain in fake pity as well. Just at that second, the other Inquisitor encounters the lost Primarch and tries to have him arrested. Damn Cretan. He vanishes in my labyrinth as a sign of Emperor's displeasure. What? Don't believe me? It says right here on my warrant. My words are the Emperor's words and I speak with his voice. Come, my dear. You return to Ajida and support the Primarch, while I try to close the Hadex anomaly with my trader skills. And they say rogue traders are good for nothing. I mutter in fake annoyance as I open the door to call Ludvias back. Dressing in Astarte's power armor isn't that easy. Might need to have the tech priests design some kind of automated dressing room. And then use a thousand convicts to test the kinks out. Maiming and mutilations from faulty wiring is not a pleasant prospect. Especially not for my own limbs, so make that 2,000 convicts. Much safer that way. Rose dresses by herself, because leather isn't that hard to dress into. Not all that protective either, so I should consider giving her the Silent Sisters kind of armor, just painted in gold and black. You were working hard, I see. New baby on the way, my brother asks in a curious voice. I just smile sheepishly and give him a thumb up. Very likely, considering how much gene seed I spent today. Send me to my room, deck 11. Just next to Janice. Rose commands in a stern voice once she is ready. 
I obey, and she vanishes from my blackstone vault of a room without the familiar purple flash of a teleporter. My tesseract is quite the cheat, I know. Sadly, I have to walk towards the teleportarium, escorted by my blood angels and silent companions. Well, they have seen the Pharos anyway, during the expedition for Chronoblades. We will need to repeat that exploit, and try to find more life-draining blades or hexagramic necklaces that can block out warp intrusions. In near company strength, they depart to the desert artifact world on another looting expedition, after I scan the orbit for more Tau vessels. This time, there is only the side strike cruiser and their captured prize, getting patched up for warp towing. Mighty Zaryulash, someone has been cruel to you. I observe as the tan is three times more dissected now than before. The young inquisitor tries his best, and I can fake pain and screaming very well. Doesn't really bother me, as you can imagine, P.E.F. Lancefire, the tan replies in a proud voice. I nod upsetly, as I doubt even an exterminatus would bother him. In the other timeline, they did blow up the planet with a cyclonic torpedo, and that only released the tan from his shackles. Maybe a vortex warhead would work. Multidimensional weapons did tend to ignore any type of defense or durability, just like that soul spear I sold to Trazen. And speaking of the devil. Necron Lord, you have been really busy. I comment while scanning his new collection. More army regiments, some navy ships, even a few titans and an ordinatus underscoreulator on huge tracks. Ah, my favorite stranger. Yes, some scoundrels tried to attack Salamis. Friends of yours, perhaps? Trazen the Infinite asks in a suspicious voice. I snort in amusement. I take it you peeked into Forge Venatoria and stole something of value. And perhaps also blasted Hell Forge Xana into small bits of screaming rocks and burning souls. This better be worth it, puppy stranger. I lost three subordinates on this quest, all valiantly fighting to the last scrap of Necrodermis while posing as myself, the Necron mutters in a proud voice. I sigh and push a Drukari Archon, without weapons or armor which all sold separately, right into his robotic hands. I caught the thief who tried to steal your Nightbringer. Now that Kamarak is gone, Dark Eldar items will become a rarity, as with all extinct species. Really? Well, it is easy to check, oh. Someone burned it all to the ground. And there's Tyranids feasting on dead corpses everywhere. Such a mess. Trazen replies after a minute. The Necron probably has a saved point there, after I sold him that expensive ticket to my first attempt. I do have a picked video of an Eldar avatar and a Keeper of Secrets dueling in the middle of High Kamarak, right as an Astartes battle barge detonates an Exterminatus torpedo on top of them both. After some 30 seconds of the last timestamp, the area will be clear of witnesses, except those two protagonists which just wouldn't die. If only someone had the skill and patience to send an observer and collect those engines of destruction for a complete set. What use is a craft word council without an avatar, right? I whisper in his mind, while Trazen plays dress-up doll with the insane Dark Eldar Archon I have just gifted him. I see, you have been there already, collecting all the Archons and who knows how many relics and rare people. Now the timeline is looped by your Tesseract and I can only arrive later. Trazen complains in a timed doctor manner. It wasn't my intention to protect the timeline, but it does work out perfectly. So, the reality cage and the reality bombs? I demand an awry voice. You will need ten battleship strength reactors to power up a planetary size reality cage, even after I repaired a thousand flaws in this device and made it a thousand times simpler to construct, just like that warp-less drive. Or, you can bury the device deep under the planetary crust and use a single reactor for magnetic conversion. This deep core cage is a distinct invention of my own creation and is sold separately, the genius Necron offers as a starting point and holds the data slate with my device. Reality cage, and a working one. I was pretty sure he also copied the magnetic power mechanism from a forge world, maybe even Venatoria, but whatever. It would actually make the STC template more believable and reduce the risk of sabotage too. 
it would be more difficult to infiltrate a saboteur under a hundred kilometer of boiling magma. With another flick of the Pharos, I handed him a Drakari Void Mind and an Eldar Pulse Underscore Laser. Both weapons would make amazing weapons for humanity if only we had the science to build them. We don't, but a certain Necron surely does. I'm quite certain even a Necron Overlord would be annihilated inside the barrier once that fragment of dark light detonates. You may use it on a hated enemy once I get a simplified STC schematic. The pulse laser is actually too advanced for my friends, and it needs to be dumbed down such that even a human can use it or a tech priest repair it from an STC pattern. I explain in a cheerful voice. An enemy of mine. Killed by a dark Eldar weapon. Now this would be a master stroke he ponders for a long time. Already figuring out how the void mine works. That's great for him, but Trazen might have too many enemies, and not all domestic. I just wait, as my people exploring the desert world for more artifacts will take time. Not attacking human, Eldar, or Tau targets. I kinda need them for my plans, just like I do for your own dynasty. As for payment, I will offer a null rod. Everyone should have one of these, with the galaxy infested by psychers and warp entities. I demand as he begins writing on a STC data slate. And thus, I get the geomagnetic reactor as well. One worry will soon be reduced, with planet-sized Geller fields enforcing reality and preventing warp incursions. Oh, that would be a decent trade. However, I reserve the right to defend my world even from those three races. Perhaps without lethal force, if I'm in a good mood, the overlord allows in a perky voice. Well, null rods are very rare indeed. I only have four of them, and already two are given away, to Khan and Trazen. I accept your claim, Lord Trazen. But, I need an STC template for a simpler to build null rod. And then, a few quality items for some special people. A couple of enslaver bone staffs, and a dual-use null and bone staff that will still allow minimal psyker powers for the user. From beta level to delta. I ask as my trading goods appear in his room. He stops to consider my words, and fails at first. Blocking everything is doable, with some effort. But blocking the warp and still attacking with it, even at lower strength? Is that even possible? Trazen mutters in real confusion. Generally, no, these qualities are antithetical. Unless, there's a bloodline flaw to exploit. I will provide gene samples for the user, because the staff needs to be gene-coded, and from a relative of hers, with both the pariah gene and the psyker gene. Also, that null staff should have inquisitorial decorations. I'm sure you know perfectly well how inquisitors like to present themselves. I explain in a patient voice. I send a few locks of hair from Rose and Janice and hope for the best. With a gene-coded staff, Trazen would be capable of tracing my Rose anywhere in the galaxy. Oh well. I was probably too paranoid. Nicholas, Chapter 102 Under Rose's commands, the Ajita becomes all of a sudden friendly and welcoming, and thus I fill their prison dungeon with those 300 Mantis warriors I have rescued from the siege at Forge Angstrom. Their own premarch is here to chastise them after all, since the Mantis were a successor chapter of the White Scars. The crew of a Mantis cruiser also appears in the adjacent cells, while their Mantis strike cruiser simply appears on a tangent course with the Inquisitorial Fortress, with a single tech priest on the bridge. Should be enough to allow an honor guard and an independent vessel for the premarch, at least till Ultramar. When you reach the Segmentum Solar, do investigate Hive World Necromunda and that rich house with an STC in their basement. That should buy you some standing with the Cult Mechanicus on Mars. You also have a gift in the Ajita's dungeon. I mentally tell Primarch Khan, while I observe the local Death Watch Astartes move around him with proud but wary faces. Primarchs were all considered lost, but here he was, walking among them, looking rather beat up and sad. Is that you, P.E.F. Lancefire? I thought this null rod stops all psyker powers, the giant replies in my mind, seeming surprised. I'm a blank, Astartes. So obviously, I'm not transmitting via a psyker method. Something to study in the future, no doubt. 
military orders sent mind to mind, without chance of interference or distortion by the warp, might prove valuable for humanity. Then again, what do I know? I answer in a self-deprecating tone. Khan doesn't quite believe my meek demeanor anymore, although I wonder why. I was kind of harsh with him, at first, I admit. But he was also unruly and not in control of himself. What house, on that hive world, the pre-march asks in an annoyed voice. Someone very rich with advanced weapons they make themselves. Nothing like a poor rogue trader like myself can even approach. And look, there's even a cruiser hitting your way. Almost like someone wants to leave at great speed before this system is attacked again. I explain in a cheerful voice and turn off the connection. Then I resume my family overwatch, directing my fleet of missile destroyers and frigates to rescue that forage in the siege underscore of underscore hypnoth, and try to obtain an STC pattern for the advanced augury scanner called the I underscore of underscore hypnoth. With 25 escorts and two Nova cannon cruisers, we should provide sufficient surprise to gain a major favor from that forge world, plus another for the STC data slate carried by Went Ian. Meanwhile, my bodyguard company and the Silent Sisters keep exploring the artifact planet and close a couple more demon portals for a single hexagramic necklace and two more chronoblades. Oh well, perhaps this was it. They keep searching though, while I pinpoint the rest of the planets around Illavar for the next expansion phase, noting down a thousand star systems possibly rich in minerals and a hundred habitable planets. The Vitrix's captain, my dear daughter Teresa, receives those mental imprints with rough astronomic distances for each trip, so she can already plan the route and create a circle of outposts and small mining sites, depositing tech priests and servitors at each stop. Of course, only a blank captain gets a battleship, and even most of her bridge crew are blanks from my officer academy, plus thousands of retribution tech priests and a hundred thousand servitors with piratical origins. Victor receives his inheritance, the fourth tesseract with a hundred ships inside, including the other overlord-class battlecruiser I captured at Badab, plus a chronoblade and my old power armor. He was already ruling the hive world, but now he would have the means to rule it absolutely. Dad, it is really okay to give me all this power? I can see everything on the planet, and everything in the system, till the most distant comets. Don't you need it? Victor asks after downloading the manual on with his savant implant. Bring comets and asteroids closer in a high orbit, and begin building more forts and corvette shipyards, plus a repair dock for those destroyers. There are a trillion trillions tyranids hitting your way. I answer in a softer voice. Oh. I better get started then. And I think you have another labyrinth like this, right? My son wonders after powering up the savant functions. Smart boy. Anyway, teleporting a tesseract filled with goodies from Sotha to Illavar is a great way to transport an entire fleet from one end to the other of an entire segmentum. I can't send a fleet to Ball and help my sons that way, but I can gift them Terminator Pattern Astartes armors covered in blackstone plates and personal force fields and Archaeotech weapons like melee power weapons and grav guns or conversion beamers. And I do. They may all be blank and immune to warp, but they are flesh and bones. And knowing what blood angels get into all the time, I want my sons to emerge victorious and alive, all two hundred of them. Am I cheating? Sure I am. But the galaxy is merciless, and those detractors to the blank program, even among the blood angels, will have to swallow their words. They shall be my finest warriors, and great armor shall I clad them, and with the mightiest guns they shall be armed, such that no foes can best them in battle. The emperor said about his Astartes. The emperor had the right idea, just didn't see it through. You said no foes, dear Adam, but what about chaos and the warp? Did you make them blank, or at least give them null rods? What about Silent Sisters as escorts and informants for the Primarchs? No, you did not, and thus half of them fell or rebelled and nailed you to your throne. Not to mention tactics and strategies. Sure, Big E possibly envisioned a billion of Astartes, cleansing the galaxy of Xenos or Rogue Psychers, while erasing all religions they found. Didn't work quite like that. 
even himself went to duel his wayward son in a sword fight instead of telefragging that Horus Moron with a plasma warhead. I turned back to searching the Ultima Segmentum for targets of opportunity, just as Rose beams inside the Pharos. Inquisitor Barzano better appear again, perhaps after the Primarch leaves. And what's with those prisoners in my dungeons? My Rose asks while eyeing the crucified tan on the cave's wall with distrust. The Mantis guys? Well, they are Khan's sons, aren't they? I hear the High Lords imposed a penance of their chapter for being fooled into that rebellion. The pre-march is on penance too, so they fit rather well, right? I ask in a careless voice. So you're imposing penance even on pre-marks now, the Inquisitor growls in a colder voice. Those guilty of dereliction of duty, sure. Vulcan, Russ, and Dorn among them. Lion and Robud lie wounded and in stasis, so I reserve judgment for now. As for my own pre-march, dear Sanguinius does as much as he can from beyond the grave. I might need a god of the dead to bring him back, and for that I have worked hard. I explain as an atmospheric incendiary appears beside me. Killing people, to revive an Eldar god, the Ordo Zenos asks in a deathly voice. No sacrifice is too great. No treachery too small. I quote while I begin priming the exterminator's torpedo. Where is this munition going? My Rose asks curious. Hadex Anomaly, again. There's a chaos fleet gathering in the Blood Underscore Trinity, more specifically at Matterus 3. They are also conscripting a billion of the local cultists, so I shall consign their souls to. I mutter as the weapon vanishes from the Pharos and detonates right under the infamous Carnage-class cruiser Black Grail and its attendant fleet. In a minute, the planet burns and none of the traitors escape the flames, incinerated along with all the weapon factories and demon engines they were preparing. Two more torpedoes appear beside me, but I'm no hurry to exhaust myself. The other two planets in the Matterus system don't have fleets, and their heretical inhabitants can only wail in despair, knowing what fiery inferno awaits. Oblivion You would make a great inquisitor, my dear P.E.F. Rose whispers while her tarot cards spin in the air, and yet refuse to fall. I think I have sufficient power for now. So, you heard of Inquisitor Crippman's plan to burn all the worlds in the path of the Tyranids? Without evacuation, of course. I'm used to myself, while keeping watch for my Astartes battling another demon incursion. That's, how many worlds are we talking about? The Inquisitor asks in a calculating voice. Well, burning worlds is a sad but realistic choice in this grim future. But sometimes common sense should prevail. At least burn them after the Tyranids land. Thousands of human planets at least, probably ten times as many, if nobody reports him, and nobody will dare, because the Inquisition acts with godly impunity. And I'm not talking of our Sotha solution, burning the Hive fleet in orbit. No, that would require he exposes himself to danger, instead of killing trillions of people preemptively. Plus all the valuable industry or a million guard regiments getting sacrificed. So what do you think I should do, dear Inquisitor? Slap his hand or pat his back? I ask rhetorically. My rose frowns in deep thought. He will be excommunicated once those actions become public. And he has to know this. Keep burning those cultist worlds while I make a call back to Terra. I nod and deposit my rose in the Ajata Teleportarium while a thin chronoblade appears on Janice's desk, now decorated with a dozen golden aquilas on the hilt and a sheath of blackstone with a simple logo painted on it, Ave Deus Imperator. Take care of this weapon and don't cut yourself. It was made to kill great demons, sweetie. I whisper to my daughter. Thanks, Dad. It feels old and powerful and kind of scary. It has seen so much death, my daughter murmurs in my mind. I know it did. I have killed a hundred orcs with it myself. I should arm my bodyguards with these weapons, as they can slice any material without effort. The hexagramic pendant in my hand, once again covered with a brass cover painted with golden aquilas, I teleported on Robot Dilliman's chest, ignoring the stasis field he has kept inside on Macridge. The Pharos is much too advanced for a mere stasis field to hold, just like I found out with the sounding board. 
As expected, the war poison inside his veins doesn't like it and draws away, slowly pouring out of his wound, almost like it tries to run. I wonder if this would also work on the Emperor. An STC data slate falls from nowhere right on the stasis console and interrupts the field while alarms start blaring inside the Ultramarine's fortress monastery. It does even contain the warp less drive STC and many of my inventions including more effective ships, fighters, and vehicles. In a minute after the stasis field vanished, the poisoned neck wound heals and the Primarch opens his eyes in confusion. Damn bullshit regeneration, but then I have seen Khan heal from many wounds worse than that. Just without the warp poison. Why am I still alive? He murmurs to himself. Your duty has not ended, Astartes. You have rested enough. I comment in a wry voice, straight in his mind. Father, he asks in suspicion and worry. Ha! I'm not as old your father. Wait, I had something else. I says cheerfully and drop another null rod in his lap. I mean really, the emperor says no foes can best you, and then doesn't even give you a null rod? Pretty sure the warp was among those foes. I explain curtly and then shut off the connection. This guy is smart enough, and might even remember about the pharaoh soon enough. Time to finish my business here and get going. Knowledge Chapter 103 Because I have to leave Sotho with some haste, I decide the Kurt and the Nikasser homeworlds need to go. One is home to a species of ever-evolving cannibals, eating their victims to absorb their traits, much like the Tyranids. Not a danger yet due to being rather savage, but that could change rapidly once they eat an Eldar Exodite world, for example. The Nikasser are species of psychers, which will not end well for them, either producing another warp godling or something worse. Plus the Tau will be forced to adapt for their absence with melee suits and better navigation equipment. The Tau homeworld loses their next capital city to a vortex torpedo and the subsequent chaos invasion, which should either delay their expansion for a century or force them into a furious arms race to create anti-demon weaponry and sensors. Welcome to the 40k, Blue Aliens. Yes, there are bad things in the galaxy, and you are not prepared. Also, kinda hard to hide that truth when your entire planetary force has to muster to defeat the invasion. Your brother Gilliman has just awakened on Macridge, Primarch Khan. Your brother the Lion, he still sleeps in stasis aboard the Dark Angel's Rock Fortress Monastery, forgotten even by his own sons. Couldn't find your other absent brothers, so I suspect they vacation inside the Maelstrom or the Eye of Terror, killing demons one at the time. I advise the One Man Sword Army as I send him another STC data slate with the Planetary Geller Field STC, and another gift in the form of the White Underscore Tiger Underscore Dao Saber, one I have recovered from High Comarek. I didn't give him back the Wildfire Underscore Panoply Power Armor, because I wanted it and everything inside it copied and made available for my own sons. Khan had only to ask Mars for another Power Armor, and they would cry in joy to give him one but his sword was almost part of his identity, and he was known to have killed greater demons with it, which might be needed again. The Tao, you have found it for me, Lord Lancefire? I have thought it long lost. You have my thanks. Khan sent back in a dignified tone, his hands caressing the weapon like a baby. It is your symbol of office, Primarch. So you can defend humanity, not duel like a boy in the Scola yard with other snotty boys. I answered in a dismissive tone and shut off the link. The next day, the astropaths were all on fervor about the miraculous recovery of Primarch Gilliman, who was better known and rather famous in the Imperium, his frozen face on many paintings and picked captures. I considered using the hexagram necklace a worthy price for waking the Ultramarines as Primarch, because I wanted to use Eniad's help to resurrect Sanguinius, who was actually dead. My gambit worked, and I was kind of glad it did. Two Primarchs for us, and two less Primarchs for Chaos. Unless Lorger had already been revived, which I doubted. The Dark Gods did not reward failure, nor shameful defeats. Sure, they might bring him back for a Black Crusade, but that wouldn't be so soon, with as many loses as Chaos forces have suffered at my Exterminator's campaign, and whatever consequences the elimination of the Dark Eldar from the galaxy has caused. 
Slanish would be rising in power, which would cause lots of turmoil and inner friction among the Chaos Godlings. The loss of Hellforge Xana would deny them a nearby launch platform at Cadia, which will possibly mean a push from the Maelstrom. And that was my intention. The Maelstrom was in range of the Pharos, and wasn't that just peachy? Still, I did have treason on call. Hello again, my robotic friend. Still interested in that Ordo Sinister Titan? I asked in curious voice. Air. Of course. But I was tricked. All I gained for my effort was a piece of Eldar armor and that Keeper of Secrets. No avatar, the Necron Lord complained in a childish voice. I almost laughed in his face. Who tricked you, Lord Trazen? Did I not supply you a time and place? Was my gift not there? Are you blaming an innocent stranger for your inability to capture a mere avatar? He grumbled for a minute, but logic was on my side. It was his failure, not mine. Plus the avatar wasn't really a physical being like the tan, nor a sentient warp construct like a greater demon. You knew I would fail. He muttered in suspicion. You did not fail, Lord Trazen. You have the armor, it just needs an Eldar exalt to put it on, and the Avatar will appear. But you will not attack the Eldar, so you might have to wait for them to attack you. I explained in a patient voice. This put a stop to his grumblings, and our good relations resumed. Good enough then. Eldar are always attacking Necron worlds. I just hope they attack me soon. Trazen said in anticipation. Who wants the Eldar to attack them? I mean, sure they had nice ships and powerful weapons to capture easily in a tesseract, so it, dear Emperor. I was becoming a tiny Trazen, hoping something advanced attacked me. So I checked the Bone Kingdom to find their crown world overrun with Tyranids. Oh well, that quest was finally over. Well, it seems the Bone Kingdom has fallen. What other enemy shall we send the hungry Tyranids to, perhaps Sarlacc? I offered in a pleasant voice. Trazen immediately became cheerful. Oh, that would weaken Imatek even more, especially as his troops are deployed at Hypnoth right now. And not doing so great even against a single forge world, after losing Mandragora and many ships. Right. I'll even arrange some aid to arrive at Hypnoth and destroy a few tomb ships. But, I will need heavy cruiser-sized reactor and warp-less engines for this. An STC template, even if a tiny bit more complicated. With variants for battle barges and battle cruisers. I demand in a shameless voice. Trazen was in a good mood, might as well profit. Meanwhile, I prime a cyclonic torpedo for the Necron world of Sidon, which has begun sending colony ships all over the sector from some kind of subterranean shipyard and an incendiary exterminatus at Drazic to catch a dozen trillion tyranids on the ground and in orbit around the former Necron world. My special gifts are also ready, two more enslaver bone staffs and the hybrid null rod slash bone staff for my rose. And then, since I notice the scythe barges are all gearing up to depart for Macridge in a hurry, I steal all their exterminatus and vortex torpedoes. They can request new ones from their premarch, or maybe forge Metallica, since they did tow that Tau battleship there, at my insinuations and at the Lady Inquisitor's demand. Just after my bodyguards begin to return with their loot from the artifact planet, I call Rose to explain the new developments and the necessity to redirect the Pharos beacon again. There is no absolute rush, as the Imperium doesn't move fast even when it wants to, but I have a nasty feeling in my gut that things have gone too well for too long. The tranquility leaves first, escorted by the serenity till the warp limit. Rose plays with her impossible staff in wonder, and gets to massacre a hundred orcs with the blade of her daughter, just to sense how it works. It works great, and she becomes even younger and prettier, maybe because orcs are ageless, since their makers didn't bother to consider what immortal mushrooms might get up to. Or perhaps they did, and intended the tan to be hunted by their creations for eternity. Just before I leave, I call Fidelia to arrange the transfer of her family of blanks. She and Letitia step directly onto their homeworld, and thus I can begin to abduct everyone they point out. Almost 13,000 blanks, and 11,000 of them are women. 
Perhaps they do get born in a preferential female ratio, that's why there are more female blanks than men. Or perhaps the Astra Telefatica cull the men at every centennial visit to prevent too many births of untouchables. Anyway, it is a great boost to my blank program, and my rose agrees. I can even accelerate rebuilding the Lamenters after a decade of compulsory harem management for all the younger men and tons of schooling and training in the meantime. To have a good soldier, you need to send him to school first, or all you have is a beast in human leathers. History, Politics, Medicine, and Science How can they make wise decisions for strategy without the knowledge of past failures? How can they use weapons effectively if they do not know the principles of their work, the limitations, and the ways to exploit those limits in their enemies? How can they provide first aid or target vital organs without medicine? And most importantly, how will they know who to shoot? Too many times the Stardis shoot innocents without ever thinking for themselves. To fight and die for the Emperor is too easy. Anyone can do that, from attack wolves to the PDF and the Imperial Guard. You don't need Astartes just so they can die. You need Astartes to win. And to win without dying, well, that takes knowledge. Knowledge of battles, of science, and of your enemy. Know yourself, and know your enemy, and you shall be undefeated in a thousand battles. Option B's Chapter 104 while immaterium currents may prevent most ships from traveling around Sotha after yet another beacon shift, my Icarus carrier doesn't use the warp. Takes us three days to arrive at Forge Retribution and immediately begin a hundred new research programs on some Tau artifacts, even using Tau prisoners to speed up the translation problems. Same thing for Dark Eldar artifacts and prisoners, of which I do have way too many. Practically their entire war fleet and command structure is in my pocket, and we are not restricted by any Geneva Convention on interrogation procedures. Eldar Corsairs and some of their artifacts get then same treatment to the extreme joy of the imported tech priests with a love to study Xeno artifacts and biology. Well, for deep analysis we are building research outposts far in asteroid belt, with my minimal security protocols designed to prevent a plague or rogue experiment ruin my new and pretty forge. The various orcish adaptations of Necron and Eldar weaponry get a different moan for large-scale experiments, as these improvised weapons tend to explode in the hand of the user as much as blowing up an enemy. By the next year, the poor moon has a hundred new craters and gets named the Mythbuster Moon. Everyone seems to agree to my suggestion, especially the pirates converted into servitors doing the testing. They might wish to die sooner and escape the torment of their new existence, so I don't really trust them being completely sincere. There are also a thousand Lamenter Tech Marines with Red Scorpion Gene Seeds, getting schooling and training from the Forge Angstrom Specialists, although I don't intend to stop at 1,000. Tech Marines do not count as Battle Brothers and do not receive full organ implantation, especially not the acid spit glands. Sure, two hearts or black carapace along the spine and arms will make them use even light power armor with excellent control, but mind impulse units are even more important. They will pilot spaceships, dropships, fighters, bombers, and gunships, as well as tanks and APCs or walkers. And speaking of ships, ten destroyers arrive in the system empty of crew during this year and are all rapidly converted into the Los Angeles pattern as my blank daughters have finished officer school and are begging me for a command. Sure, we do have plenty fast cutters or transport ships already busy transporting minerals or wood or promethium and coal to our forge or to forge Antex. But as it happens, there is another forge world somewhat close called Hensquittle B in the Pandrex underscore subsector, and we have struck a good deal with them for armed sentinels and plasma torpedoes, which we cannot make yet. Those torpedo destroyers now escort slow transport ships filled with our valuable exports and return with various consumable goods like clothes, or picked or vox casters, and also lost guns, chainsaws, and crog missiles as well, plus immigrants and servitors from the Hive World Fulcrum in that same system. A few trading routes went great until a Chaos Space Marine chapter called Angels underscore of underscore pain attacks that system in force despite resistance from the local Astartes. Sure, my daughters immediately rushed to help. 
destroying a Chaos Battlecruiser and two Strike Cruisers before running out of torpedoes and retreating, but I was also on the way with the Icarus and the Tranquility as soon as I heard. Five days later, we arrived in the system to find the Red Underscore Scimitars struggling to defend a big space station called Trantation. Almost instantly, the Chaos ships began drifting as their entire crew was quickly vanished into my labyrinth, then ejected into the sun. Cultists and corrupted marines were not my favorite, and I wouldn't risk my precious collection to some warp infection. Then we launched the corvettes and blow all their ships up, erasing all evidence of cheating. The Blood Angels teleport on the station to help clean up the remaining opposition, while my corvettes are already pushing the chaos-infested hulls toward the sun. The poor locals are rather terrified and many of them mutated or infected by chaos sorcerers while human limbs and heads are hanged on spikes and nails in a macabre presentation. So I make sure to return the favor with croc grenades detonated at those bastards' armor joints, leaving many traitors crawling on mangled stumps until the blood angels arrive to end their misery. It doesn't take long to get invited at a pleasant meeting with the Fabricator Dominus of this forge and with the Chapter Master of the Red Scimitars. It seems I did get a bit famous around the Eastern French, and even my wolf is famous. Well, he is a wolf that can understand words spoken or written, so maybe that's why. His descendants with normal she-wolves did not inherit the best traits, especially his size, although they are smart and have acute senses. But then all wolves are like that, I think. Maybe I should test the chronophage blade if it works on wolves? The immortal wolf, huh? Lord Lancefire, you are smiling creepily, the fabricator says as I just stare at the cogitator screen, lost in thought. Ah, uh, that. Brain implant, sometimes I get lost in thought. So, you like the corvettes, I would say? I wonder out loud. Not overly much but we could invest some resources to produce a thousand such ships for better system coverage. If only we could have salvaged that adamantium from the trader ships. The fabricator complains in a familiar manner. Demons in the walls, fabricator. Not worth it, trust me. What about the planetary Geller field for the hive world fulcrum? It should reduce chances of warp incursions, maybe even stop psychers acting up. I advise him, gently. It is an amazing STC discovery, I admit. Not overly complicated either, especially the one buried in the planet mantle for geomagnetic energy. However, I believe it will interfere with warp-capable ships. We will need to test it on a distant moon and a whole range of spaceships and warp engines. The Muggo says in a rational voice, and he is perhaps right. Haven't considered this till now. I do prefer traveling with the warp less engines. It is a bit more expensive to obtain a large hull like a galleon or conveyor, but after that, it only takes water or even ice to travel among stars. Our navigator is the most relaxed member of the crew. I explain in tiny snort. I would think it so. Perhaps one day, my forge will have a behemoth ship like that too, he allows in a pitiful voice. As it happens, I do have a big ship in my pocket. Well, I do know the location of an abandoned orc terror ship. Large enough to fit a battleship scale warp less engine. I mean, my clan conquered that orc planet, and that ship was just left derelict in the void. Stupid orcs, right? I offer in a white smile. Nobody doubts orc stupidity, so the gambit works. More wine gets poured without asking. A Xeno ship, he asks in worried voice. Well, I suppose it has been a human commercial galleon once, millennia ago. The engine placement is the only thing left to identify it after. I muse out loud. Really, then it not a problem at all. And I expect is plated with a megaton of adamantium and plasteel, right? The fabricator asks, rubbing a few tentacles. I just nod kindly and a thousand orcish weapons of any kind imaginable, plus some really outside any imagination. My tech priests were horrified, but then I am a son of the emperor, so what do I care? I reply in a careless voice. We should really tow that derelict here, for safekeeping. My forge will compensate you on delivery, the tech priest promises in a solemn voice. Can you repair my tranquility battleship? 
Also mount a Nova cannon and 200 lance batteries on the broadsides? We can provide more adamantium holes and even some dark Eldar captured machines. I ask in a curious voice. The fabricator nods with confidence. It would be an honor to restore that Apocalypse class to full strength. Even if the Tranquility was modified with torpedo cells like those system corvettes. Projected timeline? I ask with some worry. Depends on mineral supplies. Maybe 20 years, maybe 50. It will never be new, but without traveling into the warp, I suppose it will have an excellent service from now on. But 200 lance batteries, is that even feasible? He asks in worry. The Macarius pattern reactor is three times stronger, so it can supply enough energy for more lances. I was also thinking a couple of thrusters on the side for faster turning. Like two horns or an ancient bicycle steering handle. I saw something like this on various fortress monasteries. I propose with an ignorant shrug and produce a childish model on a commercial data slate. It does have everything I want, just made in crayon, so to speak. Three teleportarium, three Geller field generators, ten landing hangars for assault dropships. Three vertical torpedo cells of 100 warheads each, probably sufficient to blow up a Necron tomb ship in one salvo. Or at least cripple it badly. Then five void shields, an ion shield and a flare shield of battleship strength, which should slow down railgun or macro cannon shells, plus block fighter or bomber ordnance like missiles and bombs. I could take on a Gloriana class battleship in fair fight with such a beast, and I will probably need to. Those extra maneuver engines will provide extra acceleration, or you turn one engine off to change direction 20% faster. It's doable, I suppose. But we will name it Apocalypse B Pattern for my forge's prestige. I have no doubt you will lead it in many glorious battles once it is finished. The fabricator replied after a long minute. I smiled genially and held out my hand. You can be certain of this, Mugos. I have never lost a battle. The tick priest laughed in a mechanical tone, probably a recording from his biologic years. It only takes once, P.E.F. Lancefire. But maybe you're lucky, or the Omnisia has plans for you. He was right, though. With battles, you only needed to lose once. Second Phase, Chapter 105 Every year, a lucky ship captain from my clan gets the honor of discovering another flotilla of abandoned destroyers, mostly intact if in bad repair. It seems the systems around our core worlds are littered with pirate ships, the crew vanished and ship logs showing no clue. Then again, there are strange warp things like the Maelstrom and the Hadix anomaly which often cause the same results to unwary explorers. Soon enough, the eager navigators and my officers get to fly their new ship to a forge world like Metallica or Tigris to get it upgraded for fringe operations in exchange for Xeno artifacts or even a rare STC pattern of lesser value. Then a heavy cruiser gets found and sent to Triplex Fall to receive a Nova cannon right as Primarch Gilliman begins his own enormous crusade, creating a hundred new fortress worlds in the path of the Tyranid fleets and mustering a million guard regiments all over the Ultima Segmentum. That's the real power of a Primarch, and there are few who dare say no to the son of the Emperor. Primarch Khan is doing something else around the Solar Segmentum, cleaning up corruption on the larger hive worlds, with an ever-increasing horde of Astartes and a few Mechanicus legions. Hive World Necromunda gets mentioned a few times by the Astropaths, which doesn't surprise me at all. Khan really is a pointed sword, and I did point him at Necromunda. A dozen Astartes chapters get founded at his demand to safeguard those hive worlds after the tech priests have scoured the underhives for extra servitors and hidden STCs, cults get investigated and butchered, corrupt governors burned alive, just business as usual in the Imperium. No mention of reality cages being installed anywhere, which is troubling. The siege of Forge Hypnoth ends in a Pyrrhic victory for Cult Mechanicus, as the Necrons unleashed a few advanced Enphysite viruses on that forge, destroying many of the defenses and the robotic defenders. But it is still a victory, as Hypnoth is not conquered, while the attacking Necrons lose two tomb ships and a dozen harvest ships to the combined might of the defenders. 
Mass torpedo volleys and Archaeotech weapons from the Arc Mechanicus cruiser are the principal methods that worked, plus Nova cannon cruisers supporting the fleet from afar. Knights and Bane blades with ion shields prove devastating on the ground, just like Fury interceptors in void combat. Soon after, a certain warp rift in the vicinity, called the Van underscore Grothys underscore Epidity, closes unexpectedly. I suspect this was Lord Trazen, playing with his Blackstone Fortress and testing its capabilities. A chaos strike force that departs from the Hadex anomaly towards Solomis disappears mysteriously, which only hints at more anti-warp weaponry being experimented by the insane Necron wizard. Sadly, I am banned from Sotha for several more years, so I don't get a clear confirmation, except reading astropathic telegrams and my own logical deductions. Larissa does get a special mission afterwards, and sneakily blows up a Necron world called Thelmax, which seemed to be a dead world, but really wasn't. The star system is now littered with fragments of Necron tech and entire asteroids made of blackstone, so we have another salvage and mining spot only known to my clan and Forge Retribution. My daughter Andrea travels to Forge Maguire and sells them the tip about the melted space hulk on Gorkamorka and gets promised another fleet carrier filled with torpedo corvettes and a dozen more Catacan regiments provisioned to our own specifications. The STC data slates and warning about Necron and Tyranid invasions spur the fabricator into a massive defensive buildup, which will be constructed from the recovered adamantium and blackstone from the burned world. It will take a few decades for a solid result of this trip, but Andrea did tow a large dark Eldar cruiser after her, which is filled with advanced Xenotech. Our favor is guaranteed now. Forge Antex gets the same and more, as I donate to them the old Grand Cruiser I confiscated in the Magog Crusade, and they immediately begin repairs and refit to create a true Arc Mechanicus from the casino ship. My mentor Jiren is away though, and it wouldn't surprise me if Forge World Palomar simply gets expunged from all records. Finding an intact STC is the holy grail of Cult Mechanicus and the culmination of any Mugos explorer's life. Sadly, I can't really help my mentor directly, but I did point him at the right path. I also whisper a rumor to Forge Ryza via my daughter Jinnia. She went there with another Dark Eldar cruiser in tow, and more Blackstone and Adamantium, to propose the Macarius Omega tank pattern, based around an Adamantic reactor and a simplified plasma blast gun, covered by an ion and a flare shield. There was also a Sentinel variant with an ion shield and a melter gun for anti-Necron work, but we didn't have miniaturized plasma reactors and plasma weaponry. Only Ryza or Mars could make these, and we only wanted a thousand Macarius tanks and ten thousand Sentinels. She came back with our second fleet carrier called Deadless and ten Catacan infantry regiments, plus a small explorer expedition to be based at Forge Retribution. And by small expedition, I mean five cruisers and twenty destroyers, plus a few million tech priests and engine seers on a mobile forge ship containing most of their advanced technology. The orc invasion on Ryza was still going on, although a single continent remained infested with greenskins, and the ironclad battleship on the moon had been breached and raised to be converted in a powerful arc mechanicus, armed with the best technology of the cult. That would take perhaps a century, so it was a long project. Still much faster than building an adamantium hull from zero. The colonization into the second wave of expansion continues with this influx of hardy pioneers and also immigrants from nearby hive worlds. It will take a decade to produce the first reality cage at Forge Retribution because we do have too many projects going on. Like repairing and upgrading the Vitrix battleship, which takes megatons of plasteel, adamantium, and blackstone, for example. But the fabricator Dominus is also training millions of new acolytes, which will take over the job of servicing tanks and fighters and sentinels, as well as mining machinery and colonial infrastructure. Slowly, the more experienced tech priests will return to the forge and be replaced, increasing the manufacture output a dozen times. And they do manufacture by hand and tentacle. The only concession I could receive was for wood processing and furniture factories, which are being organized on every jungle or forest planet with fewer restrictions and religious protocol. I think the Mechanicus just doesn't see organic processing to have the same value as metal and forging, which kinda makes sense. 
Exporting furniture and paper is a good business though, as the huge masses of humanity in the Imperium need as many megatons of it as they can find. Of course, we never sell directly to a hive world, which would be stupid and costly. We donate our wares to a nearby forge world, and they sell it, using the cash to recover the cost for the machinery they give to us. It's a simple but effective tax evasion method, as no money changes hands, thus no value can be asserted to our trade. The Imperium might catch on in a few hundred years, but by then the infrastructure would be built, and dozens of generations would have used these machines and electronics to create new towns, railways, roads, power grids, and many other projects of planetary importance. Even then, there is little the Imperium can do to a trader dynasty based beyond the borders. Well, there is. The Administratum can expand the Imperial borders to include my holdings or withdraw my warrant of trade, but I also have friends in high places. And while the first company of Lamenters slowly gets trained and implanted with their special organs, the next company of blank recruits is reaching the cutoff age for safe implantation. So they spread their gene seed into as many women as humanly possible, about 600 every year. It is hard work, as I can attest personally. I had to stop accepting new daughters and their sisters from the local nobility into my bed, just because my body was still flesh and thus weak. Plus blank concubines were a lot more effective at producing blank babies. One new planet usable mostly for agriculture was consecrated as a cardinal world though, at the request of my saintly nurses, and then a miracle occurred, as thousands of sisters of battle kidnapped by the savage Dark Eldar appeared on the surface followed by millions of former slaves and captured people. There were even order familiar sister among them, and let me tell you those women were not saintly at all. They rapidly took charge of my eugenics project, mixing and matching genetic attributes for extra reliability and durability, first among the new immigrants, then my catacan regiments, and lastly my own clan. Even their own sisters of battle were kind of harshly ordered to start pumping babies to increase the next generations of female warrior by ten times. Sadly, no imperial cult priests or administrators were found among the saved, and thus they had to improvise and select leaders from their own ranks. Female bishops worked side by side with a self-elected canoness and her retinue, while my clan and tech priests provided housing and infrastructure. And of course, every visit by me or Victor and any of my sons was seen as some sort of day of celebration which ended with a dozen sisters getting impregnated while singing glory hymns to the God Emperor. It is a crazy galaxy, but I have learned not to examine the underlying substrates too deeply. Take whatever joy from life you can, because the tyrannids were coming, and the horrors were endless. The only problem is my slightly overpraised legend and overanalyzed life, which leads to Lady Justine being declared a saint for fighting beside the angel of the emperor to defeat Fulgrim the serpent, and myself for killing Lorger the traitor. Well, they surely don't know everything I did, because I would get burned alive as well. Anyway, this effervescence of religion sentiment spreads among all the worlds and colonies, which increases productivity and reduces dissent, especially in the hive cities. There is even a proposal to begin construction of New Hive City on Salvation, the new cardinal world. I delay that for a few decades, because manpower and resources are not sufficient. Plus I want that world to produce food, both cereals and meat. Fisheries are being set up, and millions of grocks and local poultry get imported from other agri-worlds in preparation for large food processing plants getting built here, as well as buying tractors and cereal seed. If this project works, I might duplicate it on a dozen more worlds with slightly better climate. My hive cities sure need to receive other food than processed algae, Nutrigrul, carboloafs, Vita Mead, and recycled proteins. Already their populations are slightly healthier and vigorous from vaccines and food imports, but the Imperium is too far and expensive to trade within large quantities. At least water and methane are not an issue, due to having system corvettes deployed in every system, able to drag comets into orbit for processing. Asteroids are plentiful as well, both for minerals and silicates, so the industry gets a cheap influx of resources. Defenses get built over every single world, also outposts and listening posts for a hundred light years all around, which is normal and common sense in my opinion. 
Then one day, a Mars-class battlecruiser and an Universe-class conveyor arrive at Ilovar with a couple of white scars on board. Shadow Chapter 106 The battlecruiser is possibly the replacement sent by Primarch Khan for my lost corvette. A thousand times more valuable, but then that sacrifice brought with it the destruction of Kamarak, most of it anyway. I couldn't be certain I found all the hidden webway dimensions and sub-pockets, and probably did not. However, raids and mass blood and pain sacrifices would certainly cease, and the proof was my astropath choir that hasn't reported more dark Eldar raids, anywhere in 10,000 light-years radius. The galaxy is much larger, but attempting long-range calls always killed an astropath or more. They did report an attack by a chaos warband calling themselves the company underscore of underscore the underscore shadow on the world of Mordine before the desperate plea was suddenly interrupted. I made note of it, but I wasn't close nor had any lamenters ready for a large-scale action. Two more companies were training as aspirants, the training grounds only 50 kilometers away from their homes in the blank town, where they still had more tech priest lessons and family matters to attend. Overall, the Codex Astartes wasn't bad at all, especially for training regimes and weapon practice. It was actually quite the work of a genius. Most of the tactics and strategies thought out by Primarch Gilliman were also good, and in some cases exceptionally brilliant. The tactics were also limited, and would not account for moral or out-of-context problems, and nearly nothing to counter chaos and its insidious infiltration. Mental mantras and regular checkups by the librarians and chaplains, well, those were exactly the psychers most likely to fall to chaos. As for two-ton Astartes and power armor piloting fighters and gunships, that was rather stupid. Not to mention piloting ground vehicles with more armor than their own. What was even the point to train brutally effective warriors, designed to break through enemies' lines and engage in close-range combat, and then waste them as glorified gunnery servitors or tank drivers? You could take, for example, a four-wheel drive Toro's car and emplace a tarantula automated turret on it. Then build millions of them, to be used by the auxiliary troops to support deep strikes with heavy bolters, lost cannons, or even missile launchers. That lost STC template did find itself on the data slate I gave to Primarch Khan, who was known to prefer rapid assaults or harassment on bikes, land speeders, and other mobile vehicles. Astartes were never meant to serve as frontline troops, battling hordes of Xeno or Chaos invaders while outnumbered a million to one. Boarding ships, breaching bunkers and command centers, fast raids on munition depots or fuel supplies, and target killing of enemy leaders and their officer staff. Those were the best way to use Astartes, not as mobile turrets. If you wanted mobile turrets, build damn mobile turrets. And this guy in front of me was the perfect example of that close-in-combat doctrine, and possibly sent to impress me or something. I wasn't that easily impressed though, though of course I admired the man for his centuries of honing the sword. Maybe I can get him to teach me? And my people too. I can only ask. Chapter Master Lancefire, we owe you a great debt for finding our Primarch and destroying the filthy dark Eldar Xenos inside the webway. Jagatan Khan, Master of Blades and Captain of the Fourth Company, declared in a harsh voice. His face was scarred by a hundred battles, and he wore a power sword relic which has likely killed millions of traitors, heretics, and cultists, not mention Xenos and demons. He was a one-man army, just like his Primarch. I waved his dead away with a slow gesture. Very well, anything else? Myself and these other four battle brothers are to assist you in any task, even unto death. So has the Primarch commanded. The grisly veteran Astartes said in a calm tone. So, he really meant it, considering his life spent already. Brothers, you are also sword masters? I asked to make sure, although they did have artificier grade change words on their backs. Yes, my lord. Nothing like the captain, but we can hold our own. One of them replied in a fake meek voice. Meek, but also sent to keep watch on my operations here in the fringe. Well then, let's give them something to do. Excellent. I have a few thousands blanks, men and women who could use some melee training. You don't mind blanks, do you? I wondered in a jovial voice. 
A cadre of expert sword trainers would be wonderful indeed. The men glanced behind me, where a dozen silent sisters were all wearing power swords and power armor. You have thousands of silent sisters? Captain Jagatin Khan asked in a curious voice, eyes measuring the women for some sort of reason. Possibly for how many seconds it would take him to dismember them all. No more than three seconds, if you must know. Nah, only about thirty sisters. As for the rest, some are my descendants, plus I found a place filled with more blanks and had them transported here. I am lucky like that. I commented in a wry voice. The White Scar's captain nodded cautiously. It will be done, Lord Lancefire. As for the Mars class and the conveyor, they contain what you were owed by our premarch. Torpedoes, Nova shells, and some other gifts you may need, if you intend to hold the Tyranids here, outside the border of the Imperium. I smiled gently while examining those spaceships in my Tesseract vision. A hundred more exterminators torpedoes, a dozen vortex torpedoes, macrocannon shells, many heavy bolter crates and autocannon rounds by the billion. That silly pre-march. Those small munitions would not be sufficient to defend a single world if the Tyranids managed to land, even with a small hive fleet. I snapped my fingers to empty the precious contents of those ships in my pocket. Andrea, my dear. Take command of the Mars cruiser and some escorts and visit retribution to load our exports, then travel to Forge Tigris and covert the conveyor into a fleet carrier. Filled with corvettes too. I said in a gentle voice, while mentally sending orders for two blood angels and two sisters to provide enforcement and anti-warp cover. I would have to find a name for those ships, not. Nah. Andrea could handle it, going by how her eyes were glowing with excitement. She ran off, followed by her retinue. I think the Blade Master blinked, observing how those two sisters were the only ones not pregnant. I may be charming and all, but twenty-eight of thirty sisters was the best I could manage, even after years of constant interaction and showering the poor muted women with kindness and gifts. Then again, those two sisters Dahlia and Sophie were in their sixties when we met, bitter and worn out with age and battling horrors. They look like twenty years old now, and will likely never die of old age anymore. Those chronoblades were quite a cheat, as were the Xeno hexagram necklaces. I had a hundred Xeno specialists magi attempting to decipher the secrets of a blade and the last necklace, but so far nothing. I may need a certain Necron overlord, or perhaps a helpful tan to aid with it. I was certain Trazen could duplicate the Null Rod technology, because it was only an artifact of the Mechanicus. However, whoever these Xenos with their ancient statues were, they did Posse's advanced knowledge of the warp and the dangers of chaos, and likely were exterminated for it, or by it. Just as I was waiting for my daughter to reach her new cruiser, a sleek black shuttle departed from the Mars cruiser, possibly covered in a dozen anti-augury paints and scrambling engrams, because it wasn't visible on the Starfort sensors, nor my fleet in orbit. An infiltrator of some kind, no doubt. I could use a black ops shuttle myself, so it vanished inside my large pocket, while its pilot was frozen then dropped in front of the white scar captain. It was a woman, lithe and supple, and highly trained. In a second, she recovered and swirled her high-tech helmet around, to find a power sword a centimeter from her neck. Mr. Khan was just as fast as I predicted. Purpose of your visit, my dear? I murmured in a thoughtful tone. Classified, Lord Lancefire. Well, that plan failed, obviously, the woman grumbled and removed her helmet to reveal a pretty face, deep red hair, and the familiar ports of a mind impulse unit implant. However, the sigils guarding the datasphere access to her implant were a hundred times too complex and complicated for a private operator. And that needle rifle split in three and worn on her back was inscribed with other complex gene codes. I have seen one such rifle a few years ago, in the hands of that blonde assassin from my roses written you. Same outfit, same rifle, same job perhaps? Obviously it failed, this classified mission of yours, but we're all friends here. And seeing how you arrived on the Primarchus gift battle cruiser, what could an assassin from the Venus temple possibly want, with a not too important rogue trader, merely trading paper and furniture to a few forge worlds? I asked in a right tone. 
That was my cover story, and I kept with it. Maybe a few STCs here and there, if I got lucky on my travels. Ludvias snorted and stepped back and to the side, his bolter still aimed at the pretty assassin. Why even ask, Captain? It obviously was a poison gift, just like these other brothers, my bodyguard grumbled, and all my escorts all raised weapons to target the white scars and the assassin. I sighed inward at the overreaction, while the scars simply closed their eyes waiting to die. Damn brainwashed idiots. Oh no. Nothing like that, the woman argued with a pleading voice, looking around for some place to escape. I consider the good per march is not the type to send an assassin after me, even an emphasite like yourself. What do you say, Captain Khan? I asked in a soft voice. It is as you say, Lord Lancefire. Primarch Jagatai Khan is an honorable man, beyond any hint of reproach or taint. We were also warned to regard you with caution, at the same levels of ability as an Alpha Psyker. Or the reverse of that, however it works for Knowles, the Astartes captain announced in a cold voice, mostly towards the disgraced assassin. All right. My name is Elixir underscore underscore Mornay, and I was ordered to protect you from the shadows, Captain Lancefire. And, also obtain a clear picture of your assets and abilities. How did you even find me? The woman demanded in an outraged voice. Ludvias and Rafin both chuckled amused and holstered their weapons, while my other guards lowered theirs but were still wary. Elena, what do you say? I asked gently, holding my hand out for the most vocal silent sister. Elena rushed to take my hand and examined the assassin named Elixo with curious eyes. She isn't even a pariah. Plus she would spy on you. Elena claimed in a vocal tone. Not like that, silly. I have plenty women. I meant Elix's emphasite skills. I answered seriously. Betting a pretty assassin might be fun, but too risky indeed. But hacking and subverting machine spirits for my Tegmarines and Blank Sisters? That would be even more useful than another concubine. Are you serious, my lord? You expect me to divulge the temple's secrets, just like that, the red-headed prisoner muttered in naive confusion. Well, Elixir was right, and she would need a very deep motivation to change her allegiance. Perhaps I did need to bet her. Vampires Chapter 107 I smiled at Lady Elixir, and she vanished in my labyrinth. We will resume the conversation in a different setting. Any more surprises I need to know about, brothers? Maybe a dozen inquisitors, like that idiot who tried to arrest your pre-march, back on Sotha? I asked to make sure, and also check the ships for hidden compartments filled with bombs or assassins. Didn't find any, but the ugly face of the Imperium was already showing its true face. Unlike the trades with local forges, which were based on mutual interest and lots of gifts made in good faith, this new shipment arrived from the Solar Segmentum, the largest hive of scum and villainy in the galaxy, possibly even worse than the Eye of Terror. These entitled nobles would smile and invite you to dinner, just to dismember you and drain your brain of useful information. Or have their defense batteries fire in a targeting error and blow you up or any other scenario that ended with you dead, and they gaining some advantage. At least in the Eye of Terror, you could shoot back. However, my experience in that shadow realm of the Mandrix had taught me that even the Tesseract Labyrinths had limits, especially when dealing with the warp. Things might not be solid enough to be stored in stasis, or the stasis not strong enough to hold them. Or more probably, you needed a tan to power up the abilities of that labyrinth. The Crimson God was still impaled by a sort of canoptic underscore sentinel, chains of living rock or such binding the immortal shard and preventing his escape. Only problem, I wasn't a Necron, and thus had minimal access to those controls. Plus I was nearly certain that Trazen had sabotaged my controls in some way. The Necron Lord wouldn't give anyone the same access to the kind of power that he had, seeing how two Tyranid tendrils from High Fleet Behemoth avoided his homeworld of Solomis and then got lost in the void, drifting into hibernation. I could only replicate that feat on a much smaller scale, and not for long, by blowing up the Queen and her Hive ship with Vortex torpedoes. When shall we begin training those recruits, Lord Lancefire? 
The white scar captain asked after waiting a minute in awkward silence. In three seconds. You the four veterans, on the surface. I replied curtly, storing the four chainsword-wearing scars and depositing them beside the training ground's gate. We had a proximity sensors and automated turrets protecting the recruits and the training cadres so intruders would take fire otherwise. The Lamenter's apothecaries would know what to do, I hoped. The Blade Master just glanced around before shrugging. So you want me to train you, my lord, he deduced instantly. Well, Astartes are smart, and captains do start learning how to think for themselves eventually. In a few centuries. Yes, one hour per day, every day. Mostly the reasoning behind each strike and how the scars position themselves for melee. I'm more of a strategist than a brawler, and the few times I fought Astartes in melee, I kinda got pounded. I admitted in a cheerful voice, only to get patted on my shoulder by a compassionate bodyguard. He doesn't have the Astartes organs, Captain Khan. Might be better to consider Lord P.E.F. a simple tech marine. Ludvias explained in a pleasant tone. The old veteran just nodded knowingly. I did not look like all the other Astartes, that was certain. Tech marines can also be quite deadly. Especially in a good armor, like Master Lancefire has. That shoulder-mounted Stormbolter, you can aim it with your mind implant, right? Target the eyes or the joints. I nodded, with my head and the mobile arm as well, then swirled the shoulder Stormbolter around to envelop the large meeting hall in the Lamenter's Star Fort, the targeting reticles and the Autosense machine spirit locking on everyone's eyes in less than a second. Perhaps a good Teg Marine was indeed deadly if he could gain access to top-level gear like I had. I guess I could drop everyone in this hall in a single second if they're not shielded. Doubtful if any Swordmaster can do it that fast. I'm used to myself. Quite deadly already, like I said. And if they are shielded? The White Scar's captain asked curious. I turned towards my escorts. Then, it would depend on many things. I would certainly not rush them with my blade. And yet, that is the best course of action, Lord Lancefire. Rush towards an exit, cut your way out with your power sword, and escape to fight another day. Sadly, you'd be too slow and unskilled for that. Even after a century of daily training, the man said in a convinced voice, and Rafin just chuckled. I'd bet a throne on Lord P.E.F. every time. He did burn down Kamarak without lifting a finger, my loyal bodyguard commented wryly. Hey, I did lift a finger. Damn myths blowing out of proportions. I lifted a finger every time I teleported an exterminator's torpedo, about thirty times. I'd find another way. It would take something on the level of an Eldar avatar or a tan to cause me worry. Maybe a demon prince too, without my brave written you. I said in a thoughtful voice. So I have heard, and a dozen top-tier seers have confirmed it. The traitor Lorger is still dead, after you found another way. Your raid on Kamarak, however, is mostly attributed to our pre-march, and the public communiques delivered from Terra. No mention of Eldar allies either. Your participation is noted, of course, and last I heard Lord Khan has proposed you for some medals of valor and a nobility title, the captain explained in curious voice, as if testing me to argue. But, I was rather content with that development. Primarch Khan would gain credibility and support from many parties injured by the Dark Eldar, while the little-known Astartes chapter like the Lamenters with a single battle barge and a fleet of rogue trader corvettes wouldn't seem that impressive. I would gain some notoriety for that title, more than for my raid. There would be a real house lancefire, with all the benefits of that rank. Noble houses would receive a bit of land and a small palace on Terra itself, which would be worth trillions of thrones or maybe more. With a local base, I could start slowly gathering support for a high lord of Terra rank for the rogue trader houses, much like the speaker for the Chartist captains. All rogue traders risked their ships, life and sanity exploring beyond the borders, fighting Xenos of a hundred kinds, or aided in crusades, much like I did. It was time we got our own voice, in this case my own voice. Though I would most likely send a representative, just like the navigators or the Inquisition did. 
Still, this would mean making contact with some other famous rogue trader dynasties and convince them to work together. That would be fun, even if they will see the immense benefit of having someone defend their wealth and warrants of trade in the highest imperial court. And more importantly, it would allow certain regulations to be imposed on the scummy traders. Too often they sold out the Imperium or restricted technologies for a quick sale. Sounds great, Captain Khan. I might even accept that noble rank. I'll have to ask my clan if anyone dares to approach that planet though, I hear it's infested with corrupt officials. About as bad as landing alone in the middle of a Tyranid invasion, I expect. I replied in a less amused voice, then turned towards my next scheduled destination. My brave children, getting tortured in implantation sarcophagi by the sanguinary priests. Not fun at all, and in fact terminally dangerous for any single one of them. Sure, I updated the procedure as much as I could, even bringing a hundred biologist tech priests to oversee the machines and repair them, but the gene seed technology was really advanced and pretty much nobody knew enough to make it safe. Luckily, there was a newly arrived Forge Antex tech priest available, who did work on the blank genes projects for a few decades. My hopes were on him, as he struggled to adjust the coffins to produce live subjects and not biologic sludge or malformed creatures. How does it seem, Muggos 11? I asked via an implant message. Voice didn't quite translate well with Mechanicus specialists, as the cult's technolingua had too many attributes of esoteric meanings. And specialists had too little patience with moron humans too. Explaining delicate genetic and soul transfiguration to a normal person was pretty much impossible, just as five-dimensional warp manifold mathematics were beyond most tech priests' ability to comprehend. That was why Vortex warheads were so rare and precious. Maybe a thousand people in the Imperium understood the procedure well enough to create those weapons. The Astartes' genetic code was probably just as complex, due to bloodline reverberations and stigmatic imprints caused by the death of Sanguinius. Adding the problem of blank genes into the mix solved some problems and created others with less logical solutions. Every day, I would come to the Sanguinary Ward and Commune with my sons, via my MIU implant, entering their mental landscapes and reinforcing their will and mental resistance. Speeches, mantras, canticles, and simply being here beside them helped. The black rage did not manifest at all, and that was great. Mutations were also stopped at the source. Flesh might be weak against the warp, but blanks were immune. However, that psychic stigmata caused by our primark is wound, and the red thirst, that was bad. I also had to suffer that pain beside them, and it wasn't fun at all. Maybe I should punch Sanguinius in the face after I got him resurrected. Fucking vampire thirsty for blood. Continue your duty, Astartes. Your daily efforts are working, and we might not lose a single Lamenter recruit. Which is not normal at all. Muggos BD slash ANT slash J8NN11 explained in a Technolingua transmission of his own. Who cares about normal, damn cultist? How is it normal to lose a hundred children for every Astartes? Sure, because my boys are rather older than normal Astartes, they have a stronger soul and will, which helps them withstand the horrible process better than some ten-year-old farm boy thrown into a dark coffin and told to pray. They will lose a tiny bit in strength and speed, because the body is grown and less malleable, but they will survive. As for strength and speed, they will have the best power armor and mind implants. In my view, that mattered more than a few kilograms of extra strength. Ogrins were even stronger, after all. And about that, in a sealed wing of the star fort, we had ogrins being implanted with red scorpion's gene seeds. I didn't want more muscles on their already gigantic muscles. I wanted to give them able minds, like all Astartes had. However, this plan didn't work as I hoped, not at all. Should have remembered the Dark Eldar. Flailed Chapter 108 All those flesh mutations that Astartes had to endure? Wings, claws, fangs, and snake eyes? It was a dozen times worse with the Ogrens, because the poor things were already mutated and weak to the warp. Just like the Dark Eldar obtained creatures like the Rack and the Grotesque from their genetic manipulations, so did my own experiments with Ogren flesh. 
All I could do was take their lives with my chronoblade and attempt to store their souls in a prism-like soul trap. I failed to do that either, because I'm not a dark Eldar Archon like Velashan underscore Sithrek, the former owner of this artifact. Well, in time I would learn all their secrets, unless I died somehow. Even then, there would be methods to revive myself, from discarding the failed timeline to blood sacrifice or cloning my body and restoring a backup mind from storage. If Fabius Bile could clone Horus or Ferris Manus and even the other Fulgrim, then I could do it too. I just had to learn as much or more than the poor traitor without limbs. Perhaps I could even use that same knowledge as a start by downloading his memories? Something to think about and decide later. I still had time till the ruinous powers would manage to gather enough forces for another Black Crusade, and I could hamper their efforts even more by burning demon worlds or fallen night planets or hell forges. My Xeno artifacts vanished in my dimensional pocket as Muggos Eleven entered the Ogren Ward to examine the specimens. A burst of data engrams flashed as his autosenses measured the room and the dead Ogren corpses. Another failure, another day. He might have said, if the Technolingua translation was correct. Probably not. I held out my hand and a Drakari hex rifle appeared. This weapon fired some kind of vitrification virus called the glass underscore plague, turning anyone into glass and giving them a true death. In my other hand, I had a canister containing the countervirus, which would certainly be needed when these mad scientists experimented with the xenovirus. I want this weapon examined and duplicated into a Mechanicus format, then tested on orcs. You will join Jebler and his team at their fumble research outpost in the Oblivion system. Make sure to duplicate the counteragent first, before you play with the Doomsday weapon. I had a young sister named Ordila Grindoth assigned to that remote and classified star system to protect the biologist researchers against demons and warp intrusions. Her powers as a pariah were already the greatest among all my followers, such that even the catacan concubines living in more distant villas of Blanktown were disturbed by her presence. Ordila could continue her studies and training under Jebler's guidance, and probably become a version of pariah tech priest, just like my dear Jebler wanted to try. It will be done, Revelator. A weapon that might extinguish the orc threat would be truly valuable, and would spare humanity trillions of lives. Plus, it should secure this lancefire domain against orc wafts and help clear out infested planets of their fungal spores. So, the Ogren project is ended, the biologist Muggos asked in another data burst. I think I got everything right. We will return to it, but once I manage to produce blank Ogrens. Have your fabricators secure a thousand young females for that task. Prettiest and smartest Ogren girls, and I shall close my eyes and do my duty, in bed. I uttered in a slight shudder. It would be much worse than my trials with catacans and even the pampered noble daughters, which were in some ways more difficult to deal with than an angry Ogren. Pampered little minxes, with barbed words and constant plots for social ascendance. Luckily, I only had about 100 of these cute darlings, so I only had to spend three weeks per year in their company till they were sent back home with their bellies filled with another air. My wife Serena had dominion over the noble concubines, somehow keeping them from each other's throats, at least until each house had a few blanks to continue the leadership without fear of chaos corruption. In time the allied houses will all become part of my dynasty, by blood. That would take a century or so, and perhaps some accidents happening to the more reluctant elders. Anyway, it was time to return down on the surface, check up on Victor and his progress on Tesseract temporal experiments, and then deal with the new problem, the pretty emphasite Elixir. Perhaps she could continue her job, setting up a Sigin center in the main hive city and absorb all available data. From census and tax reports, to cult activity and detecting other infiltrators, an infocyte would be worth as much as a battlecruiser. And if she agreed to train a company of agents to a similar skill, her value would grow to a whole fleet of cruisers. Soon enough, I emerged from the teleport room at the top of the governor's spire and shook hands with the blood angel guarding my son. How is he? I asked in a paternal worry. Well enough, I say. Those fifty blank women you have brought him are all with child, as you know already. Perhaps bring him more? 
He keeps staring at the cogitator screen, not unlike his weird father, the veteran Astartes joked and patted my pauldron. I did have Victor look over my STC templates for a second opinion, especially on the simplest machines, to find other uses or gain inspiration for a new weapon. So I entered his personal quarters to find it slightly eaten by his two wolves, pillows and bedding shredded by playful animals, while Victor was lost in reverie in front of the cogitator holoscreen. Romulus and Remus, bad dogs. Get out in the garden now. I grumbled it pointed at the balcony door, leading to a suspended garden with lawns and trees. Nobles did have nice perks, even in 40k. Both wolves mewled, caught in the crime and acting like sheepish children. Then Romulus ran to press the green button for the door while Remus rushed outside howling for freedom. The howl woke Victor up, and he turned to see me and his Astartes watch him in amusement. What? I never wanted a wolf, let alone two of them. Look what they did to my place. My boy complained like a kid. He was obviously my kid, so I didn't comment. Plus Victor was right, wolves were not made for indoors. Wait on the balcony, Astartes. Play with the wolves if you want. I told the bodyguard while I sat on the plasteel block beside my son's armchair. A minute later, Victor brought up the newest invention of his, an alteration of one of the many vehicles I had remembered and roughly drawn out for his perusal. This mind-clearing tank from old Terra, we could use the concept for melee battles, instead of change words. Also, for important gates defenses, only the drums spinning to butcher armored attackers with power flails. Vehicles wouldn't have this kind of energy, except those powered by atomic reactors, but for fixed positions with their own power generators it should work. Maybe even for defending starship corridors, right? Victor proposed and brought up a few concept designs, based on weasels, chimeras, and macarius tank chassis. I nodded at his great idea, and then tried to expand on it. Except in confined spaces like a gate barbican or a tight mountain pass, drum flails would naturally be avoided and attacked from the sides. But any vehicle had an engine, and that engine could spin a drive shaft horizontally for traction or vertically for lift, like old helicopters did. I linked my implant to the cogitator and rapidly brought out an old helicopter. A ground vehicle with a spinning horizontal flail would create a deadly area around it in 360 degrees, preventing flankers from attacking from the side and rear. Might also be useful in jungles and other clearing duties. Try it on the Sentinel's waist and Weasel's turret ring first and see if striking height can be adjusted. I don't want dedicated machines. I want an upgrade to those we already have. Perhaps for in place tarantula sentry guns as well. Victor shook his sleepy head and loaded a lost cannon sentinel template and began to work. Anything of note for the temporal chambers in the Tesseract? I asked softly. I can grow algae if I provide light sources and air, plus basins of water and nutrients. Only tried at twice speed of normal time flow, and it's already getting out of control. Couldn't even germinate plant seeds. Victor muttered while most of his focus was on the waist ring of the sentinel, trying to create an outer ring rotating independently. Nothing high-tech, but still a lot of hard work. I copied his initial design to offer to my forge as a broken STC pattern found by one of my ships while exploring the outer fringe. We didn't find STCs there, only alien species and more orcs and tyranid splinters. Soon enough Irwin's underscore world would come under attack from such a splinter, and I planned to interfere. There was an Astartes chapter based there, which would be a shame to let perish. The dragon underscore lords were here beyond the Imperium border on the same mission as my lamenters, trying to defend humanity from the deadliest Xenos prowling at the edge of the galaxy. Just for that, I would save them and support them. There were billions of stars in the French, and not enough ships and troops to patrol it. Not yet. Elixir's Chapter 109 An hour later, I arrived back in my own villa in Blanktown and set up one small apartment for my new guest, including a bank of cogitators and a small clade of tech priests with knowledge of datasphere warfare and the special runes of engineering, a rather complex religious protocol for establishing a monitoring station on par with a night suit of battlefield awareness. 
Then I retrieved Elixa and her Infocyte gear from her stealth shuttle. You will live here from now on, my dear Elixa. I want a signal intelligence operation prepared to monitor this star system for infiltrators and other dangers. You can do that, right? I asked gently and patted her silky hair. It was cut kind of short, but that probably made sense if she needed to wear a sensorium helmet and other devices like that Signum transceiver antenna. But, oh my god, Emperor, so many cogitators. I can really work from here, the woman exclaimed in surprise then joy. Yes, you will. And these nice tech priests will look over your shoulder constantly, making sure my house and the Astartes chapter are not endangered by your actions. My own rooms are down the hall, it says P.E.F. on the door. I continued after a few seconds, watching her enthusiasm drop visibly at the new regulations. That's not so great. Elixa murmured in a sour tone, glancing at the creepy cyborgs with suspicion. Dinner is in three hours, until then make yourself at home. I'm certain you can manage locating the shower and the wardrobe. I added as I walked out, only to find Ludvias and Canis watching me with cautious eyes. I ignored their obvious displeasure and began mentally selecting a dozen daughters from the local merchant concubines for infocyte training. The girls need not be blanks, only smart and disciplined. Well, maybe one blank at least, just in case. The information they gathered would also help increase revenue from better taxation and resource management, plus they had local knowledge of industries and general trends. Perhaps give them a special name, like the Obsidian Auguries? Yes, that will be conveniently vague and allow a certain degree of mystique and fear when they produced an identification tag plated with black obsidian. Pretty sure everyone else would just call them spooks, but that was only natural. Technology was similar to magic in this universe, and the Necrons managed to beat gods using only advanced science, with no warp powers at all. Humanity will need a long time to reach the same heights, even if they had examples of advanced Xenotech or human Archaeotech practically littering the galaxy. There just was not enough education to make use of these artifacts, not to mention constructing new technology of the same capability or better. Woof! Canis asked in a small voice. Yes, my genial friend. Today we do like we always do. Sit at the cogitator and tinker with more STC patterns. But no more meat dispensers templates. I explained and ruffled my wolf's hair with my hands. Woo, 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 the Fenrisian wolf complained and glanced at his pawprint food dispenser, which already had a dozen types of meat. There just wasn't any more room for more food storage, as the room next door was now transformed into a large pantry filled with meat pellets and crunchy bones. Ludvia snorted at our antics and sat down on the plasteel dais, Bolter aimed carelessly at the balcony door. That would be the most obvious point of entry for any intruder, although it wouldn't be just as easy as it seemed. I knew many people or not people might want me dead, so I took precautions. Three hours passed in a flash, simply tinkering with more automated turrets and flying drones. I did not intend to drop my troops into ambushes or hostile landing zones, losing a good part of them before they could regroup and counterattack. Wouldn't it make more sense to drop a million turrets and clean up a large enough landing site? Here I had the template of the classic Astartes drop pod, more importantly the Deathstorm and support variants, those that did not carry troops but onboard turrets. Sure, these things were massive, highly armored, and of course, hugely expensive. It was actually cheaper to deploy five space marines with five heavy bolters than one of these monsters. They would also run out of ammunition pretty soon and then just lay there, millions of thrones expended for little gain and immobile. Perfect for orcs to dismantle and arm themselves with perfectly good weapons of the best quality. No, what I needed was a cheap version, armed with a twin multilaser, and a lost cannon version for hard targets like vehicles or power armor, perhaps one with a spinning flail for close defense. Naturally, these autonomous turrets could have more armor than the mere 10 millimeters of plasteel in the original template. It would depend on the forge resources, but at least 10 CMS of armor would be possible without making them too heavy. Perhaps even ceramite plates. 
Drop those in a series of concentric rings, and a single dedicated light cruiser could transport and unload the equivalent of 20 regiments of firepower in a concentrated pocket. Soon after, insert tech priests and servitors to repair, refuel, and clean up the debris before landing mobile forces. Sure, a cargo ship could carry even more drop pods. The problems begin when encountering enemies. From raiders and pirates, to harassing corsairs or traitor warships, to full orbital blockade or a tyrannid swarm on approach, it is much better to have a light cruiser actually deploy the drop pods. It is much faster, has better armor and guns, but most importantly is faster. Pretty much why all Astartes use strike cruisers to deploy drop pods filled with powered armored brothers in emergencies. This also carries the risk of troop pods getting shot down or the limited Astartes numbers surrounded and destroyed by overwhelming defenses. And if you landed, say, Chimera infantry transports, they could just carry these tarantula turrets on top of their hull and connect their power lines to the internal generator. Mobile turret obtained. Or just place them on wheels and drag them into new fortified lines as the front lines moved, much like General Rommel did in Africa during WW2 with his 88mm cannons. The best thing was the ability for rapid defense of compromised positions, simply dropping these turrets in front of a hive city or an important manufacturer. This ability was the most used option for Adeptus Astartes and caused the most casualties, even if a thousand pods and a few tech marines could do the same job and possibly not lose a single life. Even inside spaceships, such turrets could pop up from the deck plates and massacre invaders on long hallways and intersections. Maybe even heavy flamer turrets? Only for fixed positions, because Prometheum might not like being dropped from orbit. Missile turrets were already used on many Hive World or Forge Spires, but in the field they would rapidly run out of missiles. Plus they were kinda expensive. No need to drop them, they could be landed with the troops and not damage the fragile missiles either. But then, forts and command centers would have some anti-air protection, at least until the fighters gained air supremacy over the skies. The door opened to reveal a completely different Elixir de Mornay, dressed in a tight dress of blue silk and a house lancefire cape. I look like a lady now, right? She asked in a timid voice. I just smiled genuinely and nodded, kinda lost for words. You are a gorgeous woman, my dear Elixir. As for a lady title, you just need to ask. I bet a throne our children will be very smart. I complimented her in a shy voice, while Ludvias just blinked at me, then sighed in acceptance. You should have expected this, brother. I wouldn't let such a treasure get away, even if it meant a new wife. Canis lifted his head to watch the new wolf mistress with curious eyes, then uttered a single wolf, which probably meant nice bitch, boss. What? How can you just propose to me? She exclaimed in a rather outraged voice. I just shrugged and rose from my adamantium chair to peek closely into it her blushing face. Common sense, Elixir. You will have access to the house lancefire secrets, thus you need to be part of my house. You would not betray your family and children, but instead work hard to keep us safe. I'm thinking to call your infocyte clade the Obsidian Auguries. Keeping watch from the shadows, for agents and subversion from other houses, cultists or xenos. I explained as I reached the door and offered my elbow. She blushed even harder as I escorted her to dinner, still grumbling at her new fate. I didn't even say yes. Elixir concluded as we reached the dining hall. I smiled inward and outward. She didn't say no either. Everyone, this lovely lady is Elixir, our new spymaster. I presented her to my wives, a few of my children and a few apothecaries who usually join me at dinner. She is all flustered and red, Daddy. Did you bet her already? Talia asked with an innocent eight-year-old voice. Elixir coughed in surprise, while Decima glared at me for a second, before approaching us with a queenly pace, slow and majestic. Well, she did oversee like a thousand star systems for me, and acted as a rear admiral for a thousand spaceships for our rogue trader dynasty. Quiet, Talia. Hannibal, stop giggling. Ludvias stayed by the door, my sweet wife ordered, returning the room to silence. 
Then Decima poked Elixir's forehead, watching her reactions shift from social awkwardness to a combat posture, the mind implant powering up for extra speed and auto senses. At least Lady Elixir has decent training. We shall see about other duties, after your apothecaries and nurses finish the medical examination. Vindicare Temple? Decima continued with a frown. Air. Classified. Elixir answered with a wary glance towards me. Probably shouldn't blurt out her secrets if I wanted her to keep mine. P.E.F.'s mother was a vindicare. Good assassin too, Lady Justine. Killed Fulgrim in her last mission. Decima explained in a softer voice and gave me a short kiss before returning to her seat. Daddy is better though. He killed Lorger and didn't even die. Talia commented wryly and without any tact. I sighed audibly and sat down to eat. This looked like one of those dinners. Holy Spears Chapter 110 After the meal, kids were sent away for evening lessons with their non-combatant Adeptus Oraritas teachers, those that myself or my sons have managed to seduce and bring them over from their Salvation Cardinal world. Once the sisters were part of our extended family, their loyalties shifted enough so I wouldn't have to worry about getting doused in Prometheum for the slightest mistake. Just like I hoped with Lady Elixir. Say Decima, which Forge world should we trade with next? I'm thinking Golgorad and Iridial. We can afford to donate some adamantium and blackstone in exchange for more sentinels and a million of tarantula turrets. I proposed to my main wife, and ignoring her suspicious look towards Elixa. Decima sipped some of her too sweet wine while pondering, running estimations on her own implant. Just a thousand tons of blackstone, and a megaton of adamantium. Maybe two megatons, if the next transport ship arrives on time, she concluded with a sour face. In truth, we did donate the Mechanicus way too many resources, for too little gains. But goodwill and future trade options were even more important in my eyes. I wasn't running a corporation to make profit. I see. Perhaps we should explore a little more and discover more derelict ships. I will be quite busy for a month or two, but Victor can try his luck as well. He can take the Vitrix, I think. I'm used to myself. Our second battleship, the Macarius Vitrix was about ready to travel now, if not ready for a full fleet engagement for a few decades. But Victor could find some orc ships and tow them to forge retribution for reprocessing the valuable metal. Even if he did encounter trouble, he had his own tesseract, so only something truly dangerous could pose problems. Decima nodded slowly, no doubt already conjecturing something about the proposed expedition. The explorer fleet from Ryza was already scouting ahead in force, noting down inhabited planets and Xeno species. Plenty of them too, because the Emperor's Great Crusade didn't reach this far, and many Xeno species were left intact, unlike closer to Terra where there were hundreds of Xeno species butchered into extinction. Of course, only a few Xenos had space travel, and even fewer had FTL travel. In fact, only five such potential enemies were discovered so far, the Demiurge being the most advanced, if not warlike. The Arachin had too many legs and organic ships, so they were classed into the burn on sight notice by the Cult Mechanicus, who saw them as abominations against the Machine God. Plus might give the Tyranids better weapons or propulsion for their bioships, which wouldn't be fun at all. Another race called the Sien were put on notice for capture and examination because one of their ships was found containing no less than six other Xeno species on board, hinting to some grander alliance, which would certainly be used against the Imperium or humanity in general. The Tau were also classed as interesting to investigate and capture, with some advanced technologies, especially in weapons, approaching Imperial Navy standards. The remaining Kurt were marked for destruction, for being cannibals able to evolve from their eaten prey's abilities, just like the Tyranids, even after their homeworld of Pesh was mysteriously burned into magma, just like their allies the Nikasser. The Bargasi infested the Grendel Star's region with their beastly forms, and I even had some of them in my inventory, after being transformed by Dark Eldar Homunculi into pain engines of phenomenal danger, probably on par with Tyranid tyrants. In fact, I might organize a few bouts one day and see who would win in a ring fight. 
My bet was on the Tyranid, but you never knew where 40k might surprise you. I even heard of a battle sister called Praxedes killing a tyrant with her mace. This Vitrix is a navy battleship? Perhaps the one lost during the Macarian Crusade, my dear Enfocide asked, after running some fast computations and data comparisons on her implant. See, she would be amazingly valuable. Perhaps I should rename it, if the origins are so easily deduced. Vigil for the Vanquished, how does it sound? I asked Decima, and glanced at Henna as well. She used to be ship crew as well, so her opinion would matter. Engines Chapter 111 However pleasant and rather unexpected, my honeymoon with the gorgeous Elixir was cut short by a desperate astropathic message. From a hidden corner in the Vidar sector, where Forge World Antex was located as well, an immense Necron starship, larger than a planet and even better armed, has awoken from its long sleep and has began attacking Imperial shipping, blowing up anything crossing its path. Wasn't moving very fast though, so a quarantine area was declared for 20 light years around it. Even worse, Primarch Dilliman has called all available Astartes and any available Navy or Rogue traders to lend their gun to destroy this menace, now called the World Underscore Engine. Well, I was both an Astartes chapter master and a Rogue trader. Surely I could raise a finger and help, right? What do you say, Canis? Big fire or normal fire? I asked my best advisor. Woof woof, the space wolf replied eagerly and nudged my left glove as a hint. Hmm, I was thinking to use the pharos, but perhaps Canis was right. Gilliman would surely figure out why the Tyranid's fleets were attacking a Necron world in a frenzy when there was nothing to eat there. And I wasn't ready to face down another premarch. Not unless I wanted to get beat up again. The Icarus carrier was out on patrol, but I did have two light cruisers ready for duty, plus the Serenity Battle Barge. I could take the Dominator Cruiser as well, the one with the Nova Cannon. Yep, should be enough. Shouldn't show my entire deck yet, after all. Sadly, the first 1,000 Tech Marines were still in training, and the next 1,000 were undergoing gene implantation right now. As for my Lamenters, well, they had a decade more to go till I considered even the first company ready for action. I should take a sanguinary priest, probably Yalus, and one apothecary with me, and leave priest Helios in command of the star fort and the chapter. Only problem, my nice capital Illivar would be exposed until Victor returned from his ship-finding expedition. This sucked. I mean, we did have more defenses than a real Imperial Hive world, merely 300 asteroid forts, a real Ramillies class star fort and three Astartes battle barges and 12 cruisers, plus three Lancefire battle cruisers, 100 destroyers, and nearly 300 corvettes left in defense, so it wouldn't be completely exposed. I just didn't feel safe without someone using a tesseract to keep an eye on things. Hopefully, Elixir would manage the spying network while I was gone. Soon enough, I took Fidelia and Hestia aside and had them assigned as protectors of the house and chapter, grabbed Lord Whitelance and his knight, plus my wolf and my wife Henna for my comfort during this long trip. Then we began to embark a Catacan regiment and four PDF regiments on the ships, just to have some inner ablative armor in case of borders, the Necron kind. Or any kind, for that matter. Also, eight pariah women from Blanktown got the prestigious role as mobile Geller Fields for the bridge and Geller generators, also in case of unwanted intruders of the more insidious type. Ludvias and Rafin came along as well, as well as twenty more blood angels for a tactical strike, if needed. How worried should I be? Decima asked me after she kissed me for a long minute. Oh, you mean the Necron thing? Not very worried. Might lose a light cruiser, depending on some factors. I answered after computing my own odds in my mind. They are gathering a thousand capital ships. Doesn't sound so easy to me, my wife whispered in a scared voice. Just place a call for Victor to return, and stay on yellow alert until he does. I said confidently then triggered the teleport beacon. Welcome aboard, Captain. Cygnus said in a joyous voice, seeming happy to see me also looking a bit older, like all normal people when they aged. Do you know how to wield a sword, Cygnus? I asked instead. 
Air. Slice and thrust. Are we expecting boarders soon? The engine seer asked in a slightly worried voice. We always do, my friend. Still traveling through the warp on the small ships. I explained patiently, although I had other reason for asking. I held out my chronoblade and had him show me a few sword moves. They sucked, even worse than me. Well, I was getting training now. Then I pointed at a tech servitor to the side. Three cuts, fast but minimal strength. The blade has atomic edge. Blinking at me then at the ornate sword with a dozen purity seals hanging from its guard, Cygnus executed the servitor and drained his life. Good enough. Make yourself a sword, Cygnus. I'm not giving you mine. I demanded after grabbing the precious Xeno artifact and returning it to its blackstone and plasteel sheath. Two weeks later, my small fleet arrived at the meeting point and I quickly considered their strategies flowing on the vox box among the gathered captains. Utter disaster, or at least until Robot Gilliman got here. Navigator, do you have a hint how to reach this world engine from here, but far enough from its weapons? Say a billion kilometers away, but in front of it. I sent via the Vox Channel. That far wouldn't be a problem, Captain. Our weapons will be out of range too. But that ship would be moving fast towards us. And we have Nova Cannons and Vortex Warheads. I explained in a patient voice. A single Vortex Torpedo wouldn't be enough, of course. But it would breach that Necron Shield. After that, I could lift a finger for humanity. As you will, Captain. Your plan at least has a chance of success, the navigator muttered in some displeasure. Sure, he got kidnapped along with this former Mantis warrior's barge during the attack on Forge Angstrom, so he wasn't really a volunteer. Then again, he was still navigating a ship, so it wasn't all bad. In a minute, we opened a warp rift and departed, ignoring the increasingly annoying Vox messages from all the other ships gathered here. It didn't take long to overtake the Necron engine and drop in front of it. Then I just closed my eyes and saw the void in the Tesseract, the dimensional shield of that planet-sized spaceship blocking teleports just as expected. But it couldn't block teleports right in front of it. A purple flash small like a pinhole opened in the Necron shield and a cyclonic torpedo sneaked inside, incinerating the surface and burrowing a dozen kilometers through the thick armor plate before detonating. Commence Nova Cannon Bombardment I ordered as more of my exterminatus grade ordnance struck the same place over and over. As soon as the Nova shells left the cannon, I flicked them into the breach while I urged the Serenity to fire our Melta torpedoes at the same spot. Flares of bright light obscured the incoming ship. High energy maneuver. Turn the ships and dive. I commanded after our torpedoes departed. The Serenity Barge had a 100 torpedo cell block on the top side, which soon reached optimal release angle and I fired them all, one per second. Meanwhile, Nova Mines and Cyclonic Torpedoes kept detonating deep and deeper into the monstrous warship, breaking apart small bits the size of mountains. Thus, I was able to start stealing everything not nailed down, jagatones of blackstone and millions of Necron weapons and machines of every kind. I strained my mind to abscond with as many broken bits of the Necron planet ship while targeting any exposed generators and conduits with high-yield explosives. No matter how redundant the Necron technology was, at one point the damage would be too much and systems will begin failing. It pained me that I had no idea what devices were powerful or rare, but I grabbed anything glowing green in the hope of figuring it later, somehow. An hour later, our visible string of torpedoes started impacting the Necron ship, just as Battle Barge Tempestus arrived next to us. The plasma warheads had little actual effect, but made for a great smokescreen. Chapter Master Lancefire, you managed to breach the Xeno's Doomsday Machine, an incredulous voice asked on the Vox Channel. Nah, it was open when I found it. And those demons burning on the surface are not the result of a vortex torpedo. Merely a flicker of imagination. I commented wryly as my fleet sped away. A series of explosions marked my words, and the shield protecting the world engine failed completely. Well, perhaps I did hit something vital after all. Time to leave this battle, as more ships were approaching. 
I was fresh out of munitions again, which wasn't fun at all. So I set course for Forge Antex to reload, while the brave ships of the Ultima Segmentum all began arriving at the scene of the crime and began firing all their weapons at the defenseless Necron ship. In a violet flash, we vanished into the warp, just as a Gloriana-class battleship named Macridge's Honor arrived to win the day, with Primarch Gilliman on board. Good for him. Kane Chapter 112 on Forge Antex, I got to meet a company of my future Lamenter Tech Marines at their school, and a company of future Blood Angels also training and learning the ways of advanced technology and ritual repairs, plus seeding their large harems with the next generations of possible blank children. The fabricator intended to keep the resulting blank girls as future tech priests and Arc Mechanicus ship captains, which made quite a lot of sense. Plus harvesting their eggs for blank machine spirits, no doubt. These days, a thousand new craters dotted a moon orbiting around the planet Antex, all results of failed cloning experiments of blank tissue. I heard rumors that the Kalexis Temple had figured out the process, but sadly I wasn't in any relation with their temple, nor was I too interested into being conscripted and mind-wiped as a future assassin. What I was interested in was modifying the pirate light cruisers into lamenter strike cruisers filled with drop pods, and the drop pods filled with tarantula turrets of my own design. And if I had to pay for this with my hard work on heretical STC patterns and bits of advanced technology from the Eldar, Dark Eldar, and Necrons, well, I did have plenty of that. You do have the strangest luck, Captain P.E.F., Finding so many ships and discovering caches of STC templates, even as damaged as these. The Archmagos of Forge Antex mused in a soft voice after taking a peek at my gifts. He also did not mention anything about the STC on Forge World Palomar, so I didn't ask. I just smiled and nodded. The Dark Eldar did have a large cache of such templates and even bits of assembly constructors. I'm sure your people on Forge Retribution already informed you. I answered in an easy-going voice while I scanned the star system for the next Arc Mechanicus, finding it hidden by a scaffold of iron asteroids, almost like a small artificial moon. I did give Antex a grand cruiser hull, like they always wanted, to remake into a true Arc Mechanicus. And since the internal volume was so large, they were also attempting to install a Macarius pattern warped less engine on it. Of course, the battleship-sized engine would not fit, so they were actually enlarging the Grand Cruiser to make the engine fit. Ingenious, if very expensive. That unholy fusion of Necron, Tau, and human technology was the hope of humanity, and the extra energy from the better plasma reactor didn't hurt one bit. I also have to thank you for damaging that Necron battle moan, and letting me know of where to find it and salvage what we can so we can certainly try refitting these light cruisers to your chapter's needs. But I also need you to test them in combat when ready, with a group of Magi specialists overseeing the deployment. Such a strategy might be effective for Cult Mechanicus as well, especially where we need to deploy a Legio Titanica and secure the landing zones in advance, the fabricator demanded and poured more wine to weaken my will. Sadly, the flesh is weak and the wine was too good. I shall have to oblige and test the new steel rain strategy, only with fewer Astartes and more guns. The two years I spent at Antex while overseeing the production of the new drop turrets and testing different variants for different missions and enemies was not wasted. I did have a thousand female catacans in my armor regiment, all of them sentinel pilots, and enough time and energy to impregnate them all, as well as training my body with Captain Khan and my bodyguards and learning more Mechanicus lessons about controlling machine spirits with my mind, and piloting my brand new night suit with advice from my stepfather, Lord Whitelance. My own night suit had a volcano lance for long-range engagements and a night-sized power glaive, kinda a sword at the end of staff, if anything big got too close. Or just for butchering infantry by the hundred with each strike. There were of course secondary weapons, like a pod of anti-air missiles and a couple of assault chain guns, but hopefully they won't be needed. This night suit, which I called Reason for Peace, also had a nice ion shield and a flare shield converted into a night-sized Rosarius and an adamantic reactor adapted from a fellblade heavy tank. 
The reactors made by Forge Tigris were indeed the smallest and the most powerful of any small reactors, and I was ready to demote a few old fell blades into doomhammers just to provide extra energy for my knights. So, when news arrived of the impending first siege of Perlia by an orc waff led by Gargash Corbel, I was ready for a showdown. The PDF regiments I had brought were also armed with new Forge Antax gear and had nearly finished training with them, everything from Chimera troop transports, Basilisk's artillery guns, armed sentinels, and weasel pattern recon light tanks. They will need to be forged on the field of battle, and experience was the best teacher anyway. Torpedoes were restocked, Nova shells and Nova mines as well, and of course the drop pods filled with tarantula sentry guns. 40,000 drop pods per cruiser for now, mostly because I wanted to retain enough lance batteries to engage escorts with impunity, much like the old litany. Those were a mix of classic twin heavy bolters and twin last cannons variants already in storage, and the new salvation pattern STCs with quad multilasers and single loss cannons, but with better armor and larger power cells. I had hoped to use the drop pods retro thrusters to provide extra energy for the turrets, but that project would take a few decades to be tested and developed into a working solution. My fragmented STC template did not provide the knowledge of how to create such a mechanism because I hadn't the faintest idea. So I let an entire forge world work on it and let them claim an Antax pattern when they did succeed. Already Forge Antax had climbed the ladder from third level to the second in Mechanicus rankings, and that meant they were given leave to produce cruisers and knights, along other more exotic and restricted Mechanicus-only robots and battle automata. Plus, the Defendarius Crusade called by Primarch Gilliman against the incoming Tyranids and Awakening Necrons obliged the Forges to work harder to produce naval assets of any kind. From orbital defense platforms to torpedo corvettes and destroyers in large numbers, plus cruisers armed with Nova cannons. Well, someone was paying attention to successful fleet actions and the less successful ones. And due to a much smaller number of Dark Eldar and Chaos raids in the Ultima Segmentum, the Primarch had an easier task of mobilizing troops and resources. Even the Eldar attacks had largely diminished, only some Corsair bands still being annoying dicks like always. The Tau were not expanding anymore, probably too busy rebuilding and reeling in their ships after their two capital cities were invaded by demons and two allies having been wiped out. The Tau would have news of the revived Primarch if they were paying attention, mostly because the human worlds under their control were being reconquered one after the other by large numbers of brutal Astartes, Imperial Knights, and Titan Legions. Down on Perlia, Commissar Kane cursed his luck again as his ragtag band of PDFs and Imperial Guard troops stumbled upon the Orc Boss Corbel's camp. Reluctantly, he called the boss out for a duel to encourage his troops and provide example. Plus killing the boss would allow a higher chance of survival, both for him and his men. The immense orc was armored to the teeth and had size and strength on his side, but Cain wouldn't let that scare him. He sneakily allowed the orc to push on his change word, drawing the brute close enough he could poke his red, furious eye with his lost pistol, then fire the entire power cell, the harmless beams deflecting from the inside of the skull and metal helmet over and over until the boss fell down, dead. For the Emperor, Cain shouted raising his eyes towards the sky. And the Emperor answered, raining down with fireballs and pillars of light, a sure sign of drop pods and orbital lances striking at the invaders. Astartes, the angels of death are here, the Vox Sergeant yelled in triumph and pointed at the sky. Well, it was about the damn time. Maybe he could rest in some secluded corner now. All around his small army, drop pods landed on pillars of flame, but instead of disgorging space marines, they unfolded to reveal thousands upon thousands of tarantula turrets, which quickly scanned the ground forces and began attacking the disorganized orcs with brutal precision. Lost cannons targeted vehicles, heavy bolters fired at knobs and mech boys, while multilasers massacred the normal boys and shooters with unlimited ammunition. This isn't just here, Commissar. The army lines to the west also report tens of thousands of drop pods falling from the skies and unleashing death on unprecedented scale. The Vox Sergeant yelled much too loud. Well, it was good news this time, so no need to admonish the man. 
Plus his eardrums might be ruptured due to the Lehman Rust tank's cannon firing from close range. What chapter is this? Where are the Astartes? Sergeant Alaric Tabor asked in confusion at the lack of actual angels of death emerging from those drop pods. They are the Lamenters, brother. Only three of them on that battle barge, and some rogue trader vessels that are engaging the Orc Space Hulk. Engine Seer Felicia Tabor explained after doing some voodoo spells on the Vox receiver. Kane nodded to himself. The Lamenters were kinda greatly diminished after the Badab War, with rumors of losses of over 90% of their battle brothers. No wonder they resorted to supply drop pods to secure a landing zone. If only three of them could come, they must be in really bad shape. Then, after most of the orcs were scattered, assault dropships did begin their landings, bringing down auxiliary regiments and even a Catacan armored regiment. Doomhammer heavy tanks, flanked by chimeras, hydras, and some sort of sentinels with mechanical arms began emerging and engaging the orc warbands, and even a pair of real knights from a house named Lancefire. A flash of a volcano lance vaporized a big underscore mech while the other knight opened up with a multi-melta gun of gigantic size and tremendous damage, while also advancing to slash with a power sword into the orc hordes. In a single hour, the back of the orc waff was broken, while the troops could only stare in awe at the amazing display, just like Kane himself was. Not even a commissar could tell the soldiers to stop gawking, since their few tanks and vehicles were protected by a fortress of auto-targeting turrets. This display of omniscience might makes me feel a bit excited. Felicia admitted while staring with wide eyes at the nearest knight with the volcano lance. At the same second, the knight turned to stare at the young engine seer, as if it has hurt her. It probably did, Kane realized, considering how sensitive a knight's auspex sensors must be. Then the knight turned and started walking towards his position beside the orc boss corpse, flanked by a dozen armed sentinels, a pair of them also holding a volcano lance in their mechanical hands, like a long rifle. Commissar Kane, you did the Imperium proud this day. I shall see your heroic actions are rewarded as you deserve, the huge knight proclaimed with a booming voice amplified by a powerful vox caster. Kane nodded cautiously and cursed his luck. He only wanted a peaceful life. Grapes Chapter 113 Engine Seer Tabor, I suppose you like my knight. Perhaps you want to touch it, all over? I asked in a wry voice, and a smaller volume. The blonde woman nodded unconsciously. Probably saw it as her life's dream. Well then, touch it you shall, pretty lady. The brave commissar coughed in surprise at being ruthlessly cock-blocked, then slumped in defeat. He wouldn't have anything better than my huge imperial knight. And his blank aid Jurgen would be much more useful pumping thousands of babies for the greater good of humanity than being wasted as an imperial guard soldier. Well then, Felicia Tabor, you and the survivors from your PDF regiment are being transferred under my command to recover my losses in this campaign. I don't need the Valhallen regiment, except your aid, Commissar Kane. Go and make haste toward the landers. I commanded while my power glaive struck the dead orc boss and chopped him into a hundred smaller bits. Damn orcs could be resurrected after all, and I wouldn't take a chance. My lord, the boss was certainly very dead, the commissar grumbled at my actions. Yes, until some pain boy found the corpse and revived it. Stand aside and let the sentinels torch the corpse now. I ordered as I urged reason back towards the battle lines. Behind me, the armed sentinels of the catacans were unleashing Prometheum over the minced corpse, while the volcano sentinels ran ahead to secure a safe path for my knight. However, I didn't have much time to waste if I wanted to recover that shadow light artifact in time. The Mechanicus Temple was already under attack by a rogue tech priest and an insane inquisitor named Ernst underscore Stavros underscore Killian with his merry band of brainwashed sisters of battle. His goals were the complete opposite of mine. While I was trying to empower humanity with blank genes, he aimed to create massive armies of psychers, as if that wouldn't backfire in a spectacular way, probably by increasing the size of the large warp storms and vortexes, like the maelstrom and the Eye of Terror. Meanwhile, I spread my awareness towards the nearby Mechanicus Shrine and kidnapped the guilty party of murderers, and the precious relics and measuring instruments as well. 
When I met with Rose again, I will let her carry out the sentence for treason and heresy. I kept the ancient artifact surrounded by megatons of black stone and then tyrannid bioships even inside the Tesseract dimension. No point letting the thing leak out warp energies. Surely my Rose and Janice could benefit from becoming alpha-level psychers. And then, there was the sacrificial psychers for the Astronomican and the Golden Throne Sleepyhead who might need a tiny power boost. Not yet, but the time will come when I was chosen a High Lord of Terra and had some actual powers in the Imperium of Man. Soon enough, the Perlia PDF were integrated as a company into the rearguard PDF regiment and given drinks and food and bunks to sleep in the STC containers serving as field barracks. They did a great work breaking through the orc lines, and their experiences will spread to my own new regiment, which wasn't lacking for vehicles and weapons now. A dozen of weasel logistic carriers were also sent to the good commissar, providing them with supplies and transport to the Imperial Guard's positions to the west, where three more of my PDF's regiments were also debarking for a combined assault against the orcs. Cleaning out Planet Perlio would take some time, even with orbital support and thousands of tanks and walkers, but it was also an excellent target practice environment for my troops and me. The western continent contained most of the industry and cities as well as the capital hive city named Havens Down, so it made sense to concentrate most defenses there. But that also allowed the rest of the planet to be infested with orcs, which would need to be eradicated with fire. However, by the time the cleansing was over, I had a new blonde concubine called Felicia, who was very much attached to the pleasures of flesh, and also loved tinkering with machinery, much like me. Her talents were more of a practical nature, possibly something imparted to her during her captivity to the orcs, as she had an intuitive understanding of any machinery no matter how advanced, even Zeno's ones. Aided by a new mind impulse unit brain implant, Felicia could now transfer her understanding directly into my mind via neural cables. This sped up my STC creation and repair a few times, and also allowed me to fix a hundred tiny problems that I didn't have a solution for. Plus the sex was excellent, even with a spinal mechadendrite in the way. Also, the decade of imposed exile from Sotha has passed, and Victor sent news of our second carrier the Deadless, returning filled with Tiger Spattern Corvettes and more Catacan regiments. Excellent news, for my new kingdom in exile. So I departed from Perlia after gifting Commissar Kane a chronoblade disguised as a relic sword, an inferno pistol, and a light power armor with a rosarius shield mounted in the chest Aquila. The armor had an enslaver bone mind shield fitted into the armored neck collar and a rough replica of my bone staff. I also left him a bodyguard of my catacans, which pleased him even more, especially the young blonde women piloting the ten armed sentinels. Perhaps the snipers too, I'm not too sure. However, Syapha's cane now looked like a proper hero of the Imperium and was even promoted to Lord Commissar, then given leave to roam as he pleased and sniff out corruption. And that Departmental Munitorum Standing Regulation to list Kane as alive and active at all times, regardless of evidence to the contrary? Well, now it would be true forever, as the man will likely never die. His life-draining sword was inscribed with a single word, Pacem, which meant peace in High Gothic. I doubted Kane would ever find peace in the 40k universe, but at least he carried it with him. And that glowing Aquila on the pommel? Wasn't any real relic supposed to glow, after all? And so I passed the warp-tracking Aquila onto Kane. Surely the man's dazzling adventures will keep any Lord Inquisitor occupied for a few decades or centuries. I didn't take the drop cruisers with me toward Sotha, because they returned to forge Antex for post-battle analysis of their pods and turrets, and I had to admit that some heavy bolter tarantulas could remain a standard deployment loadout, due to their sheer destructiveness. Only better armored and with a larger magazine. At least 1,000 rounds, not 600. However, I should have remembered that Sotha was now an inquisitorial fortress, mainly for the Ordo Zenos. I didn't find my rose here either, instead being met by a pretty blonde woman named Amberly underscore Vale who was sent to investigate the tan prisoner and the strange happenings around the Pharos installation, including temporal shifts and vanishing starships. Nothing to do with me, but I should be careful. 
Chapter Master Lancefire, I heard so many things about you that I don't even know where to begin. The cheerful woman began as she sat down in front of me, and we shared some good wine I had prepared for Rose. She even wore a custom-made power armor, the lightweight variant and a power fist, which made my jaw ache in phantom pain. Lady Amberly, I assure you, everything you might have heard about me is true, depending on what you heard. I quipped and sipped my wine as her cheeks blushed deeply. I didn't mean that, but those stories were probably true anyway. Well, I meant about Kamarak. Yes, destroying the Dark Eldar, nothing else, the Inquisitor dissembled while grinning cutely in her wine cup. That's certainly true, even the truce with the Eldar Avatar. I also have a thousand concubines and hundreds of blank sons being inducted as Astartes and the Blood Angels and the Lamenters. I admitted in a level voice, while Rafin chuckled to himself for no reason. You better wait outside, veteran. There are more delicate matters to discuss from here onwards. Inquisitor Vale demanded with a glare towards my bodyguard. Rafin glanced at me for confirmation, and I sent him the OK password via the mind implant. It wasn't like I would be exposed to psyker powers by anything, not even this pretty Inquisitor. Perhaps a different form of torture, if my guess was right and Rose praised me in too much detail. As soon as Rafin left, the woman simply sat elegantly in my lap and caressed my chin in a seductive gesture. Emperor of Man, having so much luck with ladies was great. Delicate matters? I inquired with a gentler voice. I want a null staff too, because I really need it. And I will be extremely grateful if you can make it happen, Lord P.E.F. Nothing is beyond the reach of the Inquisition, after all. Amberly proposed in a throaty voice, both enticing and menacing. So I grabbed her own chin and stared into her eyes. I don't have the prime ingredient for such a device, my dear. Rumors say the Inquisition itself is suppressing the manufacture of such rare artifacts like a null rod, such that only they have the means to defeat demons. Quite contrary to the Emperor's own wishes, that his finest warriors have the mightiest weapons, able to best any foes. Any foes? I growled in an angrier voice. The blonde woman patted my hand, so I let her go. Not my personal fault, Lord Lancefire. Probably the Ordo Malleus would do something like that. Maybe even the Ordo Hereticus. We, in the Ordo Zenos, know better, but are not as important nor have a say in the higher conclaves. I sighed and leaned back, holding the sad Inquisitor in my arms. Blank genes will help in time, as they spread more among humanity. Probably best if you start with the system governors and hive leaders, then generals and admirals. As you can sense, psyker powers or genistealer cults cannot affect a blank, thus making them less likely to turn traitor. Mind implants help as well, imposing reasoning over superstition and anger, thus reducing the occurrence of stupid decisions in the ranks of the Imperium's leaders. You mean like yourself? Or your family? Lady Amberly asked in a teasing tone. Exactly, my lady. Like myself and my family. If you're interested. I proposed in a slightly shy voice. I'm not drunk enough for that. The pretty blonde quipped and held the wine bottle in a trembling hand before gulping the contents in a long drag, which made her throat move in very seductive waves. What can I say? The flesh is weak, so I could only stare and wonder. You're very pretty, I managed to say, before she hungrily shut me up. I had plans with the pharos, but those could wait. Amberly tasted like grapes and strawberries. Phase Chapter 114 Much, much later the amazing blonde finally gave up trying to exhaust my enhanced body and crashed on top of me, sweaty and content. And to think I thought your rose was exaggerating. I bet you can still go on for hours, right? Amberly murmured in my neck in a soft voice. I let my hands wander and grope her amazing body, without using words. I got much better at bed games during the past decades, and the angel gene surely kept me going. Which was why I wouldn't accept Astarte's organs, not even the black carapace, worried they might make me impotent or sterile. And who would save the universe then? You will need a Death Watch escort, my love. And Silent Sisters against Psyker Xenos or Chaos Sorcerers. 
and as it happens, I have 200 executioners held captive, only needing a black coat of paint over their armors. I said instead, as she melted in my embrace. Of course you do, P.E.F. Those that were not accounted for from the Badab War. Maybe even some astral claws, the Inquisitor inquired and pinched my delicate progenoid glands. Damn their torture training. It was very hard to keep secrets from an inquisitive inquisitor. Especially one with a digital weapon on her finger. Maybe. But those claws are really not trustworthy now, and might have been neurally and hypnotically modified by their fallen master. I don't yet have a permanent solution to reuse their deaths for the Imperium. I muttered in displeasure. That's why I needed access to the Pharos and contact with a certain Necron wizard. And many other trades of mutual benefit, of course. And what? You just produce 200 executioners and expect them to become Death Watch Marines from their own initiative? Nobody asking questions? Amberly asked in a curious voice. Well, I didn't think that far ahead. You can take a company and my rose the other. As for how to motivate them, it should be easy enough for an Inquisitor. Their chapter is under a penitent crusade for the next century, and the Death Watch always needs more bodies. The borders of the Imperium are quite extensive. I argued as glanced at the door, as Ludvias leaned inside to check on me, then held his thumb up for another impossible and improbable conquest. And the Blood Angels are still watching over you, ever since you killed that traitor Steel. I shall need to know why, the pretty blonde demanded in a steely voice. It's complicated, my dear. Only part that matters is me revealing the Inquisitor's corruption and returning to them the Spear of Sanguinius. Those are the facts, the rest is highly interpretable, and thus considered the chapter's dark secret, to be added to the long list of such secrets for every Astartes chapter. Still nothing is dubious as the exorcists being implanted with demon hosts, or the death underscore specters killing their aspirants with poisons then bringing back a percent of them as neophytes. I commented wryly just to see Ludvias become rather upset and Amberly rather tense. I see there's very few secrets you don't know, Chapter Master. Doesn't surprise me you're able to defeat any enemy with such ease. Inquisitor Vale concluded with a good enough reasoning. Well, on my ship I speak with the voice of the Emperor, my dear. Everything I say and do is thus approved by the Emperor himself. Absolute and unlimited legal authority, given by my rosette, my warrant of trade, and my lamenter's chapter. I explained in a softer voice, and ordered Ludvias out before he started crying again. As the Blackstone armored door closed, Amberly sat up, already awake and combative. You should know better than that, Lord P.E.F. The High Lords of Terra are the rulers of the Imperium, and all those trinkets can also be revoked. Amberly claimed in a stern voice and poked my chest in warning. The Imperium Eterna. Of course the High Lords would want that and keep their privileges. But it's not quite true, Agent of the Throne. The Emperor might be slightly indisposed right now, but two of his sons are back. And while Khan might be vanished somehow, Gilliman is too popular to remove. I'd expect at least six of these High Lords to rebel soon enough, exactly when Gilliman reaches Terra and proclaims himself Lord Commander and Imperial Regent. And won't that be a fun struggle for the High Lords of Terra? I asked rhetorically, and instead of poking her back, I drew her into a deep kiss and groped her bountiful body again. Soon enough, the enemy was laid low and conquered again, with love. Wasn't that hard, as her reserves were dwindling. Oh God! Please let me rest. She asked in a pleading tone. I could be merciful sometimes. Return to your fortress, my dear. I shall arrange a prisoner transport for your new death watch. I whispered in her ear and went for a cold shower. Inquisitors could be amazingly fun, but always so dangerous. I would need more of them on my side, and my charm seemed to work. Although I shall need some other method for most of them. Women were few in the higher ranks of the Imperium, no doubt exactly because the flesh was weak and women more liable to be deviated from their master's agenda. It wasn't a perfect solution, but once kids began showing up, maternal instincts took over and that was something much harder to erase compared to other reasons. 
A dozen minutes later, I arrived inside the Pharos and began lining up exterminators torpedoes for today's punishments and a vortex warhead for the nice blue towel. The demon world of Bastonville burned, and with it the last remains of the Company of the Shadow Trader chapter. Then soon after, the planet Ahi underscore Tipua followed, incinerating their chaos titans and disgusting sacrificial temples to the dark gods. The tan on the wall watched me in silence as I began arming the next exterminatus grade warhead. Where is that going, my lord? Rafin asked as the torpedo's logis engine began humming for fire and death. This one, to Razlovanova. The night house there fell to chaos, and I don't feel like giving them an honorable death in a duel. Nor would it be that easy as my adventure on Prelia. I explained in a wry voice, and consigned that world to oblivion. I did get tired after this, so I took out my bone staff to lean on it for strength. Maybe one more warhead today. But not yet. First, I used the Tesseract and retrieved a dozen Necron artifacts to be identified by the captive Tan. Mighty Zaryulash, I expect you know what these are. I asked in a friendly voice. P.E.F. Lancefire, still at this useless and foolish game. Removing unimportant pieces from the game? The Immaterium's emanations will just corrupt other human worlds. And those Tyranid swarms entering the galaxy, they hunger. They will come again, here, and to your weapon on the golden pedestal. You cannot win, the Tan argued, and most likely correctly. There wasn't a real solution to the chaos or the Tyranids. I could already sense bigger hive tendrils pushing back on the Pharos perception with their combined silence. I have never lost a battle, mighty Tan. The hard things we do now, the impossible a bit later. You should learn to trust me already. Now, these captured Necron items? Name and use and approximate value for a Necron dynasty. I demanded in a gentle tone, like talking to a baby. Sure, the Tan might be a god, and strong and wise, but he wasn't whole. Perhaps. Perhaps you can indeed find a way like you always do, P.E.F. Lancefire. I shall aid you with this, and we will be even. Zaryulash announced in a definitive tone. I just smiled kindly at his pathetic attempts for negotiation. Then I began noting down the uses and value of these rare items, of which only one was actually good, and two more of medium value. I might have picked up the vacuum cleaner just because it was glowing with green lights. The phase underscore shifter was enabling an ability that I saw the Crimson God Tan use, letting Titan-grade weapons pass through him without doing damage or sinking himself into the ground. The other two were called a cloak underscore of underscore the underscore tan, which was certainly needed to use the powers of an enslaved tan, while the other was a nebuloscope, basically a multidimensional tracker which would serve me well one day. Trazen was certain to posse these last two, but a phase shifter was rare even among Necron lords. Lord Trazen, congratulations on the warp rift test. I began with a teasing voice, and letting him know I saw his new Blackstone Fortress close a small warp rift near his homeworld. Ah, the wandering stranger has returned. I have deduced you must be a human. Or perhaps an Astartes, the Necron Overlord warned me, after no doubt he tried to observe where the Tesseracts have been present and blocked certain timelines. I'm not too sure myself, my robotic friend. So what progress did you make on those projects we have together? I asked, this time really curious. The cruiser-sized reactor with a Mechanicus STC template is ready. Wasn't even hard, if I may be so honest. The warp less engine miniaturization, well. It's a bit harder without some more advanced materials and production capabilities. I only have one version smaller by 20% and already needs angstrom scale engineering. Only those human grand cruisers and the larger battle cruisers will be able to use them. As for the Eldar weapons, they work backwards to any scientific principle. Trazen complained and seemed exasperated. I feel your pain, my friend. Technology should not grow when you sing at it. Damn Eldar bonezingers. It was only a suggestion, Lord Trazen. Perhaps psychoplastics and soul-fused crystals are more magitic than real science. But you do have plenty Mechanicus ships and weapons in your tesseracts. 
After you copy all of them, you might attempt to reverse engineer those for my mentally handicapped tech priest's friends of lesser education to mass produce. Mostly gravity and direct energy weapons that would work on tyranids. My recent long-range scans point to a dozen large tendrils followed by a gravity-bending mass of hungry mouths and sharp claws. I explained in a gentler tone, drawing his ire towards the invading bugs. That sounds exciting, to be honest. It will be the greatest struggle in the recent history of the galaxy. And this Gilliman per March is certainly trying to defeat the Tyranids with those rather flimsy ships and weapons. Hmm. I could help a little, even if it's cheating. After all, the humans do have somewhat better weapons, they just forgot about them. Trays in the infinite aloud after long minute, no doubt checking on my own observations. And so, I sent him the phase shifter, in advance. I was so trustful, right? Very well, Necron Lord. A trade was made. I hope you don't need instructions on how to use a phase shifter. The Crimson God already has this ability, so it's useless to me now. I explained in a faint tease. Air. I thought the Canoptic link was encrypted with my best, anyway, yes. This would be very useful to keep my person safe, especially if anyone figures out who actually killed a certain pharaoh, he he. Trazen exclaimed in a joyful tone. I sighed inward, as it seemed the insane Necron had indeed trapped the tan controls and did not expect me to survive. You broke your word, Lord Trazen. You owe me two free trades for that. One is another null bone staff, using your own resources. The other, those Venatoria Titans and their pilots, with enslaver-based mind control implants. They shall be sent to forge retribution, along with the data slates for their manufacture STCs. I demanded in a harsh tone, almost ready to transport a vortex torpedo on his location. Since Trazen couldn't find the reality cage in the Eye of Terror, he did what any Necron always did and attacked Forge World Venatoria to steal it. The Mechanicus tried to chase him back to his homeworld, only to get trapped into a labyrinth like all the others who tried. It would be a pity to kill him, but I was getting tired of his bullshit. Say whatever about Trazen, he did have top-notch survival instincts. You are correct, stranger. I went over the bounds of our agreement. Perhaps I wanted to test you? I am not certain why I did that. I grumbled inward then set over a lock of Amberly's hair and closed the mental link. We would need a dual blank slash psyker child to make the weapon work properly, but I was already hard at work on that issue. Then I checked on the Tau, only to find a large Demiurg ship in their homeworld's orbit. Well then, I have found a target for that Vortex torpedo after all. Stay away from Tau next time. Triplex Chapter 115 with the Ajita's dungeon now filled with the captured executioners, Amberly was quite busy explaining to the silly space marines the errors of their ways and what happened to their chapter. And since they were presumed dead in the hundred of vaporized ships at Forge Angstrom, nobody would miss these two hundred dead Astartes while the Death Watch got new recruits for their brutal work, often involving sending suicidal kill teams straight at the heart of some Xeno Empire and expecting them to kill everything or die. Or both. Now I only had the Astral Claws in reserve, if quite a lot of them. If nothing worked, I could just extract their gene seeds and make more Tech Marines. Like 16,000s more. It would simply be another dark secret in a chapter's dark basement of such secrets. The Emperor would approve, I had no doubt. But if he didn't, he could simply speak up. Nobody spoke, so it must be all right. However, a month later I did have my apothecary confirm that Amberly was with child, which was great. I worked hard for that result every day, for long, sweaty, and tiring hours. Henna has already delivered another blank daughter, and was now recuperating and mostly reading things in bed. I didn't mind at all. Reading was very important, even more here. My dear blonde engineer Felicia was also in the same pregnant state and seemed quite happy with her new life, often sneaking into the knight's deck to paw all over the machines, before eagerly running back to the Mechanicus Shrine to learn more from the tech priests on board the Serenity. 
I wouldn't let her modify my Imperial Night Walker until I was absolutely certain she understood the basic technology front and back. And for that, I had Felicia work on the tarantula and sentinel mating, something that would indeed give legs and create a mobile turret of equivalent firepower to most Astartes and often even more for the lost cannon turrets. I would have to plate the new Guardian robots with Blackstone armor to give them enough durability to last on the against stronger enemies, but I had more than enough Blackstone now, so could even cover a planet in this stuff. Then give a battalion of 100 of such walkers for a Tech Marine to command, and then deploy 1,000 Tech Marines with their autonomous robots on any battlefield. It would be something like the Legions of Old, which had 100,000 Astartes each. And we would need such levels of firepower to clean up Tyranid-infested worlds or liberate planets from the orcs without burning them. Burning some world with Exterminatus was easy, but those planets would not bear life again. However, I did loot like 1% of an entire Necron planetoid made of Blackstone, which gave me enough to cover all the Imperium ships with several meters of it. I also looted much of the Orc Space Hulk at Perlia, possibly enough adamantium to construct a couple of battleships. Or tens of thousands of cheaper corvettes. I was getting low on Exterminator's torpedoes again, which was a sure sign that something bad will hit toward Sotha, like it always did. The Pharos was too potent of a weapon in the hands of humanity. But even so, I did burn all the fallen knights' worlds I could reach, from Gerontius and Derivir in the north to Credence in the south, and even a dozen smaller hellforges, a dozen more chaos chapter worlds, and some Xenos empires like the Faroki, which seemed a bit too beastly to cohabit peacefully with humanity. Actually, beside the Eldar and the Tau, there were very few races that I would allow to exist, mostly because they all seemed eager to fight, enslave, or eat humans. Not a good survival trait to have, in the same galaxy as me, if I had my way. And if you were in the range of the Pharos, I would have my way. Sooner or later, the time will come. Beside massive explosions that would incinerate entire planets, I did dispense smaller bombs when I located cults and genistealers, or roving pirates and corsairs, even traitor ships if I could easily discern their allegiance. Normally those chaos ships would be filled with mangled bodies, skulls, and other telltales like eight-pointed spikes, so a plasma warhead inside their reactor room would ruin their days and lives. Sadly, I didn't find more corrupt inquisitors, although I did check about 20 for corruption signs or enslaved cults. Then again, you could never be certain what was really in the heart of someone, anyone. Just like Naya's turned traitor, so could anyone else. Pretty much why all the older lamenters were followed everywhere by my silent sisters, both veterans or novices. Kinda hard to fall to chaos with a pariah standing by your shoulder all the time. The Starfort did have three Geller Generatoriums of Mechanicus best grade, plus a dozen mechanical Geller Generators in every wing of the fort, but those weaker fields tended to fail at least once per week, even with the fort just sitting in orbit. Someone or something was certainly trying to use warp fuckery to mess with my chapter and give them nightmares and unlucky accidents. Sadly, we would need to endure for a few decades until I had my own apothecaries trained and ready to carry the job, while also being blank. And if I could produce more dual blank slash psychers, they could become my librarians and smack demons with alpha-level spells while laughing at their ineffective curses. But until then, I was preparing to deal with more Tyranid fleets, like High Fleet Moloch that was busy right now devouring the Pale Stars region. I just needed warp less drives for my ships, or else I would be forced to always run from advancing wavefronts of silence and being denied intelligence and maneuver for my fleet. Deploy the warp engine ships in orbit over important planets, while hunting with my battleships and carriers only? It might work if I had sufficient provisions. And as it happened, a real Inquisitor was around to requisition those supplies, specifically torpedoes and Nova shells. That goal set, I proceeded to consult with Amberly about this, while asking gently about my rose. My colleague is on some infiltration task towards the Tau, that's all I know. Mind control might be involved, but we don't have hard evidence about these ethereals. Inquisitor Vale said in a still stern, but more normal voice, now that we were friends and lovers and building a family. No more wine though, so the blonde bombshell wasn't as pliable as before. 
I nodded thoughtfully as I did suggest this task to my rose. That's too bad. I have a crazy and traitor inquisitor in detention, the one that massacred the Mechanicus Shrine on Perlia, and also brainwashed a squad of Sisters of Battle to aid him. When I apprehended him, he was trying to mass-produce an army of psychers and empower them with some Xeno's artifact being examined by the Mechanicus. Now, if this Killian tried for example to boost the Emperor or the Astronomican fuel, it would have been different. He wanted instead to attack the Eye of Terror with a horde of millions of Chaos cultists with Beta and Alpha level Psyker powers. I explained in a careless voice. The pretty Inquisitor changed a dozen faces before settling on just one. Death. I will need to interrogate him and his accomplices, Lord Lancefire. I expect you also have that Zeno's artifact somewhere, she demanded in a harsh voice. Very tightly contained, of course. Nothing that the Inquisition can provide, unless you can open pocket dimensions with your psyker powers? I asked in a mild voice. Technically, the Inquisition did have such means, just like that demon cash on Pythos, but that was made 10,000 years ago, and they even forgotten about that prison. Amberly glared at me then sighed, as her powers weren't even close to my rose, probably only a gamma-level psyker. This ability of yours drives me crazy. It's almost like you're a Patanova navigator, not a mere blank. I smiled and nodded. I am something like that, my dear. A Patanova for blanks, if you will. And you carry one of my descendants right now. One day, I will be a High Lord of Terror, probably as the speaker for rogue traders. I whispered to her in confidence. She frowned as she meditated on my words and measured me with something approaching caution. That's why you gather so many allies. It's a power play, she asked in suspicion. Restoring the Emperor is my final goal, my dear. Still need to figure out how to revive Primarch's Lion and perhaps Sanguinius. I have maybe half the puzzle pieces ready. But until then, there's still the Tyranids to deal with, especially the big tendril coming from the north right now, and then the big claws from the east and from the south. Might need to establish listening posts equipped with lasers and radio emitters and screens of carriers patrolling the borders with warp-less engines. Perhaps geomagnetic geller field around entire planets to counteract the silence. I'm used to myself and sip more expensive wine by myself. Amberly sighed and sipped her expensive fruit juice with too many vitamins. We can visit Triplex Fall and requisition what you need. More Nova cannons, I expect? I just smiled and sent an engram call to Felicia to join us. We could end the sad story here and have some fun. Then I called Henna as well, because she was surely lonely and bored in the nursery. Amberly will just have to get used to the new reality, and this way was the most pleasant. She figured it out in a second when Henna and Felicia arrived wearing only bulky robes, escorted inside by Ludvias. You want all of us? At once. I just grinned and jumped on the bed. Only the women. I quipped in a teasing tone, making Ludvias chuckle and check his combi bolter. You're the best, Lord P.E.F. Felicia exclaimed with glee and rushed to join me in bed. P.E.F. has a thousand more concubines back home. Better get used to it, Amberly. Henna said in a gentler voice and then winked suggestively. The blonde inquisitor stared at me for a second before shrugging and starting to take off her leather clothes. Just as planned, I thought to myself while drawing Henna into a long kiss. Coming Storm Chapter 116 After two weeks of traveling through the warp, we reached the forge triplex fall to find it in great upheaval, a thousand of asteroids dragged in concentric circles around the shipyards and the forge world itself perhaps a dozen conveyors being refitted as fleet carriers and a second battleship nearly completed. It was even being plated over with Blackstone, just like I was doing for nearly every vehicle and ship, even the Astartes' armor. The stuff was incredibly resilient to be fair, more so than ceramite and even adamantium, although not as easy to work with since we could only mine it, not manufacture this material. Anyway, I was glad to see at least the Ultima Segmentum forges adapting to produce better products after stagnating and even decaying for 10,000 years. Sure, 
Perhaps the sudden decrease in chaos, Eldar, and in dark Eldar incursions and raids helped as well, and the looming threat of the Tyranids and the sudden awakening of more Necron tomb worlds also contributed to the frenetic activity. P.E.F. Lancefire, we owe you much, but everything you've seen in orbit is being requisitioned by the Defendarius Crusade. I can give you no ships. The fabricator declared loudly after glancing at Inquisitor Vale for a second. A cruiser in the next decade, if you come alone, another message followed on my implant. I didn't even come to ask for ships. But sure, another cruiser will be nice. So I just smiled patiently and held out my own gift, a data slate with the tarantula drop pods, the modified light cruiser for inserting them, and a dozen templates for sentinels, both piloted and autonomous. You might have heard I have taken charge of the Lamenters chapter, Fabricator. The chapter might lack battle brothers right now, but we did our duty anyway, with sentry turrets and auxiliary regiments. I hope our combat testing at Perlio will prove sufficient, as these war machines have bested an orc waff with little difficulty. I explained while the Archmagos perused the templates and the combat records attached. He powered up his cogitator and measured the silent Inquisitor again, as if looking for my confirmation. A massive orbital drop, followed by landing of mechanized and armored troops. Even a hundred doom blades and some fell blades. Your auxiliary forces seem strong enough, perhaps too strong, Chapter Master, the fabricator commented with some surprise. He was right, of course. I would always prefer some armor between enemy fire and my soldiers, because even light tanks and sentinels had ten times more armor than a grenadier in carapace armor. Sadly, Forge World Antex could not figure out how to connect the pod retrothrusters to the turret's power cells, and thus the energy for laser guns is limited, compensated with larger numbers. Heavy bolter turrets or autocannons would run out of ammunition even faster. As for other options like plasma guns and flammers, the technology is fragile anyway, and would not survive the high G forces of an orbital drop. I said calmly and examined the trading goods with a raised eyebrow. It seemed they had already began producing my own designs of Macarius pattern tanks, mostly the Volcano Lance and the Plasma Blast Gun variants. The Plasma Blast Gun variant even had adamantic reactors instead of the classic plasma reactor. That allowed supporting flare shields and increased rate of fire, plus nigh unlimited mobility. You may select anything your chapter needs, Lord Lancefire. For the Sons of Omnisia, everything we can do, we will do, the fabricator announced in a proud tone, and he spewed some scented incense and a barrage of tetragrammic prayers in Benharic. Yes, you will take priest. But right now, we are in need of munitions to halt High Fleet Moloch in the Galactic North. Torpedoes, missiles, and Nova shells. Show me everything you have in storage. Amberly demanded in a harsh tone, her left hand revealing her rosette for a millisecond. Without commenting, the fabricator began lighting up more Holofield screens with inventories of capital-class munitions. I could only gawk at the immense stores available to a big forge world. Where could they even keep all this? For starters, I shall requisition torpedoes, 200 atmospheric incendiaries, and 20 vortex warheads. Then 1,000 melta warheads and 400.000 plasma warheads. As for Nova shells, I think most of them. 4,600 Nova shells, and you'll have 97 remaining to resupply the Victory Battleship's holding station in orbit. I will need 4,000 of these Nova shells modified for my MIU implants trigger and detonation. And lastly, 8 million Krog missiles and 2,000 Vortex missiles. Hopefully it will be enough. I demanded in a shameless voice. Then again, it was a damn high fleet. It will probably won't be enough. My two carriers could unload 2,000 corvettes, and those will only have 10 shots with their cells of torpedoes and missiles. That's why I needed more Nova shells to thin the ranks of the incoming bugs to more manageable levels. This will delay fully arming the Segmentum's battle fleet carriers for a decade or maybe two. Primarch Dilliman will not be pleased, the fabricator warned me as his stores of torpedoes dropped in the red. The carriers can move, Tech Priest. Have them sent to Metallica or Anvilus to load with torpedoes. 
Anything else you need from this forge, Lord Lancefire? My dear Inquisitor asked while dismissing the fabricator's complaints. One of these navy carriers, loaded only with fury interceptors, with their flight crew and engine seer's support. I think we could fit about 8,000 of these starfighters easily. And then, a dozen navy cruisers armed with Nova cannons and a dozen light cruisers refitted for orbital pod drops. The defense fleet should have at least 200 escorts for orbital support and interceptions of flying creatures and lander spore pods. Mostly armed with energy-based weapons, if possible. The new drop cruisers shall be remitted to my lamenter's chapter if and when this hive fleet is defeated. There are more planets out there in the fringe that will need to be reconquered. I concluded in a thoughtful voice. Well, the Lamenters were in theory a fleet-based chapter, and once we had a full complement we could start attacking and conquering anything we found in the Eastern Fringe, while the rogue trader dynasty would benefit by absorbing those conquered planets and star systems into our domain. The fabricator general measured me for a long minute, then nodded slowly. We will need a year to prepare everything to your needs, Lord Lancefire. And the Lady Inquisitor better have an ear to her superiors, or this plan of your might fall apart, just like Inquisitor's Crippman plan did. You will not need Astra Militarum Guardsmen for this. I would expect at least 100 regiments for an operation on this scale. I sighed inward while considering the offer. Generally, most Imperial Guard regiments would be poorly supplied and poorly trained, and would not help much when the horizon was filled with moving fields of Tyranid's biological war engines. However, a dozen armor regiments, and a fifty artillery regiments, those could make a big difference. If anything, the Imperial Guard could hold ground quite well. Moving and maneuvering was a different issue, of course. I went to change the Holofield screen myself, checking the stores for hydras and basilisks. Hey, they even had lost cannon sentinels in stock. I will take all of them. We will take 50 regiments of Valhallen artillery, 10 of Cadian armor, and 40 of Catacan infantry. Of course they don't have air interceptors, so we will need extra 10,000 hydra anti-air and 5,000 basilisk mobile artillery platforms plus all of these 8,700 sentinels. It only comes out about 200 sentinels per frontline regiments, but it must be enough. It's better than they had anyway. Oh, and STC's containers with supplies for all of them, triple ammunition loadout. Enough tech priests and acolytes for all the extra holy machines and a million servitors to help around. I allowed after reviewing the better imperial regiments in my mind. Amberly glanced at me as if trying to object to something, then sighed softly. You better not fail, Lord Lancefire. It might ruin my career. I grinned with confidence. Have no fear, Lady Vale. We are what they fear. I quipped in a cheerful voice, then held my hand out to the fabricator. Always a pleasure and an honor to meet the brightest of the cult mechanicus, fabricator. When your next battleship dock gets free, let me know and I'll bring an old ironclad for refit here. The muggos just nodded as it was only natural and shook my glove with a mechanical one. You're not too bad yourself, P.E.F. Lancefire. Try not to die too soon. The Mechanicus has great plans for you. Well, wasn't that ominous at all? Then again, I did kinda lift an entire segmentum with my own shoulders. Those fabricated geniuses might have begun to notice, perhaps. Perhaps, when the time is right there will be a new High Lord seat for the rogue traders. Not until his son takes the sword, though. I proposed in a level voice, then turned around and left, with the pretty blonde Inquisitor at my side. The same day, I used the astropathic choir to request the Tranquility Battleship and the Deadless Carrier to be sent here, while Amberly began sending her own messages to various Astra Militarum regiments to summon them here for a small crusade. And then, I could only hurry up and wait, and copy Jurgen's example by impregnating a few concubines every day. Also train my body with Captain Khan and study and work beside Felicia on a dozen STC templates with slightly better results. As time passed, 
more and more ships began gathering, first an Iron Hand Strike Cruiser, then a White Scars Battle Barge with some escorts, then the regiments on their troop transports, and lastly my daughter Andrea with her Mars Battle Cruiser and the Deadless, plus all the frigates of my Lancefire dynasty. All six of them. Dad. I named my Battle Cruiser Prayer for the Vanquished. And the Machine Spirit loves it. Andrea explained in a jubilant voice, while holding a baby in her arms. I glanced at her chosen husband, a catechan named Sly underscore Marbo, who was rather famous and infamous at the same time. Excellent news, sweetie. Ugly husband you have found for yourself. I commented wryly, and kissed her and the blank grandchild in greeting, and saw with my helmet pick cam the catechan glare at me for a second. Well, he was rather ugly, but not everyone had angel genes. Plus, Mr. Marbo would make a decent commander for my special ops group. Eh, Sly has good parts, too. Look what a nice boy he gave me. Andrea replied with an appreciating look at her husband who smiled proudly. He probably beat up a hundred other catacans to win Andrea's hand and favor, just like I've taught my girls to demand. Only the best survival genes, as all my descendants were rather angelic in their looks anyway. Come with me, Sly. I guess I can give you a major rank and leave you in charge of the Special Ops Command. Your job will be to cause disruption and misery behind enemy lines, and you'll have whatever means my house can provide. I just want results. I explained in a teasing voice. He would love a free hand to cause destruction, no doubt. The grizzly veteran blinked in surprise at my offer. That sounds like excellent news to me. I won't let you down, father-in-law, the man spoke in a gruff tone, like he wasn't used talking at all. I smiled inward and considered giving him a chronoblade. It might be too much even for this 40k universe. Sly was a walking storm of disaster anyway. Oh well. Andrea would be sad if Sly died, so he will never die. Sanctions Chapter 117 in a minute, I reached my chapter master quarters aboard the Serenity and let Sly get familiar with the place and inspect all the weapons and artifacts placed on the walls. I did have plenty of relics to show off and a mountain of them in my tesseract. Amberly was already waiting in her armchair, sipping tea and spinning tarot cards to read possible timelines. Offer the Inquisitor your hand, Major. I demanded after powering up my cogitator and selecting a hundred items on a list, all useful for infiltration, sabotage, and outright murder. Sly Marbo hesitated for a second before nodding and offering a hand for inspection. Ouch. Not only I can't read him, his touch makes me feel sick, the blonde inquisitor exclaimed in a thin voice, obviously in pain. See, Major. That's why you had to work alone and couldn't have friends or family till now. You're an untouchable, or better said a psychic blank. One in a trillion people are born with this gift, much rarer than psychers. I announced in a patient tone, while Amberly wiped her hand in disgust. I know, the big catacan soldier muttered and then lit himself a thick cigar, dragging from it with satisfaction. Amberly fled the room after glaring at Sly Margot in outrage. Amberly is pregnant and doesn't like smoke. Even holy incense makes her sick. My own gift is milder, although I did send a psyker girl screaming to the floor at a ball. Inquisitors are made of sterner stuff, because they need to be. I continued as my bodyguard Rafin leaned back on his plasteel dais and started cleaning his power sword with scented oil and plying the machine spirit of the weapon with twirling swirls of blue smoke and low voice litanies. Sly observed the ritual curios and then dragged from his foul cigar with a careless shrug. Never cared for that mechanicus crap. Never needed them either, the man commented in a superior tone and walked around to stare at the proposed list of infernal devices. Some of these rituals are indeed useless, others are recharge and maintenance protocols, regular security password checkups and purity seals against warp entities. The Lamenters know this very well, especially when their own weapons explode in their hands, or entire warships vanish in warp storms and freak accidents. Blanks are much less bothered by demons and warp-based curses, up to being immune or even inimical to demons that they can banish them with mere proximity. 
That last category is called Pariah, a trait developed by the Emperor himself into the Silent Sister's genome. I explained softly and turned my hand to reveal a psych-out grenade obtained by grinding pariah bones into dust, while the cogitator holoscreen selected the weapon and revealed the weapon's capabilities. Sly examined and possibly memorized the parameters of his new toy. We should make millions of these grenades, he demanded in a practical tone. They do make millions of them. On Luna and Terra, maybe Mars too. Catch Blanks and Pariah's men, and grind their bones into anti-demon dust. Or boil them alive in red-hot iron to make phase iron when the death echoes imprint into the metal. Neurons and nerves extracted for blank machine spirits to make titans immune to demons and corruption. And it's possible worse for the sisters, and definitely worse for the brainwashed Colexus assassins. I hear only one in a thousand passes the trials. Their corpses are still very useful, after all. I mused while watching the man nearly crush the phase iron grenade in his hand. I see. Perhaps we should not make millions of these grenades. Blank soldiers and officers are immune to this chaos bullshit, right? The catacan brute proposed in a more level tone. I nodded gently. Already working on that, as you saw with dear Andrea. I have a thousand concubines, and so will you and any other blank man we find. And we'll keep our family secret in the Eastern Fringe till we have enough numbers. Trillions of blanks and armies of pariahs. Thus, you're hereby forbidden to die, not until you have a thousand blank children. I ordered with a thin smile. Sly grunted as if hit with a Terminator fist in the stomach. It shall be so, Lord Lancefire. But I'm not good with women. He admitted in a shy voice. Doesn't matter. I might pass on to you my current catacan concubines, at least those with a foul mouth and demanding a real man. I added with a wry grin. Just smack, I mean. I shall take them off your shoulders, father-in-law. You're too pretty for a real man anyway. Sly Marbo quipped and grinned with an ugly smile. I didn't mind smack talk about my angelic face. I did that every day to my mirror. But not my kids. A bolter pistol appeared in my hand, and I tapped his progenitor glands with it. You smack my dear daughter once, I shoot one ball off. You smack her twice, it's your head, clear? I asked in a pleasant voice. His smile vanished as he glanced at the weapon that just appeared in my hand. Loud and clear, sir. Very useful ability to carry extra munitions in the field, he observed in a professional voice. I carried more than munitions in there. A lot more. I shall try to obtain a small dimensional pocket for your use, Major. They are just extremely expensive, like all ancient relics. Until then, you have a month to organize a company of special ops troops with anything you saw here, and perhaps more. Automated turrets and sentinels, dropships, drop pods, a stealth dropship even. You will also all need mind implants and perhaps power armor to carry larger loads. Deck 4 is reserved for you and this unit, so get started. I commanded, curious what he will do with a free hand. I mean, this guy liberated entire worlds by himself, even took down scores of Chaos Marines and a Chaos Titan. Most of his military records were sealed, even for me, so I could only make educated guesses about his real abilities. And, perhaps Trazen did have a ship-sized labyrinth in his collection to carry demolition ordnance and other supplies. They would be much easier to make than a tesseract able to cover a solar system. Rafen coughed as Sly Marbo left the room and held his own psych-out grenade in a silent question. We will still use the weapons, Rafen. We won't let their deaths be in vain. But there will be a time for reckoning, one day. You can bet a throne on that. I muttered in a cold voice. The veteran nodded and stored the grenade back on his combat harness. There is nothing to bet, my lord. In a few decades, there will thousands of blank Astartes. And the Primarchs were contemporaries of the Silent Sisters on Terra. They fought beside them from Mars to Prospero. The debt will never be forgotten, he declared in a certain voice. I wasn't so sure, 
Primarchs could be too pragmatic sometimes, even with the deaths of their sons, not mention other people unrelated to them. Then again, those Astartes' sons were merely imprinted with gene seeds, not their birth children. Not like mine. From this meeting, I went to meet with the regiment commanders and organized the land armies for deployment, held in the largest meeting hall on the battle barge. It was no surprise to see a hundred colonels and a few generals already at each other's throats, while commissars and section psychers stood watch just as their bodyguards and while aides and lex mechanics and auto savants were often called to explain certain logistic problems or solve a dispute who deserved what munitions. The catacans colonels were way more reserved, probably surprised they were even invited to such an august meeting, even those of noble origin. They had no auto savants and few lex mechanics, but they had ogren bodyguards, which leveled the odds in their favor. I even recalled meeting one smart ogren bodyguard back on Forge Riza, still guarding General Greece. The Catacan 2nd Regiment was now commanded by Colonel Straken, loaded on the carrier Deadless at Forge Tigris. The Inquisitor stood on a high dais, flanked by her new Death Watch guardians, all wearing ominous blank armor without any insignia at all, beside the Inquisitorial Seal. They were already dead, and the Inquisitor will decide where to spend their deaths. Nothing more. No chapter, no honor, not for them. Attention everyone. Be silent. Bodyguards wait outside, you're all safe in my presence. I boomed using the room's vox casters at maximum power, making everyone not protected stumble and sway from shock. The all will come later. Ludvias hefted his power maul on his shoulder, ready to enforce my order. On the side, I saw Lord Commissar Kane slump and defeat at my presence, while a dozen priests from the Adeptum Ministorum all began vociferating and threatening me with sanctions. Oi, you heard the Emperor's son. Out. Nord did dog, the big ogren yelled and began waving his big automatic shotgun at the other bodyguards. Most of the escorts started to trickle out, while I waited patiently. A crusade wouldn't work easily, not from the start. Then one higher rank priest started raising his staff and praying loudly and asking me to repent, and he vanished somewhere. Ludvias, start breaking the heads of any insubordinate traitors. I commanded as the entire room stared at me in awe. As the Blood Angel veteran hefted his weapon and made it glow and hum, by powering up the energy field, descent turned into panic and the delegation started running towards the exit while pleading to be let out faster. I saw only three women among the regiment commanders, an older woman called Rayla Van, then two prettier ones from Valhalla, named Janet Sulla and Regina Castine. General Van was in command of three Cadian armor regiments, all dispatched from the fortress world of Spite, guarding the Hadex Anomaly Rift. Well, I did kind of burn pretty much everything of strategic importance for chaos in the area, so they would be available now. As for the other two, they were the Colonel Castine and her aide Major Sulla, commanding the 296th All-Female Valhallen Artillery Regiment, which was very promising for my own needs. Sly and Ferrick Jurgen could have all the catacan concubines they could find. I really liked the Norse features of these Valhallen women. We're going to fight Tyranids, more exactly High Fleet Moloch, which is attacking the Imperium from the north. It's possible everyone here will die very soon for the Emperor, while eaten alive and crying in pain. Everyone, but not the good Commissar Kane over there, as the Emperor watches over him for some reason. I explained in a half-serious voice, while a thousand eyes locked on the cowardly Commissar with curious eyes. I think I saw Kane swallow his tears for a second. For those of you who never fought against the Tyranids, you should expect the horizon to be filled with giant bugs, on the ground, in the air, and in orbit. Trillions of them. Stubber weaponry will not bother them at all, and most of the guards' infantry weapons will be minimally effective. I concluded in the ominous silence. Splinters Chapter 118 I saw all the generals and officers nod glumly at my description. Then Major Sulla raised her eyes to look at me. We will die for the Emperor, Lord Lancefire. But perhaps, we might be given more weapons, she asked in a calm voice, as if expecting to be punished. I smiled gently and turned on the central hologram projector. More weapons, yes. 
For now, I've managed to requisition 5,000 basilisks and 10,000 hydras with extra ammunition. Thus, every regiment will have 100 hydras each, while the artillery regiments will receive 100 guns more. The infantry regiments will also receive 200 sentinel walkers and some automated tarantula turrets. As for armor, there are 200 Lehman Rust tanks and 100 Macarius tanks available to be spread among the regiments. At need, the Lamenters will deploy our auxiliary regiments and provide drop pods with turrets and supplies. But, most of my efforts will be focused on stopping the bugs in the void. Once they manage to land, the Tyranids will devour any biomass and reproduce rapidly, growing in numbers a hundred times. I explained in a level voice, waiting for someone to crack. Reality was harsh in this 40k universe, and it will get much worse. General Van glanced at the hologram, showing the nice Macarius tanks in all their glory. More tanks are great, my lord. But I already have 300 tanks in my regiments, and even double that, it won't be enough. Surely there will be more reinforcements? Well, a normal Cadian armor regiment had 30 Lehman Rust tanks and 5 Hydras. Good enough for minor orc raids and defending a city, but obviously not enough for a big campaign. The armor units were kept in reduced numbers by intent to prevent them getting too strong in case they went traitor, as they often did. I nodded at her question. There are 700 more Sentinels and a few hundred Toros and other light vehicles like the Centaurs. However, most of your job will be to simply destroy the Bio-Titans of the Tyranids and prevent our static positions from being overrun or outflanked. There will be ships in low orbit to provide fire support and some space fighters, plus ground attack craft from the Lamenter Auxiliaries. I cannot speak for other Astartes chapters, but I expect a few companies might arrive, just like these Iron Hands and White Scars did. There are some Blood Angels with me, and even some Silent Sisters, but they'll mostly target the psychic leaders of the Tyranids, with deep strikes aimed to disrupt their synaptic links. And if the Catacan Infantry Regiments accidentally received some containers with artillery shells normally used by the Basilisks, well, they did like setting traps and mines. After that, the long task of preparing a logistic chain and supply method began, with the Navy cruisers obliged to load up the extra vehicles and munitions and the tech priests and their servitors, while most vehicles and turrets were being hastily covered with blackstone armor, mostly provided freely from my own reserves that just appeared in empty fighter hangars on the carrier or my barge. In this month, I did manage to strike a friendly relation with Regina, firstly over a working dinner, then a visit to my quarters to show her my trophies and exchange war stories over a few bottles of wine. I bet Regina didn't expect my glands to still work, but she wasn't disappointed at all. Sadly, she had to return on her transport to oversee her troops, but her aide Janet stayed as a liaison with a squad of her own Valhallen Guards women to feel safe. Well, it was very safe in my bed, that was certain. With good relations thus established, I decided to conscript the entire Valhallen Regiment as Lamenters Auxiliaries, both because we lacked a dedicated artillery group, and for the other more obvious advantages of an all-female unit under me. A month later, we arrived at Paramunda and began setting up orbital defenses and ground defenses. However, only two regiments were needed here, one infantry and one artillery. The terrain was broken up into high plateaus, easily defendable. I picked the most green and covered with vegetation plateau, where the city of Canandoel was located. Then I let the catacans prepare the ground with surprises, including a squad of special ops catacans selected and slightly trained by Sly Marbo. The 276th Valhallen Regiment was moved on board my ship, the Tranquility, the battleship with warp-less engines. These brave platinum-haired women wouldn't see much combat on my ship, and they could raise their children in relative safety now. From here, the bulk of the fleet moved outward, reaching Isis underscore V and preparing stronger defenses here, even landing five regiments, including 12th Artillery with Commissar Kane overseeing the defenses. A few smaller fleet departed for Coelia and Karak Prime to secure the hive cities there, but mostly to pin the Tyranids in place if they arrived. An armor regiment, two infantry and three artillery each, plus a cruiser with a Nova cannon. Then we moved onwards, with the roving fleet, 
reaching the Kilter Sector and burning down a dozen worlds already overrun by Tyranids. Exterminatus torpedoes were very useful for that. A hundred small-scale void battles ensured we saved most of the sector, with liberal use of teleporting Nova Mines, Plasma Torpedoes, and even a Vortex Torpedo on top of a Hive Queen. It wasn't really difficult when controlling spatial powers with impunity. As for the planets already under attack, it was triage. We couldn't defend everything, but hive cities, Mechanicus forges and research stations, important industrial centers, those we could. And every time some priest demanded we defended some empty planet with religious significance, he vanished and wasn't heard again. I did not care at all for shrine worlds, or cardinal worlds, or any other type of imperial cult bullshit. Population and industry would allow the Imperium of Man to survive and fight back, while Sanctuary Worlds or Cemetery Underscore Worlds were amazingly stupid in my opinion. Given this was 40k, dead people should be burned as soon as possible, and their ashes used to grow plants, to feed the living. Having ossuaries and crypts filled with skeletons would only tempt warp entities or biomass-seeking monsters. Also, precious relics or libraries should be kept on fortress worlds, because they also tempted cults and traitors or demons. Better have guns close to kill them. Wherever possible, I organized such maneuvers, sending the priests away to escort those relics to a fortress world, presumably to boost morale and piousness of the defenders, beside keeping them safe. Gilliman has also began setting up sentinel worlds, somewhat akin to a factory, fortress, and shipyard world, with a reality cage being constructed deep underground. Only a couple of them, probably testing the effects on nearby warp storms like Medusa underscore V. That world was doomed anyway, so might as well try to save it, even if the means were somewhat unorthodox. And then someone closed the rapidity warp rift, and the installation stayed. And then the astropaths received a message from an agri-world called Jalov, sent by a frantic Mechanicus tech priest that was studying an STC fragment, but was interrupted by a Tyranid splinter fleet. I rushed my warp-less fleet ahead, heedless of the encroaching silence, and began setting up hasty orbital defenses and blowing up wave after wave of Tyranid bioships and landing spores. But the Tyranids were hungry, and this was an agri-world, teeming with biomass. Soon enough, they began ignoring my corvettes and the battleship, diving heedlessly towards the appetizing food source. A single Lamenter drop cruiser managed to make orbit in time and began dropping turret pods and providing orbital support while local regiments retreated towards the spaceport. The Death Watch Company covered their retreat with relentless determination, despite being decimated for their actions. Well, the Astartes were the defenders of humanity, clad in mighty armor and armed with the most powerful guns. Still, they shouldn't be wasted. So I began to cheat, kidnapping bio-titans from their spore pods, placing nova mines in the midst of landed hordes of tyranids, while the blood angels began landing in the besieged perimeter beside my own auxiliary PDF regiments, including Lord Whitelance and his knight. And then we kept shooting and shooting, Corvettes unleashing thousands of torpedoes and missiles, firing their plasma cannons and lances, while the Tranquility did the same, but rarely and quite strongly. Blowing up a dozen bioships per salvo was very fulfilling, though. When the other naval forces managed to break through the Tyranid silence on the real space plasma engines, they found half the planet in flames and a mountain of Tyranid corpses around the spaceport. It only took a single week, and I already had to resupply my corvettes from my pocket a few times. And I even lost a couple of corvettes, although not the crew. Corvettes may be cheap and easy to replenish, but good crew was not, and especially not my family. Soon enough, the perimeter was cleared and corpses burned, and then the armor regiments began attacking, with mobile infantry engaging stragglers and lurking organisms hidden in swamps or rivers and lakes. Three squads of special ops and the Blood Angels took over the task of locating and destroying the lictors and lurkers, while space fighters and low-orbit frigates cleaned the skies. Even Captain Khan went down to help, enjoying hunting tyranids for sport. With his sword. It seemed madness to me, but perhaps the best of humanity were that good. I still couldn't touch even Rafin and Spars, not to mention Ludvias or the good Master of Blades. 
Mind if we join the fun, Master Lancefire, a familiar voice asked from the Vox channel. Hey, I was so focused on the surface I ignored the orbit for a bit. Brother Cassiel, I see you brought an entire company with you. I exclaimed in surprise, while checking the contents of that barge. My own sons in the Blood Angels chapter, all clad in Terminator armor and armed to the teeth. And lead by Captain Afail, like he promised. You don't need my permission, brother. I'm not even a real Astartes. I quipped back in a joking voice. Forgive him, brother, for his idiocy is without bounds. Are you going to sit on that bridge or fight beside your sons, Lord P.E.F.? Captain Afail intervened in a sterner voice. I sighed inward, feeling the pain of Commissar Kane for myself now. Let's take that tundra region above the last Cadian regiment. I'll bring my good armor suit for the occasion. Reason, my knight, was feeling a bit lonely, even with Felicia oiling his joints every day. And I could practice those fancy blade moves in real combat. Damn it, I was becoming an idiot like everyone else in this crazy universe. Moloch CH-119 I first directed a drop cruiser to secure a landing zone, while a squadron of Fury interceptors took station above the tundra. Damn winged bugs could ruin your day if you were not careful. Then I gathered my bodyguards and a hundred armed sentinels and a few dropships and descended onto the surface of Jalov with a few wings of gunships as a vanguard. Passing through thick smoke from burning fields and houses, we began our landing approach just a few minutes after the drop pods, descending in a pandemonium of teeth and claws, while the tarantula turrets were butchering millions of tyranids gorging on lichens and grass and even soil. Well, I guess there would be roots and worms and bacteria of every kind inside the soil. As soon as the ramp lowered and we started emerging from the dropships, the tyranids suddenly perked up and began rushing towards us. Reason's autosenses targeted a smaller organism for some reason, but I wasn't going to argue with my machine spirit. Surely the Mechanicus had steadied this enemy and matched priority targeting accordingly. The volcano lance flared with impossible brightness, evaporating that target and a hundred other creatures beside and behind it. And then the secondaries began firing automatically, and I pushed towards the largest swarm and began slicing with the power glaive. This time it worked. Every single strike butchered dozens of tyranids, while the flare shield blocked most of the incoming spits and spines and whatever other projectile weapons. Each time the lance was recharged, the knight would target yet another innocuous creature, and then urged me forward to capitalize on the stunned tyranids disoriented from losing their synaptic leader. Then I slashed, pivoted and slashed again, every strike eerily accurate and deadly. I felt like a swordmaster, dancing on the battlefield, not a mere pretender with out-of-context knowledge. Hours later, I remembered I wasn't alone on this tundra, and urged reason to return and check on my comrades. My sons were simply walking slowly, in a kilometer-wide line, and exterminating whatever escaped from my dash across the tundra, followed by the sentinels watching over them from twice the height and shooting lost cannons as distant targets, or burning corpses with their flammers. Thank you for leaving something for us to do, Lord Lancefire. I heard Brother Cassiel joke and saw him wave at my knight as I approached. Hey guys. Knights are very fun. I explained without saying anything. Hey dad. You were amazing. Do you think I could get a knight suit like yours? I heard Jonas plead on a different Vox channel. Soon, all my kids were begging for a knight suit and awesome weapons. Perhaps a couple, one day. They won't really work for boarding actions or sneaky missions. I answered after a few seconds. Reason's machine spirit disagreed and promised we could sneak about if we really tried. I highly doubted that. The lance strikes were visible from orbit. Afterwards, we proceeded at a slow power walk and simply cleaned out every enemy we could find until we crossed the entire tundra and reached the Cadian Armor Regiment. General Venn was waiting on top of a Macarius tank and wasn't so sour anymore. You even have a knight, Lord Lancefire? She asked to make sure. Why? It was a gift. And it does a good job in the field. I explained in a childish voice. 
and it has a very long lance too, the general quipped and patted the volcano lance of her Macarius tank. All right, guys. We rest here for a while, and then trek the planet clockwise. If we move fast enough, we'll be done in a single day. I joked and opened the knight's cockpit to get some air. It was freezing, because tundra, and smelled of burned meat. I bet my tanks will move faster, the old woman replied as her Cadian soldiers cheered. It felt like a picnic, at the edge of the galaxy. Soon enough, I rushed inside the command tank to get some food and a cup of CAF, and stood to hear the general complain about her lord commander of spite and how bad it was. Well, I couldn't steal an armor regiment, as those were fewer and more valued by the Imperium. But an experienced general was good too. If you want, I can conscript you and some of your staff to my auxiliaries. We have a 20 Doomhammers and 500 Hydras per regiment, and will soon receive 100 Macarius. I began my argument, a bit timidly. Yes. Dear Emperor, I thought I would have to fuck you to escape from that idiot, Lord Lancefire, the grisly woman proclaimed in a breathless rush. I nodded cautiously. We have to get you back to youth, but that's not a real problem. Sister Letitia over there is over 70, and looks young and pretty now. And I'm even older than you, I guess. The general glanced at my face in disbelief. I'll be 200 next year, the old soldier explained in a serious voice. Well, she did have a wealth of experience then, and took some rejuvenate treatment. Still not a problem, dear lady. That blood angel, Brother Cassiel, is over 10,000 years old, and he used to rub elbows with Sanguinius. Good genes help. I said with a smirk, and laid back on the leather seat, which smelled new. Well, this tank was brand new. Well, I guess it's possible. Primarch Khan is same age and looks rather fit too. I heard he was scouting Kamarak for that great raid. And he didn't stay on ice like Dilliman, she mused and sipped some CAF in a thoughtful voice. She wasn't exactly wrong, but I wouldn't shatter her illusions. Primarchs are rather special though. So, you'd like to become a Lamenta troop commander? We do fight a lot though. Sometimes at bad odds. I explained in a gentle voice. War is my profession, my lord. But Astartes auxiliaries have different regulations than the Imperial Guard. Not sure what they are. General Venn said in an unasked question. That depends on each chapter, their premarch and the legacy they carry. Psychers and sorcerers for Magnus, swordsmen and harassing attacks for Khan, dotting every line and sheer brutality for ultramarines. I personally prefer air power as the main weapon for my chapter auxiliary. Static positions for my infantry and enveloping maneuvers for armor. The Battle Brothers sent in for boarding ships or boss killing and other precision strikes. Not that I have any lamenters to deploy yet. I said a sadder voice. I heard about the Badab War. Must have been horrible, battling traitor space marines, she said in a compassionate voice. Yes and no. Those lamenters were flawed, like many successors of Sanguinius. Going mad with rage and bloodthirst, howling and biting their enemies and allies alike. They call these flaws the Black Rage and the Red Thirst. Also, quite unstoppable until they fell dead. Those battle barges were filled with dismembered corpses, some of them still gripping flesh in their teeth, even in death. I exposed in a grieving voice. They were still my brothers, dead as they were now. Ludvias coughed discreetly at the door, perhaps to admonish me. But his chapter had a death company too, mad and sent to one last battle, not expected to survive. But it won't happen anymore, right? Surely you can fix the problem, the old general asked, maybe too hopeful. I am working on that, dear general. It's hard work, but I won't shy away from duty. Well, I guess you'll find out when we return to our base in the fringe. I replied in a teasing tone, then walked past her to return to my knight. These tyranids won't die by themselves, and I could use some target practice. Took an entire month to clean the planet of insectal invaders from outside the galaxy, because they were like cockroaches, spawning someplace else just when we thought they were gone. 
Back at the main starport, Muggo Stanham Veer was loading his STC fragments into a gun cutter that would lift them into orbit, but he possibly misplaced the memory unit with his research. Certainly, with all those fragments in his possession, he should be able to research everything again, and even faster. I detached a dozen corvettes to escort his explorer Arc Mechanicus to the warp limit and bid him farewell. The ingrate tech priest did not ever bother to reply. What can you do? Except disseminate that research to Twenty Forge worlds and steal away his glory. Beside that, soon after, we had to rush and help out at Karak Prime after conscripting some troops other local regiments to replenish manpower losses. This was a much larger tendril, but we also had more regiments and ships available, as more and more local chapters and navy warships gathered to repel the threat. I wasn't able to walk on the surface in my huge night suit, being too busy commanding the fleet and holding millions of bioships at bay. The hive cities were ordered to mobilize en masse, and I sent most tech priests and servitors to establish extra layers of fixed defenses, from duracrete walls and bunkers to armored gates protected with drum flails, and even gigantic flammers pumping arcs of burning Prometheum kilometers away. We also scoured the underhives for gangers and criminals, and had them gassed with soporifics, then imprinted with crude loyalty mnemonics and sent out to fight for the emperor. These conscripts were not well armed, but that wasn't the real purpose. Metal shields and spears, or even cheap autoguns and stubbers didn't quite work against the Tyranids, but they did hold them in place, enough for artillery and aviation to bombard the packed masses of Tyranids, while the escorts lanced the more distant hordes from orbit. And with the Hive cities slightly less inhabited and violent, they could focus more efforts on external defense. They had no other choice but fight or die. Entire PDF regiments were raised in a single week, given minimal training and sent atop of walls or manning the bunkers, only to return battered and needing a complete rebuild by the next week. Governors needed to be encouraged or publicly executed, weapon caches made available freely or under protest, adeptus arbites conscripted as commissars to maintain discipline. In the end, we didn't lose a single city, although casualties exceeded 20% of the entire population. Over two billion people, giving their lives for the emperor. The surface of the planet was left even more barren and polluted, but at least the hive cities were set in order and even became more productive and profitable. Turns out having a few thousand tick priests repairing old reactors and factories, as well as reducing crime and population pressure, was quite beneficial. For my efforts, I loaded five million young women working in various factories and a few thousand scribes aboard a fleet of troop transports and had them sent to the French, mostly on the hundred jungle and forest worlds that needed population growth and industrial production. They will have fresh air and natural food there, plus plenty of living space, not ten in a single room. Sure, the catacans will need to protect them, but they wouldn't mind being gifted ten wives each. Population will grow fast after this, but those kids will be locals and raised with slightly different rules. Meanwhile, the star system was slowly being cleaned of dead husks of bioships and drifting wing bugs, only this time we cut off some of the larger bioships' teeth and claws, because those bones were strong enough to bite into starship armor. I was also out of munitions already, after a single year of constant fighting a small Tyranid hive fleet. So, I left Captain Afail in command of the Moloch Crusade to find and finish off the remaining Tyranid splinters and I sailed for home. Of course, my dear Inquisitor Vale had to stay and oversee the project for the sake of her career and I took her baby home with me. We named him Aeneas, like the mythical hero. He now sleeps on top of Canis, beside a young puppy sired by my wolf. Woo, my wolf asks as he saw me leave the nursery. Yes, Canis. Going back to make more puppies. I explained patiently as Canis licked both of his young ones. The wolf nodded wisely, then glanced at my left glove. Perhaps later, you smart friend. I did need to sort out those sisters of battle, one way or the other. Dreadnought CH-120 my new drop cruisers were left behind in the galactic north because being able to intervene rapidly with drop pods would be extremely helpful and will save countless lives. 
Once the Moloch Crusade would be declared finished, the light cruisers commanded by my daughters will return home, after visiting a forge world each, to spread out more STC data slates and picked and censors logs of the turret drop results. The Mechanicus Tech Priests were not stupid and will realize rapidly the advantages of this new doctrine. I didn't have much hope with the Imperial Navy or the Astra Militarum, as I rarely saw any of my templates deployed in the field. Some night vision sensors, recon units with cheap weasels, and sometimes the new manticores and hydras. In such small quantities, they wouldn't impact much, except perhaps keep the regiment commanders a bit safer. However, Commissar Kane did not disappoint, and he made himself a big hero again by discovering a large genistealer cult on Isis V, then leading the troops into a grinding civil war which resulted in a costly victory. I bet Kane is glad for his relic sword now, as well as his new power armor and shield. Perhaps even more happy with his tough but loyal Catacan all-female bodyguards. And funny enough, his former aide Jürgen was totally admired by the Catacan women I assigned to him for being a real man, smelly and rough. I began to doubt the wisdom of trying to breed origin females, as those would surely have even stronger taste in men. I wouldn't give up until I tried a few times, just for variety's sake. In the meantime, I did have plenty of Norse women to pick and choose, or let Regina pick and choose for me. The new armor specialist, Relevan, was even a greater treasure, especially after testing my special relic sword on a dozen captured orcs and regaining a slightly more youthful appearance. My lord, is this type of weapon common among Astartes? Rayla asked while examining herself in the mirror, with a confused but amazed face. She even got naked just to see everything was in the right place. And Rayla had great forms, even if I saw little from my chair. Not common at all, General. They are called ancient relics for reason. I explained patiently. I see, so it is a great honor to even be allowed to use it once. And I suppose, you return my body to youth, so you can fuck me, like you do with all those Valhallen women? Rayla guessed at random, and emerged from the shower to parade her young body in front of me and Canis. Damn cocktease. Well, I wouldn't say no if she offered, but she did not, so that was it. Instead, I smiled thinly and shrugged. I need your mind and experience, my dear general. As for making babies, that is a more complicated and involved procedure. Even if we both wanted to, my nurses and apothecaries and the biologist tech priests have to conduct a whole battery of tests and scans. I told you how dangerous Astarte's gene seed is. My new general sighed as if I missed the point. Just get naked and lie on the bed, P.E.F. Lancefire. I need to test my new body, and there's nobody else here I can trust. I blinked in confusion, while Canis just sighed and turned on the other side, probably amazed at my idiocy. Rafin just grinned and held his thumb up for luck. All right then. I could be lucky sometimes. So I got out of my armor and laid in bed, and allowed Rayla to test her young body in every manner she could think of. Guess I now have a general concubine to oversee the other guard's women. And perhaps a wife, should the others agree to this. When our small warpless fleet arrived at Sotha, we found it under attack again, by more orcs. I wasn't surprised and just led the battleship forward to defend the Ajata fortress, while the carriers began launching the corvettes and the staff fighters. In void combat the orcs were somewhat easy to defeat, even using conventional methods, but these orcs had figured out a way to weaponize Teleporta and launched Gretchens and Orc Boys as borders and even as destructive ordnance. Since a Gretchen materializing inside an energy conduit or a targeting cogitator did damage just by breaking down the expensive machinery. Of course, they have not considered teleporting bombs and warheads, nor being teleported themselves into my tesseract. Soon enough, three orc terror ships and 22 cruisers vanished in flares on Nova mines, although the mines still targeted flocks of orc space fighters and boarding boats. And imagine my surprise to find a working fragment of an STC on the largest orc cruiser, something to do with teleportarium technology. The orcs were surely crazy and lucky enough to repurpose that ancient machine into something they could use for a WAF. Possibly a mass transit system for a spaceport during the dark age of technology. 
I already was planning how to weaponize this discovery for my own use, for example for quick torpedo reloads and teleporting turrets on the ground, or even inside enemy ships. Just place teleport beacons on the weapons, and they could be even retrieved afterwards, without using time and fuel for landers and dropships. Sadly, the research and testing for this project would take a few decades, even for a larger forge world. Anyway, my rose wasn't back on Sotha yet, but her own blonde emphasized lady was, with a whole store of Tau databases and weapon research slates. I will need three copies of that data, my dear. I asked in a polite voice. But I didn't need to remain polite if Calixa didn't cooperate. The blonde assassin measured me with obvious uncertainty. The Inquisitor asked that everything that I recovered to be sealed. Sorry, Lord Lancefire. I sighed inward, then stepped closer nearly touching her with my armored chest plate. We are on the same team, Calixa. Or do I need to take out my rosette? I asked softly and tapped the knoll box suggestively. Air. Don't do that, my lord. Clavis Engrams will play havoc with my neural modules and I'll be rather incapacitated for a week. Why do you need three copies? The Infocyte grumbled as she took our three data stacks and began downloading the data from her encrypted MIU. My own Infocyte agent needs a copy, Forge Retribution needs one, and the third, well... The third will go way over your pay grade. The big powers will want to take a look, and that might be my ticket for a high lord seat. You know, the one being arranged for the rogue traders? I whispered in a secretive voice. I didn't know, my lord. So, are we friends now? The cute assassin asked in a failed attempt at seduction. Already seeing herself riding on the parade, on holy terror. Then again, a cute emphasite? I could use another, in every way. Backups were only natural, in case something went wrong. I snapped my fingers to produce an obsidian augury security tag. This obsidian plate will grant you extra access, should you be in dire need. I explained in a soft whisper, right into her ear. Calixa hugged my arm and examined the credit card wafer with a hundred tiny auspex sensors, finding nothing to indicate advanced technology except perhaps the blackstone rim, which kept the obsidian from cracking or flaking. But I wasn't an infocyte to track data, or a psyker to track psychic imprints. Simply the memory of this object would allow me to locate it anywhere in range of the pharos, or in range of the sounding board if needed. I expect the blackstone is meant to prevent psychers from detecting this ID card? Or is it something else? She mused softly, voice trembling a bit with excitement. We'll discuss the rest in private. I explained and made her vanish in my labyrinth. Best way to extract someone from an Inquisition's fortress. I wasn't like I would carry a woman on my back if she fit in my pocket. But first, I had to check on Mr. Trazen and the new warp less drive. I did pay for it in advance, after all. And of course, to recover the few lamenters still part of the Death Watch, which had just arrived at the fortress during the time I was away. Amadeus Chirofields, now known as Chirin, was a space underscore marine underscore dreadnought, with millennia of experience, while veteran brother Semnite was the only combat-capable lamenter remaining to my chapter. I didn't count the support staff as battle brothers, even if they could technically fight. I needed their knowledge and experience, not an extra gun. Experience regarding galactic lore, Xeno's races, plagues and chaos demons, or tactics. The Lamenters have traveled all over the galaxy, and knew lots and lots of secrets, hidden routes and meeting places, webway portals, and forgotten ship graveyards. They didn't even know how valuable their knowledge was, and I wouldn't tell them. I just downloaded all the ship logs, and had the Auxilia crew or the senior Lamenters retell each and every encounter, when and where a certain sighting has occurred, who was present, what else was in the system, and so on. Sadly, most of the old astropaths had died, as they were never meant to last long. But we had the navigators, which was almost as good. Sure, they saw and remembered events in a haze of temporal currents and prophetic dreams, but they would know the roots back. It was their job after all. You don't look and feel like a lamenter, Master Lancefire. Brother Semni told me straight to my face. My angelic face. 
I just sighed and snapped my fingers, storing him inside the Tesseract as well. Hopefully he'll get better, once he was on the Star Fort and among other, real lamenters. Venerable Brother Chirin did not grumble or care I wasn't a proper lamenter, instead being glad of having found his way back to the beloved chapter. We must be in a sorry state, if one such as yourself is now chapter master. I feared nobody was left alive after that disastrous Badab war, the half-dead lamenter lamented in a pitiful tone, and you could sense his sadness pouring out of the armored shell. Canis smelled the towering coffin on legs and mewled back at me in confusion. Yes, Canis. Chirin is one of us, so don't bite him. I quipped in a cheerful voice and patted the robot on the side. Come with me, Chirin, we're teleporting down. I explained in my next breath and started walking towards the teleportarium. Two squads of scythes and executioners dressed in black armor stood guard at the entrance and one of them stepped forward to block my way. Nobody may access the Pharos, not even you, Master Lancefire, the Death Watch proclaimed grimly and raised his combi bolter towards me. Oh well, I guess we'll have more temporal anomalies today. As the squads vanished in my labyrinth, I took out the cock-shaped rosette and began unlocking the teleport safeties. That is a good trick, Master Lancefire. And even the rosette is genuine. Chirin praised me in a slightly surprised tone. I just nodded and patted Canis, making him vanish too. Teleporting was bad for his stomach after all. In a violet flash of warp and madness, we emerged inside the Pharos to find it cleaned up completely. No more Astartes oaths and canticles, no more battle flags and purity seals. Just black walls and an intact tan, slightly crucified on the wall with chains of living stone. This must have been Amberly's work, trying to appease the alien god somehow. P.E.F. Lancefire You have saved me again, the tan shard spoke in a booming voice. Uh, this was unexpected. The tan seemed glad to see me. Hello again, mighty Zaryulash. What do you, ah? Uh, the teleporting orcs. I see. I realized after a second. Those Cretan greenskins would have ruined plenty of things with a tan as a slave. Probably half the galaxy or something. The orcs knew about me, P.E.F. Lancefire. And they also had the means to reach me down here. Not an accident. The tan concluded as a warning. Some damn Eldar farcer, most likely. When in doubt, blame the Eldar, and you won't be far from the truth. I turned towards the dreadnought and pointed towards the god shard. This person is Zaryulash, a shard of the potentate. Xeno species tan, destructive abolites about the same with a segmentum battle fleet. Also immortal and extremely learned, explained while returning the sounding board to its dais and releasing the protective stasis field. Tan, I know of them. Deceitful, liars, and even aiding the Necrons in combat. The Death Watch lost many teams to his kind. Chirin rumbled from within his coffin. Zaryulash wanted to say something, before glancing down in sadness. Mostly true, Chirin. The Necrons broke them, and enslaved them as weapons. But there are a few still free, and causing mayhem for their own pleasure. What's that Tanis name, mighty Zaryulash? The Deceiver? I asked as a data stick appeared in my hand. A dataps of Tau technology, which should aid Trazen in his task. Mephitran. Yes, that is the Deceiver you ask about, P.E.F. Lancefire. There are at least six of his shards still free, traveling the galaxy and causing mayhem and strife. It shames me to be of same race as that creature, the ancient tan divulged in obvious sorrow. Well then. A new trade deal sounded wonderful. Hope CH-121. While doing all this, the Pharos opened in my mind to show me the true state of the Segmentum, and even beyond that in the eastern fringe. Hive Fleet Scarabus was approaching human worlds after devouring a couple Xenos and Orc planets. I could cut them off from those supplies of biomass with a dozen exterminators torpedoes, and the same for the two smaller Tyranid fleets approaching my own domain. The biocruisers will need to be met in the void and destroyed in detail before they could land. 
Otherwise, Rose was busy inside a Death Watch fortress called Eye of Damocles, coordinating a large-scale intelligence operation against the Tau, plus naturally assassinations of ethereal leaders and torturing captured prisoners. Janice was working hard beside her, using her psyker powers with lots of skill. Father, is this you? She mused softly, while a hundred scalpels were dancing around in midair and flaying some ethereal guy, alive. Yes, sweetie. So you're an Inquisitor's acolyte now? I asked in faint amusement. Have to. Damn greater good blueberries are very resistant to normal Inquisition practices. So I help mommy sometimes. I also navigate that black Inquisition battlecruiser docked outside. Janice explained while poking the damn brainwashing towel and reading his mind while his attention was diverted by the possibly debilitating pain of losing bits of skin. Well, that was a good career choice, at least. Very few, if any people, would dare question a navigator working for the Inquisition's own black ships. Any boy you like? I continued in a teasing tone, more amused. Dad. I'm working here. My daughter protested in my mind, so left her get on with her helping. She will probably need to find a nice navigator boy without too many mutations, by accident or by kidnapping. So I turned to my dear Rose, who was overseeing a large command center filled with a company of black armored Astartes, plus hundreds of auto savants, sages, and lex mechanics. Streams of data engrams and machine liturgies covered the hall fields, some of them compiling a stack archive on the human worlds in the far site enclave. A pic capture of the talisman of Arthas Moloch while worn by Primarch Gilliman was posted on the main screen, with sigils and runes shifting constantly. Well, they would want to know how the Primarch has recovered from his warp poison injury. And while the hexagrammatic talisman was well disguised as an imperial relic, the Inquisition had real experts too. And they were suspicious. The vectors for a dozen small orc wafts were shifting slowly on other side screens, while the top three screens were keeping watch over three Tyranids' tendril fleets, all heading towards the Necron world of Sarlacc. Well, they had things covered quite well, from what I saw. No real-time data, of course, but then humanity did not have another Pharos, unless that Shariax artifact on Eclutus was something of the same nature. Not that the Death Spectres chapter were sharing what they knew with anyone else, anyway. Keeping watch in secret, and probably intercepting any moves from those mysterious Xenos in the Pale Stars. And also killing their brothers a few times, as a graduation ceremony, for some obscure reason. Hey Rose. I see you noticed my gift to our beloved Primarch. Keeps the poison at bay, right? I asked in a level tone. My strange lover is back. I expect you have already met with Calixa, the Inquisitor asked in my mind, without showing any outward sign of emotion. Perhaps she was upset to learn it was me who woke up Gilliman? Met the cute Infocyte, yes. Should I do more with her? I wondered in a teasing voice. I would anyway, but better to have permission. You do what you want, horny lover. Just, remember Calixa is not yours nor mine. Grand Master Fadix holds her leash, including her kill switch. So I heard about the Moloch Crusade. Doesn't seem so bad it at first appeared, less than fifty worlds were lost. And nothing important anyway, my rose commented in a wry tone. Those devoured worlds still held billions of people, but indeed, I saved the hive worlds and the forges, making the losses seem irrelevant in the grand scheme. Hive fleet Scarabus will hit Caronis in a few years. I'll burn the landed elements and vortex the Norn Queen. Nothing else I can do from Sotha. Anyway, I'm nearly ready compiling the cruiser size warp less engines, so I'll need something to trade for another batch of old ships to appear all over with partial STC templates. We might see a strong opposition from the navigators, this time. I said in slight worry. The crazy navigators were willing and able to sabotage the Dark Under Scorglass device, almost dooming the Imperium of Man back in the days of the Horus Heresy. They would dare again, no doubt. The navigator houses already make overtures to proclaim the warp-less engines as heretic inventions and have them all destroyed. 
Of course, both Primarchs disagree violently, and a couple of Padanova family heads were removed already. Master Fadix doesn't tolerate dissenters, the Inquisitor explained in a somber tone. Well, the internal conflicts in the Imperium have begun then, and they'll only get worse. However, that was why I gave both Primarchs null rods. Even Padanova level navigators won't be able to scry them now. Nor would Chaos Sorcerers and Psyker Inquisitors, nor even Eldar Farcers or Avatars. They'll have to tread carefully, not knowing where or when a Primarch might appear and ruin someone's day, or remove a few heads. I changed focus on the trays in the infinite, finding him fiddling with Jokero weapons and artifacts, and even a dozen of live Jokero orangutans kept in a greenfield cage. New toys, Lord Trazen? I asked in faint amusement. Ah, the puppy stranger. Your no bone staff is ready, but I still need a blood flaw genome if you want it to work for a psyker. As for those titans, I changed my mind. Not giving them back. You can take the captured knights, and that's it, the crazy Necron overlord proclaimed in an irate voice. I sighed inward. Even Necrons kept the amazing titans from my grasp, for now. But thirty-four knights would be useful too. I even had pilots for them, Justine's and Lord Whiteland's children. Only a couple were blanks, but I'll use what I had. As for Titans, I had another plan. Show me the cruiser engine and reactor first. We'll discuss the Titans later, Lord Trazen. I demanded more sternly and grabbed the data slate in midair. A quick check showed me exactly what I wanted. And then there were the other human technologies recovered and upgraded by Trazen. There was even an upgraded lance battery in there, with better fire rate and range, and an even longer range Nova cannon. A host of other schematics, from hell guns to vortex missiles and stasis underscore bombs and grenades, neutron and graviton guns, conversion beamers and volkite weapons of a dozen sizes. And then, there were some kind of walking turrets, slightly taller than a modern dreadnought, and a bit rounded. Like my armed sentinels, but way more advanced. Checking the schematic rapidly, I discovered they were in fact also dreadnoughts, meant to preserve wounded Astartes and keep them fighting. This Deridio underscore pattern underscore dreadnought would make an excellent platform for mobile tarantula turrets. Of course, nothing as complicated as the original design, but I was getting good at simplifying machines. Another walker template was a Leviathan underscore dreadnought armed with a gigantic cyclonic underscore melta underscore lance and a grav underscore flux underscore bombard. These were very large machines, the size of the largest imperial knights and even more powerful. I shall see to it that Blankistartes got to pilot these Leviathans and stand strong in the face of greater demons or orc bosses of same size. Plus the arms could be made to end in power fists, and thus able to hold gigantic melee weapons like Reason had his power glaive. Then tanks and troop transports in a hundred configurations, and lastly a simple, rugged, and better lost gun for the infantry. Pretty much a hotshot gun, but firing fast and without overheating. I wasn't able to create something this simple and potent even after decades of constant attempts, and yet this Necron took only a few years to overhaul hundreds of Mechanicus designs and make them all better. Damn cheater. I trust my efforts are appreciated, stranger. I had to coerce a billion of my slaves to work on the pathetic weapons of humanity and repair what flaws they could. Luckily, I had a thousand tech priests to extract memories from. They seem a bit drained now but I can give them back if you wish. Trazen explained in a proud tone. He didn't even work personally for this? Well, slave and serf labor was the norm in the galaxy, from the Imperium to the Orcs and the myriad of slavers and enslavers. It's decent work, I admit. Here, a database of Tau technology now. Perhaps we can obtain even smaller ship engines and better force fields. I replied while keeping calm and depositing the valuable data stack on his work coffin. Then I retrieved a lock of hair from Amberly's son Aeneas and sent it over as well. Gene samples for the bloodline flaw in the staff. Perhaps those Jokeros can craft more null rods? Trazen waved a hand at the air and produced a small wand as proof. The null wands are even better than those contraptions of the Mechanicus. 
wider range, and no disruptions from warp storms. They even upgraded my own empathic staff. I sighed in defeat. Of course, the orange orangutans were idiot savants, and also made the fabled digital weapons prized anywhere in the galaxy by everyone. I took out another data slate with my own STC templates, most importantly those which didn't work yet, and sent it over as well. Another batch of less advanced machines, most of them created at Forge World Retribution, to be used to develop the fringe. They need to remain at Micron level of quality, because there are no better forges out there. That wasn't entirely true, but better appear weaker and harmless. Savages. How can they even entangle Quant? Never mind. These are simple designs indeed. Electric trains. Only these personal shields have a small value. Flawed and inefficient, but at least some of those silly tech priests tried. There might be a small hope for humans, after all, the Necron tech wizard uttered in slight disgust. And those conversion shields were my best work. Horrors CH-122 when I returned to my room, I remembered to unfreeze the Death Watch guys protecting the teleportarium on the Ajida Fortress, and even gave them several archaeo weapons from my personal inventory. Vortex grenades and inferno pistols might serve them well when sent on a kill team to hunt down a powerful orc boss or something. Meanwhile, Dreadnought Chirin remained in stasis till he was needed. No need to stress him too much after he saw me burn a Tyranid Hive fleet and kill a queen without lifting a finger. He would be my second in command, thus he had the need to know. Plus a null wand would cover other problems of a more chaotic nature. Same for Brother Semni, most likely. If they couldn't be blanks, they could at least have the same protection via artificial means. Then, I brought Calixa in the room while I entered my shower to refresh, at the same time with Canis. We got teleported, wait. I'm missing six hours on my data log. Your master is so tricky, right, Space Wolf, the blonde woman asked Canis in a curious voice. Grr woof, the Space Wolf replied in outrage and went to pour himself meat pellets and water. He was still growing and had to squeeze a little to fit through the door frame meant for Terminator armors. I was ambivalent on this. A bigger wolf would be stronger but he might reach Van Sy soon. And then he will eat even more. A minute later, the blonde woman joined me in the shower to help me wash my back. With her chest, but I didn't mind. I thought Astartes were more, transhuman, she sent with a data transmission while examining my body all over. But I'm not a real Astartes. All my organs are natural. I explained with a mind transmission, which would not be logged on her mind implant. The sounding board was very useful for tricks like this, and invisible inside the tesseract. I just had to wear one tesseract around my neck, like a relic talisman depicting a skull with angel wings. Made sense to have one tesseract always nearby, even when outside my armor with the magic glove. For example, when naked or inside the night. Natural organs, you say, my lord. I guess I shall test this claim, very profoundly, the Infocyte continued with a data entry, getting busy with testing my claim. Much later, she rested on my chest and sighed in content. All natural. I wasn't tired at all, so I called Janet and Rayla to my room and helped me relieve all my stress. Ludvias, see that Lady Calixa gets a room with a cogitator bank and a pair of tech priests to watch over her. Biologist and Cogitatress Clades. My bodyguard just nodded and opened the armored door to let Calixa walk out, with a simple bath robe covering her. Well, I wasn't so tight on uniform regulation, especially for women. Robes made for easy access and good thermal protection, and that was sufficient. A minute later, Janet arrived with Regina, while Rayla came hand in hand with Henna, as they were probably discussing complicated topics like raising children or blowing up Xenos from orbit. I checked inward to see if my energy stores would suffice, and my body promptly signaled that yes, for women will be just enough. General, you have the rank so you may go first, Regina joked as she leaned over to kiss me and measure my body with hungry eyes. We will soon start teaching you combined arms warfare, especially with air power and orbital drops. 
I explained in a gentle voice as Rayla dropped herself on top of me and began enjoying the benefits of a young body once again. Hopefully, Amberly will remember to requisition those Catacan regiments and bring them to Illavar once the Moloch Crusade was over. I planned to obtain as many of those jungle expert regiments as possible, and the Catacans had raised over a thousand of them, mainly infantry. And since infantry regiments had the largest numbers, that was excellent too. Armed and trained colonists for the French, while women will be provided by saving hive worlds and exacting a toll. All normal and natural in this galaxy. For the next generations, blank men from my blank town will start being sent as minor nobles in the colonies and do their best to spread their genes to the Catacan descendants. As for my daughters and granddaughters, well, I could marry them off into rogue trader families or something of that nature. They will still command their spaceships and spread blank genes among other houses, which will become important later. Alliances among nobles' houses were common enough, but my house will have a palace on Terra itself. I might have to beat off eager men with a stick. They already knifed each other among the catacans, but the catacans were not rich and important and well-connected like rogue traders were. That could wait, though, until Decima and Serena advised me on it. Perhaps even those sisters from Order's Famulus. I had a dozen of them among my concubines, without even asking them for it. They just somehow appeared in my bed, escorted by Helena and Catherine. Several hours later, Henna took the last spot with a calm and patient demeanor, eager for another child. I was so lucky with this cousin, as she was everything other women were not, at least not here. Loving, accepting, soft and warm, a dutiful wife and mother. However, while I did love her for it, those were not good survival traits, not in this hellish galaxy. Maybe in 10,000 years, if my efforts bore fruit. Tomorrow morning at 8.00 ship time. All of you report on the cadet deck for strategic courses. Henna, you befriend Calixa and see about medical tests. I commanded after we concluded the marital duty. Yes, sir. Rayla answered in a military tone and leaned over to steal a kiss before she ran off. Teenager hormones. She'll get over it. Regina mused to herself, glancing after Rayla as she departed the room. Regina did not receive the chrono treatment as she wasn't in need for a young body yet, nor was Janet. I caught her chin and kissed her abruptly. Go and rest, my dear. I have other work now. I growled in a harsher tone. She smiled and walked away swaying her hips, confident in her charms and position. I almost called her back for another round, but that was what Regina wanted, and we couldn't have that. See you tomorrow, my lord. Janet whispered in a shy voice and ran after her boss. You bet your perky ass we will see you tomorrow. And for the rest of your life. These three women will form my command staff in the future and follow me on campaigns. We will see a lot of each other and enjoy it too. But perhaps not Calixa, if she was not loyal to me, like Rose had warned me. A double agent if I ever saw one. Triple agent, considering the Inquisition too. I will have to handle her with caution then. At my order, Felicia arrived in a minute and sat in my lap while I powered up the cogitator to start working on the new machines. The blonde engine seer almost forgot to pump her hips while watching the trove of treasures on the screen. This is amazing, my lord. So many discoveries. Felicia exclaimed and squeezed me in excitement. There is even more, from what I could recover from the STC caches Prelia and Jolov and these teleporting orcs right here. Some templates even seem intact. But first, we work on the walking turrets. I want one multilaser and one lost cannon, powered by this small plasma reactor, and we'll cover them in blackstone. Maybe even a flare shield, if you're good enough. I teased her and squeezed her breasts in my palms. Keep pumping, my lord. These babies will burn through Zenos like the Omniscia's will. Felicia demanded loudly as her mind impulse unit delved deeper into the cogitator array, mixing and matching parts, balancing targeting codes and draining me of gene seed in a strange but pleasantly competent display of multitasking. I was very happy for her assistance and offered Felicia a sip from the expensive apple peach juice from Planet IAX. 
She sipped greedily through the straw and kept working hard. I knew she loved it, as her flesh was weak for pleasure. But I would provide all the pleasure she wanted in exchange for valuable service. My body, good food and drinks, gifts and treats, and even children, one day. My work was progressing a few times faster with her aid, and I got prime service too. What was not to like? By the next week, most of my goals for this trip were achieved, including the obliteration of the largest orc worlds in the Jaga Tyrant Empire, a dozen more Xeno worlds burned to the bedrock to eliminate potential new traits for the Tyranids, and a couple of red worlds that would surely be huge problems once they began migrating towards the Imperium. While this might seem a pity, burning livable planets, truth was there were at least ten times more planets out there than those known on the official Imperial maps, and a thousand times more not livable yet, but those could be made useful with effort and time. The galaxy was teeming with potential, but using warp drives and exploring blindly wasn't really working. The Tau had the right idea, simply expanding their volume geometrically, slowly exploring and conquering every star system in their reach. Or at least they were, until their alien allies started getting burned, and their own cities invaded by demons. What the Pharos showed me was entrenchment, orbital forts, and starbases being built to defend the inner lines, exploring ships recalled for defense, and orc wafts getting brutally massacred with ranged fire like in the war underscore of underscore Daka. Of course, this time the crude war spheres did not survive, with plasma torpedoes teleported inside their engine rooms and bridges, while hundreds of orcs found themselves teleported on board the ancient vessels and doing what they did best, grabbing anything shiny and shooting with it. And given that the shiny weapons they found were Necron and Dark Eldar in origin, they had a substantial advantage over the crude. Eventually, the Tau would win, as they too had cheat codes in technology and organization, plus a star-faring civilization still unbroken by the horrors of the 41st millennium. Not yet, not while they were useful. But later, the sky will open and rain fire on the heretics. Now there was a god, and it hated them. Arrangement CH-123 Perhaps it was me, but I felt the urge to just crush most inquisitors I found, even those with exemplar conduct. Sadly, they were actually needed, acting like white cells inside a sick organism. Sure, most of them used axes and hot irons to cut away and burn the infections, often without much care of burning innocence in their zeal. A few of those that I caught in the act, just ordering exterminators on planets on mere suspicion of hiding a cult, those I introduced to a croc grenade on their necks, leaving their acolytes to carry on a proper investigation. Their power armor will just need doused with a stream of water to wash off the brains and blood, and it would still be good as new. The cult's leaders were also blown up, leaving a trail of smoke and fire for a smart acolyte to raise above and become an inquisitor himself. As for Trazen, we arranged for another space hulk to be broken up into useful bits, this time the famous Olethros. The ships themselves would be emptied of cultists and genestealers, and their engine cogitators would be filled with the new STC patterns, including the cruiser-sized warp-less engine. A hundred Navy and Mechanicus ships were casually dropped in Forge World systems, from Antax to Griffin 4, or from Kanto 2 to Kania. As a gift for my rose, the Norn's Ghost Inquisitorial Battlecruiser arrived near her eye of Damocles Fortress, while the Dark Angel's battle barge called Caliban's will arrived in front of their wandering asteroid fortress, the Rock. Sure, the Void ships were beaten up and would need lots of work to be recommissioned, but that wasn't the point. The stores of STC templates were a wealth of knowledge that should push the strength of humanity a few thousands years ahead. Forge Retribution received another damaged Apocalypse-class battleship because I was playing favorites. And if there were 34 night suits on board that ship, plus enough Mechanicus weapons to arm a Skatariite Legion, it must have been Emperor's will. Maybe the Omnisia? It sure seemed that way. As for Forge World Lentral underscore Prime, which wasn't blown up by the Necron World Engine this time, they received an entire Arc Mechanicus just to spit in Fate's face. I made my own fate, damn hellish universe. Of course, I couldn't stop every tragedy and massacre either being in the wrong place or lacking the means. 
but I could prepare for example for Armageddon simply by having Lord Trazen drop the asteroid core of the Olethros on a collision course with planet Urk. A mere cosmic accident, as it happens so often to human worlds. Why not to orcs, right? While the range of the Pharos was small, and I couldn't burn the place with exterminatus, an asteroid crashing onto a planet would still burn most life away, just like the dinosaurs of Terra found out. The orc boss Yazdkul might survive this, because he also had gods on his side, but the crazy mushroom wouldn't have that orc army to start with anymore. The sad truth was that warp godlings were able to direct space hulks as transport ships and infection vectors for tyrannid genistealers or various orc and chaos forces, or create warp storms to abduct entire star systems or Astartes chapters. I was simply returning the favor, using advanced technology in place of mighty psyker powers. Sadly, the currency of this great game were lives, and often human lives. I had no doubt the Emperor was playing the game as well, possibly in a loose alliance with the Eldar gods. As for the Tau, it was increasingly clear that their leading caste, the Ethereals were a strange breed of navigators, using their empathic powers instead of psyker powers. Not being warp-based, or possibly only tangentially like the normal blanks were. But because they were rather close in galactic terms, I needed the Tau contained before they began the third, fourth, and fifth expansion spheres which would make them a match for the Ultima Segmentum. Their allies were instead free game, and Trazen was glad for a challenge. My warriors would enjoy the challenge indeed, if what you say it's true. Can't have someone else join our party and collect species and individuals with mind control. I shall direct a dozen of my lords to raid and harass those allies while using incremental weaponry like you wish. But I will need more of those dark Eldar void minds to conduct political maneuvers. Yes, that's the correct term. Only my own dynasty is worthy to lead the Necrons. Easily accomplished, as the void minds were smaller than a torpedo. I provided three dozen of those dark light weapons, which will soon be transformed into three dozen Necron dynasties left without a leader. We did have plenty of common enemies, Trazen and I. All right, Lord Trazen, now I shall tell you another story. In the final days of the Horus Heresy, the battle underscore of underscore Druth underscore two took place on a massive scale among Titan legions from both sides. And here on Druth II is where the famous Psy Titans of the Ordo Sinister were deployed. One of these rare Titans, the Occidentalis Cheerian, was tragically lost on this Ultramar world, and as a final revenge, a loyal Titan Princeps targeted the space elevator and brought it down, killing almost everyone and pulverizing the great machines of humanity. But, someone with great skill and patience might be able to pinpoint the exact place and time to interfere. A damaged Psy Titan, and a mostly intact Warlord Titan vanishing right as the orbital structure falls onto the battling armies below. Just imagine the value of those treasures. Plus, nobody would even know they were not destroyed. I whispered in his robotic mind, while leaning heavily on my bone staff. And for this lesson, you want what in trade? All those titans I so painfully worked to capture from Forge Venatoria, the Necron Overlord asked in a suspicious voice. You have made clear you want a collection of titans. Fine. So you can keep those you already have. But that Psy Titan is armed with a powerful pariah weapon, the Dread Sinistraminus Tenebri. The pilot is also a blank of tremendous power, and only that pariah princeps can fire the weapon. Now imagine that weapon, repaired and magnified, combined with the Blackstone Fortress. It might even work on the Hadex Anomaly. I suggested in a teasing voice. Perhaps. It would take me years to pinpoint the exact timeline and extract the weapon undetected. The human emperor is still active at that time, and he scares me. It would be very risky for me even if working through a disposable remote and the gains. The gains would be worth it, as I do have these orange monkeys to repair and upgrade that Tenebri device. And in return? Trazen asked in an aggravated voice. I want that other Titan, including the crew. And a mind control device based on the Enslaver Bones. Something very subtle and undetectable by Psykers. Plus the STC schematic for a better Titan, although I assume you already have those. 
I demanded in an eager tone. I wasn't asking much, and the Necron knew it. It is a small claim indeed, if the extraction is successful. Surely you need something else? Trazen the Infinite wondered sensing something was amiss. I pretended to think it over. I could use a dozen small-scale tesseracts for my agents. A thousand cubic kilometers of inner volume would be enough, perhaps also allowing short-range teleports. Don't want to give these agents too many powers, you surely understand. I think the Necron chuckled in amusement while checking his stores for something on that low scale. I do have a couple of these trinkets. We call them a Nexus underscore arrangement. However, a dozen of them would be too much. Two of them, one paid in advance for your helpful information, the other when I recover that Psy Titan. And your Null Bone Staff is ready too, although the flaw is very small. Perhaps the infant human needs to grow stronger and widen the flaw before more psyker powers can be used. Well, that made sense, I guess. Aeneas would only have the blank traits manifested, like all the blanks. But as he reached puberty, the psyker genes will activate just like they did for Janus. I could wait a decade, no problem. As for other trades, I would need more valuable information or artifacts. Back to lore digging, when I returned to my chapter. Checking with the Pharos one last time, I located a fleet of Ravagers' chaos vessels in orbit above the Tau World Salo Mine. With some carefully placed melta bombs inside the engine rooms, their ships were immobilized and prevented from retreat, giving the Tau a worthy enemy to fight. Why not let the Tau enjoy the wonders of the galaxy and test their tactics on Chaos Space Marines? After this, it was time to leave Sotha before another less friendly Inquisitor showed up. I couldn't count on my luck to meet another Ordo Zeno's beauty. Were they hired as ambassadors for the human race? Not that I would mind another pretty Inquisitor, even with the host of problems and demands they brought along. Demon CH-124 And lastly, it was time to finish the deal with the pretty blonde Infocyte, setting her on a long quest of my own. Well, after thoroughly pumping Calyxa full of endorphins and gene seed, naturally. She stretched on my bed like a cat and licked a finger teasingly, which made me almost keep her in my retinue, just for fun. But her talents would be wasted like that. Dear Calyxa, focus on your mission. I chided her sharply with a mind transmission, which broke her reverie. Of course, my lord. Another mission beside birthing you a child, you mean? The blonde minx asked while patting her belly. It wasn't visible, but my navigator confirmed a blank fetus was growing inside. We will meet again, and you'll have many more children, my dear. I will keep the blanks, and you will train the rest of our children. As for your mission, you will have to travel and compile a list of allies for our house. Rogue traders and rich governor houses on imperial worlds that have shipyards and weapons factories. This data stack contains a thousand STC patterns, which would be tremendously valuable to any of our allies. As for your escort, you will have this space wolf puppy called Trajan, Silent Sister Hestia, and five Death Watch Astartes from Rose's Retinue, and Battalion of Catacans for aggressive negotiations. For more diplomatic matters, you will have Sister Helena and a couple of Order Famulus sisters to conduct genetic testing. I explained in a gentler voice, while Canis licked his puppy with a sad face. Sorry, buddy, we all make sacrifices. I will have to temporarily detach one of my cute nurses and her two friendly family advisors, and Hestia was rather a formidable warrior in her own right. Just in case some chaos cult tried to impede my plans. I even detached Sly Marbo to aid Calixa in her difficult mission, along with three thousand catacans, a thousand of them women. Couldn't let the big bad monster rest over the next decade when he could pump babies during travel and then strangle or vanish impolite reluctant allies who didn't know yet who their boss was. And that pocket tesseract would be very useful for his task. Perfect place to store dead bodies too. Calixa skimmed the data stack with wide eyes, no doubt realizing exactly how valuable the information inside was. So, I'm to wait here until your daughter Andrea arrives with a Mars battlecruiser, and then proceed to Car underscore Dunias to install Macarius pattern warp less drives on the ship. 
After that, I have free reign on my travels, though not too far from the Ultima Segmentum, she mused while reading the mission's parameters. It's why it is called an independent command, Calixa. Andrea also has 50 billion thrones in her vault and some other gifts. Our Lancefire house is not poor, as you well know. The vigil for the vanquished was gifted to us by a pre-march, right? I reminded her in a wry tone. And if I misbehave, those Astartes have orders to hunt me down. I see, the Infocyte deduced with perfect logic. You will not misbehave, my dear. We have the same goals and the same enemies. We just use different means, and Grand Master Fadix and I will be colleagues on Terra soon enough. As secondary goals, you will locate cultists and corrupt officials, and keep watch for inquisitors that are themselves corrupt or helping cultists. Those you will report to Captain Andrea, and she will decide their fate. You will not act yourself, is that clear? I demanded while twisting her nipples in warning. I understand, my lord. Your daughter is a blank herself and thus not suspect of corruption. Calixa muttered in a weird voice, as if enjoying the pain. Very possible, considering what they must have put her through to become a member of the Venus Temple. Exactly. And the very reason blanks were hunted out from Terra, including the Silent Sisters. Can't have people immune to chaos, right? I asked in a rhetoric question. The blonde emphasite nodded while meditating on my words. It does seem stupid in hindsight. So that's why. Soon after, my battleship and the carriers departed for home, while Calixa and her new small army awaited for Andrea to arrive. A week later I received a hero's welcome on Illavar, while our troops and crew on the Crusade fleet were regarded as invincible heroes against the Xeno's terror. Our losses were indeed minuscule, and mostly only machines and equipment. And so I continued my long task, staying on Illavar this time, to oversee the progress of the Lamenters and returning the Lost Brothers to our chapter. Veteran Semni still wasn't too happy with me, but there was nothing he could do but lament to himself and keep his duty, training the new generation. Chirin took over most of the tactical training, because millennia of practical experience counted a lot. After two years of hard work and constant exploration and expansion, we had to halt because the volume was becoming too large and difficult to patrol. 500 habitable worlds and 10 times as many star systems used as naval bases and mining outposts will suffice until we had a large enough population. A couple of arid orc-infested worlds were kept as training ground for our regiments, as well as live testing area for the new weapons and machines being produced by Forge Retribution. Meanwhile, Elixir kept expanding the obsidian auguries like I had hoped, and taught the future tech marines the tricks of an emphasite. Their implantation with gene seeds was not as easy as with the blank recruits of the Lamenters, but we did have high-quality stock from the Red Scorpions and Primarch Khan himself, plus gene seeds extracted from Mantis Warriors, Executioners, and Blood Angels. Plenty of aspirants still died, even with all my efforts to prepare them. Company after company, the TIG Marine candidates were either sent to friendly forge worlds to be trained, or trained at home by the TIG priests of our own. And as it happened, those candidates sailed on discovered ships, cruisers, and destroyers captured during the Badab War, but their hangars and troop decks filled with blackstone and other valuable ore. The ships will return upgraded and filled with more Catacan regiments to serve as colonists for my new kingdom in the French. On Forge Retribution, my half-brothers and sisters were learning how to pilot their knights under Lord Whiteland's supervision. Everything seemed to work fine, and I was getting worried it was something too good for this hill. And only a month after, a huge orc waff arrived at my doorstep, with crazy orcs throwing asteroids at my defenses and capital, while to the side, a gathering of ten chaos chapters waited for the way to be cleared. It would have worked no doubt, despite my efforts to provide as many orbital forts and defense ships as humanly possible. There were other gods, and they hated me. You should gather your family and retreat, evaluating as many civilians as possible. Dreadnought Chirin advised me in a calm voice. Things look so bad, huh? I mused out loud, while scratching Canis on his head. The space wolf snorted in dismissal and went to look for another imported she-wolf to subdue. 
He wasn't that interested in my games, it seemed. Sadly, those bitches were all one-time partners for Canis, as they rarely survived being mounted by a van-sized wolf. Even if they did, and carried a few puppies to term, they were rather, let's say, too broken for further use. Right, the big orc waff. I almost forgot, and they're gone. A minute later, the Chaos ships also vanished, but only to reappear into the sun, with plasma warheads detonating inside their engine rooms to keep them from escaping. The void was almost clear, and I was not even paying much attention as the last Chaos battleship started melting deep inside the sun, when the Starfort shuddered and trembled like something huge hit us. Dilla Generatorium's Overloading Breach on Wing 8, the console Lex mechanic announced in almost panic. Containment protocol. And let's go and receive the visitors. I proclaimed while priming reason for combat. In a minute, I climbed inside the cockpit and urged the knight at full speed, rushing towards the breach. In the tesseract I could faintly see the invader, some kind of big demon slashing about our garden and the precious hydroponics. Damn it! Those had costed me a billion thrones to import from all over, since combat drugs and rare medication were hard to find and had to be produced by Astartes apothecaries. Who knew? Brother Semni ran even faster than my knight and managed to slash off a wing from this demon with the chronoglave I gave him before getting slapped aside, his terminator armor tumbling like a two-ton leaf. Semni vanished in my labyrinth before he could dent my deck and probably get a concussion. Or give the deck a concussion, for that matter. I am Carr, the... The big demon began shouting as his head vanished under a blast from my volcano lance. The demon didn't die, instead starting to regrow its lost head and wing, when the silent sisters arrived in force and began chopping at his body with ease, while my power glaive held the demon's own sword locked. I kinda wished to give the thing a true underscore death, but I didn't have a force weapon, nor the psyker powers to use one and the only other such weapon, usable by a blank, was the true name of a demon. Well, luckily for me, I did know of this Mkar. And the Silent Sisters were quite a force multiplier, too. You are Malak Kartho. Merely a word-bearer traitor, unable to keep your oath. I sentence you to die a true death, your soul erased forever. I boomed from my cockpit, just as Sister Letitia jumped and slashed the arm holding the black demon sword. With my power glaive free, I could cut and slash the corrupted marine transformed into a winged demon into tiny bits and portion each cut to my silent sisters to be exorcised. A flint dagger was all that remained from the banished demon, which I collected for myself. This must be one of those rare theme, an interix relic able to cut through space itself. It will take me some time to learn its use, but from what I knew, they could turn an enemy to your side. Then I remembered to bring back Brother Semni, and proceeded directing the tech priests and servitors to seal the fort's breach and burn the poor plants. It wasn't like we would use frozen and corrupted plants for anything. We will need even more Blackstone armor and Geller fields. Damn demons! Is Mkarf truly dead, Master Lancefire? The veteran brother asked as the last vestiges of the demon's body were burning under the pariah boots of my sisters. Probably so. Using a human vessel makes it very easy to kill the stupid demons. Shout their name and cut them down. And having silent sisters around helps too. I explained patiently while driving reason back to its hangar. It seems too easy. The man muttered in distrust. Knowledge is a great power, brother. Guard it well. I said wryly as the cockpit opened and I patted reason on its armored head. A minute later, Engine Seer Felicia arrived running at full tilt, passing me without a word and going over the scrades of the night with cooing sounds like calming a baby. Incense and oil as well as prayers and machine canticles covered the poor night suit, and its mechanical head stared at me in a pleading gaze. Make her leave. Sorry, dead brother. Just endure, like we all did. Plus you did fight a demon prince, so holy oils and technolingua prayers should help or at least, do no harm. Brood CH-125 As I returned to the command center, I was already exploring what these orcs have brought me, besides the Space Hulk still far beyond the gas giant. 
nearly 80 cruisers, 6 org battleships, and 250 escorts, of which 50 ships were Chaos destroyers still bearing the marks of a couple Chaos warbands. This was possibly the payment the traitors used to attract the orcs, not that it actually took much to convince them into attacking anyone. Done it myself a few times. But this indeed gave me a great idea, if only I could find an Ordo Zeno's Inquisitor to get on board with my plan. And while my ships formed into a strike group to dismember that Space Hulk, I concluded my work and ejected those infested Chaos Destroyers into the Sun Good Riddance. I now had even more precious metal to construct my army and armor up my ships. The battlecruisers and battle barges first, because they had the huge reactors meant for battleships, and thus more than enough energy to move, even after tripling their armor. And once all these orc cruisers were cleaned up and repaired, I would have a hundred capital ships to form the core of my personal fleet, backed up by ten battleships and several carriers. And everything would be able to travel outside the warp too. The logistics would get a bit complicated, but while I had the cruisers towed to friendly Forge Worlds, then upgraded, the next generation of granddaughters will be almost ready to become captains. The decision thus made, I nodded to myself while Chiron just mumbled something. You said something, Chiron? I asked to make sure. I said you're breaking all the rules, Lord Lancefire. Not that the Chaos Worshippers didn't break them first. A hundred orc capital ships and a hundred trader vessels, just gone. There must have been billions of orcs and ten thousand trader space marines, with Emperor knows how many demon engines and fighters and bombers and tanks, the dreadnought grumbled in a deep voice from his coffin. I nodded in agreement. His estimations of enemy numbers and equipment were spot on. Going by any rational measure, the traders should have won in less than a year. Probably before any help could be sent from Ultramar. Then again, I did kind of burn down nearly any remaining demon world in the Pharos range, plus a hundred orc worlds and just as many tyrannid crawling nests. Must have ruined lots of carefully laid plans and reduced the chaos influence in the segmentum by half or more. I should have captured some cultists and interrogate, wait. There were some remaining on the Space Hulk. And a billion orcs too plus the other assortment of creatures generally found on a space hulk, like mutants and genistealers and a dozen types of xenos I never seen before. These guys must have come from the Eye of Terror or somewhere. But in a few hours, it was kinda over, as the monstrous hulk began breaking up under a barrage of torpedoes and nova shells, and I could start stealing away battleship-sized fragments, widening gaps for more weapons to strike at fractures and split off mangled hulls and twisted weapons and engines. Even so, the Hulk began moving away while losing megatons from its mass with every salvo from our strike group. Seeing this, I directed a thousand corvettes to dive and unload everything in the middle of the remaining Hulk. A fragment 100 kilometers long sheared off under the thousands of torpedoes striking along a midline, and less than half of this Hulk reached warp limit and jumped away. Damn cheating bastards! In time, the Space Hulk will collect more victims and grow again, as in the warp dimensions were malleable, and ships could intersect each other, then remained fused once the Hulk emerged into real space. Anyway, I did manage to collect a couple of sorcerers and even a navigator. Well, it kinda made sense to use a navigator to guide this beast, and the captured ships would each have a navigator. One of them would eventually crack and do the bidding of his new masters. I began organizing an interrogation center, with security protocols in place. Pain wouldn't be really useful, but tech priests and drugs would, as well as memory reading devices and silent sisters to keep things fair. And then, the interrogations began, recorded on pit cams, and sent to the command center and the Lamenter barracks. The new Lamenters should know what to expect in their career, and fucking use their melta backpack before they lay limbless and dissected on a torture table. Brother Semni arrived escorted by a sanguinary priest and huffed at the display. This will hurt morale and give the recruits bad dreams. I snorted and waved a hand at the big holo screen. No Astartes has ever died of old age, brother. The lucky ones will get a bolter round in their face, or maybe a claw. As for the unlucky ones, this is very mild. The worst would happen to those lamenters who are stupid enough fall the chaos because then, I will be the one making them suffer. 
not merely having the memories torn away by a mechanicus brain probe. A millennium of real suffering and then true death, obliterating their souls completely. I continued in a pleasant voice, as if we were talking about wines. The sanguinary priest shuddered and walked off in a hurry, while his eyes turned black. He could run, but I knew all of them now. I had every single one memorized, just in case I needed to extract them or hunt them down. Semni was made of sterner stuff, where he has seen too much in the Death Watch. Inquisitors could be inventive and brutal too, I suppose. The man just sighed and sat down to watch. We'll need to salvage that Arc Mechanicus. It will make good training for the recruits. We'll incinerate and melt the rest of the metal to buy new ships and weapons. I continued while highlighting a nearly intact Mechanicus cruiser that was only lacking engines. Expected opposition, Chapter Master. Chirin perked up at the idea of killing Xenos. There are 68,000 hostiles on board. Half of them genistealers. There's even a broodlord on deck 15. I explained in an amused voice. The dreadnought grumbled something like insanity and impossible. Then spoke more clearly. And who will go? Those 5,000 aspirants, the Tegmarines, and all the sanguinary priests in the first wave, under your command. Bolt pistols and melee weapons only. The blank recruits and Semni will teleport on deck 15 to engage the Broodlord and its retinue using only melee weapons. I demanded, giving the easy job to Chirin. So many people will only need to fire 10 shots each and not miss. Semni grunted at his task, hand patting the bolt pistol on his hip. We cannot take our weapons? You can take whatever weapons you want. Those who use anything else than what I ordered get disqualified. Now this, this will become our Lamenter's training schedule. What other chapter can train in boarding operations, with live enemies, in their home system? Just imagine how big that Space Hulk is. We can train a million aspirants with ease. I exclaimed in a joyous voice. As you say, Chapter Master. Here we can train in safety. But you won't always be there to watch over us. Chirin proclaimed in a wise voice and walked away to prepare the operation. Brother Semni had a much smaller task and fewer troops to command. In ten minutes my blank sons were ready, half wearing Terminator armor, the other Devastator models. Once they confirmed readiness, I just moved them on board the Arc Mechanicus cruiser on deck 15 and then started sending over small groups of Tegmarines and Sanguinary priests as soon as they held a palm out for transport. Initially, it went well for both groups, but as soon as I started to move aspirants over, it became hectic. Men were panicking, genistealers were jumping about from pipes and behind corners, their claws able to slice through metal with ease. Pistols served little purpose if you were not able to see and target your enemy. I allowed most injuries, except losing limb and life, extracting the dead ones and sending them again on deck one. The injured men found themselves in the apothecary for emergency medical care and then sent once more to deck one to start the mission again. It was kind of fun playing dungeon master. Once in a while, a group of orcs boys would spawn at their backs, forcing the aspirants to advance more carefully. New bolter crates and bottles of water and nutrigruel would await at every new deck as a reward for reaching a new level. It was kind of fun. Sadly, the boss raid wiped, as a broodlord was a bio-titan and not easily defeated by noob players. They had to start all over, passing through corridors infested with orcs and tyranids to reach the boss room again and again. About six hours later, the men seemed exhausted, and they still didn't manage to complete the mission. Don't worry, guys. We will start again, tomorrow. I had enough orcs and tyranids in my tesseract to train an Astartes legion of old. And that's what I did try to obtain. Ashurius CH-126 By the end of the decade, Forge Retribution had finally completed the long shaft towards the planet mantle and installed the reality cage, which did in fact prevent warp engines from working next to it, and also gave hundreds of tick priests and acolytes terminal seizures. Nobody was certain why that happened, but many humans did have latent psyker genes, including the cult Mechanicus members. However, it wasn't all bad. 
Those psychertic priests were also the most likely to fall to chaos, like the Dark Mechanicum had. As for FTL communication, we had the Forge's astropaths secluded on a distant moon, near the edge of the system, and they weren't blown up by the island of reality. They just couldn't see the planet or communicate directly, instead having to use manifold transmissions via encrypted gravity waves, or even laser or vox communiques for picked or voice messages. It wasn't perfect, but it worked well enough that I gave the go-ahead to install such devices on every large world in the Lancefire dynasty. From Natale to Radium, then Illavar and Liberation, then lastly Salvation. We should work out the kinks and potential problems before using the reality cage on the cardinal world. Well, it was more of an agri-world and fortress world now, the first hive city being slowly dug downwards instead of raised. The hive city would be much less exposed to air and orbital attacks that way, plus the earth itself will provide structural resistance instead of relying on expensive materials and complex technologies to keep those spires up. I had a much better use for adamantium than holding up a thousand skyscrapers dozens of kilometers tall. For example, building a thousand starships. Imports of immigrants continued at increased rate, both criminals and indentured serfs from the nearest hive worlds. And when Amberly finally arrived, she did not come alone. Beside the catacans and the drop cruisers, she had brought her daughter Cyrene and another inquisitor of her order called Ashuri underscore injuries. Cyrene had the Psyker gift, which wasn't actually good, but I kinda expected that. All of my kids with Rose have been Psykers, after all. Must be my damned luck. And Ashuria, well she wanted something from me, as expected. Turns out it wasn't a wonderful romance or gifted children, but instead Ashuria wanted Xeno technology and weapons she could use. Well, I did have plenty of that, as it happens. Inquisitors did have a seventh sense for smelling a rich bounty, and that sense led her right towards me. But the woman should be used in other ways too, not just as a weapon against the terror. Although Ashuria had a plain face, with brunette hair reaching her shoulders and brown eyes watching me calm and restrained, I wasn't easily convinced. Especially not when Ashuria glanced at Amberly as she played with the null bone staff, something like envy and greed flashing in those eyes before resuming a homely demeanor. Zeno's technology, huh? I suppose I can help, dear Ashuria. Are you a psyker? I asked to make sure. Not all inquisitors were, but those with psyker powers were the most likely to survive. A very minor talent, Lord Lancefire. Landa Level, the brunette woman complained in a soft voice. I nodded thoughtfully and considered a few options. I could help her, quite a lot. Perhaps even make her a beta-level psyker with the Shadow Light artifact from Prelia. And you, Amberly? How much power do you have with the Relic Staff in your hand? I asked the other Inquisitor. Amberly grimaced and struggled to lift a few tarot cards. About Lambda level as well. Your Rose is much stronger, even with this staff. You'll get stronger, my love. As for Lady Injuries, we will need to work very hard together perhaps a dozen children, before we obtain one child bridging the Emperor's gift and my own. Only after that feat would an artifact like Amberly's work for you. I proposed with a shameless smile and sipped some expensive damascene. Good stuff, and also very expensive to import. A barrel of it was as expensive as a Fury Starfighter. The new Inquisitor lady measured me with suspicious eyes before turning to her colleague. Are you okay with this, Inquisitor Vale? Amberly just shrugged and began taking off her leather suit in response. Just sit back and observe, esteemed colleague. I kinda missed my lover, and he's grown even taller. Should be a lot of fun, my P.E.F. darling. A couple of hours later, Ashuria had emptied my bottle of Damascene and her face seemed rather red and hot. I waved her closer and stole a gentle kiss. She tasted like almonds, which was very sexy. Much later, I had both women resting beside me while I caressed their sweaty skin. I could get used to this, even if it would delay my task. Ashuria murmured and kissed my shoulder. Then we shall do our best, for a month or so. Afterwards, I have to visit Forge Retribution and check the progress of the anti-orc virus. 
Both Ordozino's inquisitors raised themselves and started interrogating me in various ways until I spilled the beans. I'm quite certain experimenting with Zeno's weapons is forbidden and considered heresy. Amberly muttered while playing with my progenoid glands. I shrugged and drew Ashuria into a long kiss. Out here in the fringe, I speak for the Emperor. Everything I say or do is divinely inspired. To disobey me is heresy. I explained in a patient voice while playing with Ashuria's body as a counterpoint. One more time, P.F., she pleaded in my ear in a throaty voice. I smiled inward. Angelic genes were quite useful today. By the third week, I decided to test the ancient device on Amberly and see what it could do. Should I have been surprised to see her psycho powers jump from gamma to alpha level in ten minutes of exposure? Well, I wasn't. The device was working exactly as promised. Amberly now had her own powers back at gamma level even with the no bone staff, and the Inquisitor was very grateful for my gift. This is amazing, lover. Oh, you're getting so fucked this week till you won't be able to walk, the blonde woman claimed in a determined voice, making Ludvias chuckle to himself. I signaled silence, with two fingers before grabbing the horny woman and making her look in my eyes. This one time, for fun. You're pregnant already and our friend Ashuria is not. Plus I have many other concubines. Amberly pouted and jumped on the bed, her bountiful body enticing me to just keep her in bed for a few decades. I'll be back in two years anyway. And perhaps I may find you a nice gift in return. Sadly, my duty demanded more than just pleasure. I still had a hundred catacans, a hundred nobles, a hundred Valhallans, and a thousand blank women to impregnate, and then a thousand Ogren females waiting for me at Forge Retribution. Yes, I did not forget about that project, although I might spread that difficult duty to some of my sons as well. Even their prettiest exemplars, and not yet fully mature, and they were taller than me and twice as muscular. And not that pretty, as you can imagine. Perhaps do it from behind and lights turned off? And then close my eyes and think of Terra. And on Terra, things were going quite bad from what I could glean. Of course, most reports were redacted or expunged or mere propaganda, but a cardinal dying couldn't be hidden. Nor could the master of Astra Telepathica, despite claims of a long illness. Their place in the Senatoris Imperialis had been taken by the Lord Commanders of the Astra Militarum and the Imperial Navy, which pointed to a more militaristic conduct for the Imperium in the next decades. Primarch Khan was merely butchering his way somewhere in the Segmentum Tempestus, reinforcing forges and moving dozens of Astartes chapters over hive worlds instead of their preferred feral worlds, which had nearly no value. In the east, Primarch Gilliman was still gathering troops and ships for the Defendarius Crusade, which simply meant more and more sentinel worlds being set up, and his characteristically brutal cleansing of corrupt officials. If the Imperium had three more Primarchs, they might make it through the future crisis, but they did not. It seemed I had to accidentally wake up Lionel Johnson, the Primarch of the Dark Angels, and also chat up my insane Necron friend and obtain extra technology based on the Tau database. The next week, however, I did depart for retribution with Ashuria and her retinue on board the Canticle. She even had a Genitor Mugos willing to follow her, which would be quite a boon for the Fungal Research Division, those making the glass virus against the orcs. My battlecruiser finally had warp-less engines now, plus megatons of extra armor and a Nova cannon, and so did all the battle barges and battlecruisers under my command. The Lamentu Starford was being plated over with even more armor and blackstone, and configured to serve as a mobile base for future operations. However, the battleships will still take decades to be ready for combat, even those sent for repair at Forge Triplex Fall. They were just too big and complex machines, and some of the upgrades I demanded wouldn't be easy to install anyway. Valained CH-127 I had brought twenty of my blank sons with me on this trip, each with their own harem and retinue of bodyguards and tech priests, and a couple of blank lamenters to begin trials for the Leviathan Dread Knights. Yes, exactly those obtained from Trazen, but made much simpler to construct, even by a small forge world. The Leviathans were still as expensive as a Baneblade heavy tank, 
but more powerful and much more agile. The Chokin production was manufacturing the complex adamantic reactors and shields, as those were the key attribute, not the size or the weapons. One such leviathan could be made every two years, even with all our efforts. They also needed the black carapace bionic implants to be wielded at full performance, which kinda sucked. I didn't have that organ, nor did my silent sisters. Of course, a weaker Dreadnight variant had been made, using the Mind Impulse Unit implant instead, and a simpler plasma reactor. Those could be made two per year as well, and thus we had ten of them ready for trials, piloted by blank women assigned as auxiliar force to the Lamenters. There was nothing the Codex Astartes preventing me from recruiting and arming women to fight beside the Battle Brothers, and so I used that. Small numbers for now, but in time I would have a powerful army, even larger than the limit imposed for most Astartes chapters. And that without resorting to stupid tricks like sending 1,000 men on a constant crusade and then implanting 1,000 more, like the Black Templars did. Ashuria seemed a bit bothered by the reality cage, but there wasn't much I could do. Try not to use psyker powers here. There's a planetary Geller field covering the surface. I explained while watching over the trials with interest. My blank sons were able to run and do flips with their leviathans, while the poor sisters had to lumber slowly and fire the plasma gatling guns in support. Not that great, but these women weren't princeps, with specially selected genes for piloting mechs. On the nearby field, the night squad were drilling in melee formations, using huge power swords against servitors and dummy targets. I took pity on them and released a few thousand orcs to make things more fun. As expected, their WAF field didn't work, and the orcs had to contend with muscles and melee weapons against knights. Too easy, but this was merely practice after all. I did the same for the leviathans, and just watched the mech stomp their targets with impunity. Can we get some Tyranids, Dad? My son Vallis asked bravely. They want some Tyranids to test their metal. What do you say, my dear Inquisitor? I asked Ashuria with a raised eyebrow. I want to see that. Give them something big, like that broodlord from the captured Ark Mechanicus, the brunette woman demanded with a grin. All right then. A Tyranid army it is. I guess I shouldn't have sent a million Tyranids, but I did make quite a show, and tested the machines to the limit and beyond. Once again, the Tyranid silence didn't quite work, nor did their command synapse link, so I compensated that with larger numbers. In the end, the knights had to march over and help out, while the local tech marines moved in with remote-controlled guardian turrets to even the numbers somewhat. Still, it took a whole day to eliminate this small Tyranid army, despite fifty night class mecha and a thousand turrets firing constantly. As soon as combat was over, the retribution tech priests rushed to patch up the damaged walkers and also retrieve the combat logs and police the battlefield for precious gene samples from a couple Tyranid hives. Meanwhile, I was testing myself with the Ogrins, who didn't seem too satisfied with my pretty boy body and performance. My sons did even worse, though, because they were still normal men, if rather athletic men from all the training. Luckily, this duty took only two weeks, and then I could return to my regular concubines, and especially my wife Decima, who was feeling rather horny and eager for more kids. Or possibly simply needed a vacation from her boring job of administering a stellar kingdom, setting up patrol routes and supply points and sending equipment and immigrants where needed. I would have been overwhelmed doing all that for a decade, too. Sometime later, Felicia sneaked into my room and dove for her prize, while Decima held my head in her lap and massaged my scalp. We've grown so big and powerful, husband. We have a night house and so many planets and ships. I fear the Imperium will soon come asking for everything, like they always do. Install their administrators and bishops everywhere and suck us dry. Decima whispered in a soft voice. Felicia glanced at my eyes a bit curious, then continued her task, sucking me dry as well. I nodded inward, as Decima was quite correct in her predictions. We were not far enough to escape the reach of the Imperium completely. Quite evident by my three Inquisitor lovers and the third fleet carrier being finished upgrading. Rose would be returning soon, as the Tau threat was being contained and their expansion halted. 
Not their technological advances, though, due to constant attacks by orcs, Chaos and Necron, plus a couple of small Tyranid fleets passing through Tau space while heading for Sarlacc. The Tau were forced to rely more and more on their human allies from the colonies, which also gave the Inquisition an infiltration path to obtain even more advanced Tau technology. And if some of these human researchers managed to discover Imperial STC patterns for starfighters, or slow leviathans walkers, or clunky plasma and melta guns, well then, they would be promoted, while the Tau researchers began repairing and upgrading these poor weapons to something of Tau quality. As for Decima's predictions, they came true in less than a month, just as I was preparing to depart from retribution. An ultramarine strike cruiser arrived, bearing the commander of the Gilliman's Vitrix Guard, named Cato underscore Sicarius. At his side there was an inquisitor lady, but one I did not know, named Valene underscore Amias. Chapter Master Lancefire, it has come to the Primarch's attention that your chapter is in possession of a large fleet, including five battle barges, 25 cruisers, and 30 destroyers. You are hereby requested and required to provide your ships to the Balor Crusade, with the aim of cleansing Xenos and heretics all along the eastern fringe. Especially those drop cruisers and any armored regiments you have available in your auxilia, the ultramarine captain demanded and held out a long parchment signed by Robwood himself. I pretended to think about it while I read the document and had it memorized. Dotting every line and did not mention the rogue trader ships, which were not subject to his authority. Clever and pretty much irrefutable, more so with the strange inquisitor to his side. My armored forces were already famous from the Badab War, and the drop cruisers made a big impact in the Moloch Crusade. Nothing about the Silent Sisters, which was good and bad. Possibly still nominally prescribed in the Imperium, for now. It is very compelling, I admit. But if I'm not in command of this crusade, I'm not interested. The Imperium can afford to waste thousands of ships and regiments with incompetent commanders, but not me. I answered after a tense minute. A bit confused, Cato Sicarius glanced at the Inquisitor for support. The woman lowered her cowl to reveal a scarred face with bionic eyes. Inquisitor Remius also had a bionic hand, so she must have been through a lot, but she survived. It is acceptable, Lord Lancefire. I shall observe you during the crusade and quell the fears of some of my colleagues. See, they worry you're corrupting their female inquisitors and turning them into your personal sluts. The strange woman spoke in an amused voice, bionic eyes glancing at the pregnant Ashuria at my side, with a knowing look. I just smiled widely in response. Preposterous. If anything, I should be praised for propagating the human race among the stars. Have those names written down for me, I'll make sure to castigate these insolent inquisitors of yours. I think Cato Sicarius blinked in surprise, but perhaps it was just a gust of wind. Is that so? How many inquisitors did you castigate until now? The woman asked with a faint smile. Eh, numbers. I forget the exact decimal. Obviously not enough, if they dare cast such allegations at my distinguished person. I replied dismissively, then turned to kiss Ashuria for a long minute. With a flushed face and heavy breath, Ashuria walked away at a fast pace. She did have another project in mind, testing the glass virus on a couple of orc worlds nearby. Well then, I shall find accommodation on your ship as well. This certainly looks like a promising start for a crusade. Captain Sicarius muttered a bit awkwardly and walked off, leaving me alone with the new Inquisitor. I offered her my elbow and started walking towards the bridge. See? Nothing but false allegations, my dear. Do let me know if you have a candidate in mind to become a personal slut. Perhaps someone from a different faction, I hear rival inquisitors murder each other every day. The woman patted my arm and covered her face with the cowl once more. You're a very interesting young man, P.E.F. Lancefire. And you even have a tesseract of your own, right? The inquisitor asked in a soft voice. I tried not to flinch, sensing my own tesseract counter hers and blocking its effect. With so many Necrons awakening and constant attacks by Astartes chapters on Necron worlds, it was inevitable someone else would find one. But Valene wouldn't have the real operation manual, like I had. 
Nothing to worry about yet. Plus, she was still a woman, and flesh was weak. Avalos, CH-128 The crusade was scheduled to depart from Forge World Anurus, sadly not one in my close contact list. But it was never too late to make new friends. Just like this good Inquisitor Remius and her silver cube with Necron sigils. It wasn't a solar system range tesseract like my own, and more like the one I gave to Sly Marbo, but still encrypted and holding a million Necrons and stasis inside. We got a bit closer during the trip, but not really close. The woman was damaged and skewed by her task, something to do with an Eldar Cabal and their dark pattern. I wasn't all that worried. Generally, the Eldar were simply trying to help in strange and unwelcome ways. Of course, there were many Cabals, and one of them aimed to exterminate all life in the galaxy to deny Chaos victory by ending the source of nightmares and dreams. Pretty much what the men of iron had tried as well, and nearly succeeded. Other cabals were trying to bring forth new gods, or kill some gods, or both. Other cabals were searching for divine vessels to host the emperor's soul, or even summoning the Omnisia, like the Omnisiads. And I kinda suspected some of my friends of adhering to this cabal, especially the fabricators of Antax and Triplex Fall. And the fabricator of Anurus wasn't too friendly, which was both good and bad. Good, because friendly tech priests were likely to dissect you to find out what made you tick. And bad because I wasn't given all the weapons and modifications to the weapons I wanted. I had hoped to obtain more tarantula drop pods and sentinels, but I only got a few thousands, which wasn't nearly enough. Same for hydro flak tanks or enough torpedoes to massacre a hive fleet if we encountered one. But for this reluctance to help, I took revenge and emptied his stores of more classic chimeras and bane blades, and one orc terror ship transformed into a marauder bomber carrier with 5,000 bombers, and demanded that all Astartes battle barges from the dozen chapters selected for the crusade be retrofitted with Nova cannons and warp less engines. This took even a large Forge World like Anurus an entire year, so I could visit Forge World Amantep underscore 2 nearby and requisition the lost cannon turrets I wanted, plus more torpedoes and sentinels. The fabricator of Amantep even provided 20 knights from House Terran of Valtoris, and thus he was rewarded with an orc terror ship filled with blackstone and adamantium, plus a hundred valuable STC templates. When the year had passed, Forge Conan arrived with a million of Skatarii on a XL Mechanicus carrier and three Arc Mechanicus cruisers, without even asking for their help. Sure, I had helped them in the past, and they owed their Forge World status to me, but it was rare to see the Mechanicus act like this. Perhaps they could learn, or perhaps they were simply bribing me for extra materials and STC templates. Most likely both of that, but I didn't mind. Make yourself useful, and you will be rewarded. It was a simple trade, although the Inquisitor was rather surprised and suspicious why Forge Conner would act like this now, and not during other crusades. I know for certain you did not call Forge Conner to aid you, as I was right beside you for this entire year. The woman muttered a bit displeased, while her bodyguard watched Captain Matthias nodded in agreement. They did live in my rooms, which made me lose precious work on the STCs, but I compensated by producing more babies. Quite correct, my dear. I'll have to find something to reward Forge Conner with during this crusade. A Blackstone mining world, perhaps, or some ancient STC pattern lying around in my inventory. I'm used to myself, opening the galactic map for an easy target. Some Necron base without a tan defending it, which would make things rather complicated. I rarely used the cogitator in my apartment, mainly for supply and human resource work, arranging the troops and equipment plus their provisions and munitions. Being in charge of a big crusade was hard work too, not that I even tried doing everything by myself. I had a command staff and I wasn't afraid to use it. Plus a couple of night pilots from House Terran were women, which made integrating them under me much easier. By the time the year had passed, the pilots were even back for light duty, three children born and even a blank boy among them. By our agreement, I would keep the boy for my chapter, while they will have two new pilots and even new knights for them in a decade or two. The former Imperial world of Ignaris was out, because they did have a tan and quite a strong one. Nothing urgent anyway. 
I needed to head towards Jericho Reach now and save Hive World Avalos before Hive Fleet Dagon reached it. Decision made, the troop transports housing 100 Astra Militarum regiments departed under escort from 200 frigates and destroyers, while a recon force of 100 Navy corvettes with warp engines sped ahead to scout the terrain and map out the opposition. The capital ships formed up in five task forces commanded by my blank daughters on board Lamenter battle barges, each grouped around a fleet carrier. We would travel on parallel vectors spread a light year apart, such that we didn't miss any enemies on the way. Of course, Finona was quite lucky and found a space hulk drifting about not even a week into the crusade, which consumed all her torpedoes to break up into manageable bits. Luckily, there were a company of ultramarines and nova marines and other space marines in her task force to pacify and cleanse the derelicts and I also sent the Forge Conor troops there to help. Surely, their Forge world could use gigatons of free metal after the Hulk was conquered and towed away bit by bit to be melted and reforged. Much better to sacrifice Skatarii and servitors for this long and perilous task than poor guardsmen with lost guns and bayonets. By the time we managed to reach Avalos, another task force lead by my daughter Teresa had deviated to help with an orc waff, aided by the Knights of House Terran. A dozen regiments and forty destroyers were sent there to help reconquer a dozen planets for the Imperium, and I detached two drop cruisers as well. They probably contained ten times as much firepower as the poorly armed guardsmen regiments, and I even had two leviathans and twenty tig marines ready to assist. Doesn't sound as much, until they each begin to remote control 100 Guardian turrets and unleash greater firepower than two entire Astartes chapters, while the Leviathan Dreadnights are ready and able to beat up Orc bosses with their own limbs. We found the Hive world in turmoil, Genestealer cults revolting while the Hive fleet was already blocking warp travel with their shadow in the warp, even from light years away. Good thing we didn't use the warp then, right? It took me a minute to analyze the star system and formulate a plan, then I began sending orders to my fleets, grouping the heavier ships in the middle and the faster cruisers for harassment and flank attacks. And then Outlander began transporting troops to quell the rebellions, and I even managed to locate an Inquisitor lady trying to shoot a Tyranid broodlord with her plasma pistol. Most of her retinue was already dead, except two Death Watch Marines with storm shields and power weapons, desperately trying to defend the brave Inquisitor from the Xeno's Bio-Titan. It worked about as well as you can imagine, as I did try that scenario with 200 Astartes with melee weapons, and didn't go well for 23 test runs. However, everything changed when a couple of Silent Sisters wearing Leviathan Dreadnights materialized in front and back of the Broodlord. Chop, shoot, slash, shoot. It was over in ten seconds, and then they continued onwards, butchering genistealers and cultists while a lamenter tig marine in a heavily armored armed sentinel arrived with his retinue of guardians to secure the perimeter. Are you all right, brothers? The new tig marine asked on the voxcaster. The emperor protects. We were about to discharge our last duty, a veteran death watch answered in relief and checked on his boss. Lady Calistrati, are you injured anywhere? These filthy beasts are poisonous. The woman crashed to her knees and drew a deep breath. I saw my death, but I was saved. The Lamenters? Yes, Inquisitor. We only have three battle brothers, including the Master, although he's not a real, well. He does a great job, and he sent me and the sisters here. Don't worry you're safe now, the man declared in a proud voice, while his guardian's walking turrets fired volley after volley of lost cannons and torrents of multilasers with incredible accuracy. Then, I shall have to offer my thanks to your chapter master, Lamenter. So those black voids of nightmare were silent sisters, the woman asked, holstering her useless pistol and glancing after the leviathans with a shudder. I smiled inward as I focused my attention back of the fleet deployment. Generals Rayla and Regina had the ground warfare part covered, while Colonel Jennet was heading down with three auxilia armor regiments and sixty more tech marines to set up defenses for the main hive city of Lord's home. Of course, my chapter's armor regiments were nothing like the normal Astra Militarum units, with twenty times more war machines and lots of drones and ground attack craft and support. 
A couple of different chapters of Stardust companies were already on the surface and knee-deep in blood, brutally quelling the rebellions while my tech priests and servitors were also preparing to deploy and use the captured rebels and cultists for Omnisia's work, converting them into more servitors and digging trenches, setting minefields, or simply being marched out as forward artillery observers. We still had a month till the main bulk of the Hive fleet arrived, quite enough time to drag a hundred asteroids for a minimal array of orbital forts and hit and run attacks by Nova Cannon cruisers. In the grim future of the 41st millennium there is only war, and I learned to love it. Unbroken CH-129 Having so many resources at my disposal meant I could enact strategies that might be considered wasteful by the Imperium, such as layered void minefields containing plasma and Nova warheads. Asteroids with torpedo tubes and missile launchers placed far ahead to soften the attackers, and a couple of old defense lasers repaired and raised into orbit, and then set in geostationary orbit above the planet's poles. On the ground, terrace walls of ferrocrete were being hastily poured, with plasma generators inside, to provide continuous and autonomous power to Lost Cannon's tarantula turrets, and recharge slots for the infantry's Lost Gun power packs. Poles with horizontally spinning flails dotted the dead ground around the Hive City, and drum flails above the gates would provide some measure of protection against melee attackers, while underground the Hive was being cleaned up and reinforced with extra walls of ferrocrete and plates of blackstone around important generators and conduits. A couple of drop cruisers were making their way towards Avalos on sublight engines, but they will still need a month to arrive, even going at a quarter of the light speed. Perhaps using light cruisers wasn't so inspired after all, especially not against Tyranids. Might need to find a heavy cruiser pattern for drop pods, one with warp-less engines. They were not bad, and worked great against orcs or other Xenos or traitors, but when the space around a star system was blockaded by the shadow in the warp, a slower heavy cruiser would still reach the deployment zone faster and they could carry ten times as many drop pods without having to remove the capital-class weapon batteries. On a side note, Avira Calistrati was very grateful for being saved, and it only took a couple of days of light romance to express her gratitude in my bed. The other inquisitive lady was perhaps not too pleased, seeing her predictions coming true in front of her bionic eyes. Not that I would turn a friendly inquisitor into a slut, that's insulting. Who would raise the children then? Perhaps a really crazy inquisitor, but with a great body? It would be like saving her life and giving her a new purpose, in my opinion. We shall see, once Trazen provided me an enslavement method like he was testing right now on Astartes and many other of his slaves and subjects. It would have to be very subtle and undetectable, as the Inquisition or the librarians were quite adept at detecting Zeno's influence. Why is she here, P.E.F.? Surely you can tell Lady Valen underscore Amias to wait outside while we enjoy a few hours together? Avira muttered in my neck and glared at her fellow Inquisitor for invading her privacy. I wasn't that bothered, having gotten used with my bodyguards or wives keeping watch over me, even in bed. Doesn't bother me one bit, my dear. My body is pretty much perfect, angel jeans and all. I answered in a cheerful tone and gestured at my nearly catacan-shaped body. Getting close to two meters tall, strong muscles, youthful appearance, angelic face, what was not to like. To the side, Canis lifted his eyes to measure me and then glanced at his own van-sized body of pure raw strength and glossy fur. He was quite amazing as well, too bad I didn't have a Fenrisian wolf female for him. Also immune to warp. I want kids like that too, my new inquisitor lover murmured while pawing all over me, then deciding to climb for another ride. I agreed, naturally. Her kids would be great as she had perfect genes. Someone on Terra must have been selecting the prettiest women to become inquisitors for some strange reason. And dear Avira was on top of the list even so, long black hair curling gently over her shoulders and G-sized breasts meant to feed a dozen children. Your wish is my command, Lady Inquisitor. At least a dozen children, I suppose. I quipped while groping those great prizes. Oh. At least that, yes, the black-haired beauty whispered in a slight daze. 
Much later, I was having dinner and pushing Canis away from my food when Lady Valaine sat beside me and watched me in silence. I think the mystery is solved, Lord Lancefire. I will absolve you of the silly suspicion of corrupting inquisitors. However, I have one condition, the woman demanded raising her tone a little. I turned to measure the bionic inquisitor in surprise. Don't tell me. Really? I asked quite confused. Not like that, damn idiot. But, my written you could use a couple of blanks to cover my activities from farcers and other psychers in that cabal. Perhaps a null rod for myself, if you have it. Valaine asked in a more pleading voice. Well, blanks were quite rare indeed. Especially after a host of psyker groups started hunting them down, from navigators to inquisitors and a dozen influential groups in between, including Chaos and Genestealer cults, Eldars, and even Necrons who made anti-psyker weapons from blanks. I pretended to think about it, before sipping my wine to wash off my meal. It might be possible, Lady Valaine. But the same rules apply. You want blanks, you give birth to them. It's the only way I will allow it, and make sure you'll take care of my children. The woman scowled in disgust, as if having sex with me would be a chore. That's not, I'm way over the biological limit anyway. I was over the limit a thousand years ago, she explained in a low growl. Oh, that explained why she was trusted to check on me, being this old and shriveled inside. So, I just nodded wisely and caressed her scared face. Then you need a miracle, my dear. Luckily, you came to the right person. We shall see to it, after the Tyranids are defeated. Ludvias chuckled and held his thumb up, while Canis grumbled something like, Old bitch. An hour later, the first bioships of the Tyranids began entering the system, and thus my Tesseract's range and I kind of forgot about this promise. Too busy coordinating the fleet and setting up ambushes and surprise detonations. As always, blowing up the Tyranids in the void was much better than letting them reach a planet, but sadly my fleet was much too small to intercept 10 million bioships. Over the week, non-stop raids and harassment have forced the Tyranids to disperse somewhat as to avoid being splashed by Nova shells and lose thousands of destroyer-sized organisms with every detonation. So I began to cheat and fire Nova shells at the larger organisms while small bioships were stolen and then released back inside the explosion's radius. This worked great, and the Tyranids were powerless to adapt. Only a million bioships from High Fleet Dagon reached the orbital forts, and less than a tenth managed to drop transport spores on the planet. It was still a trillion-sized mass of teeth and claws and bioplasma guns and many other biological and psyker organisms, but Avalos was a dead world, polluted and radiated by millennia of careless exploitation. That made orbital bombardment feasible and quite advantageous, striking the dance spores on the ground with lances and plasma cannons, while thousands of torpedoes created a barrage of death and blood mist in orbit. And since the polar defense lasers did not have to contend with atmospheric dispersion, a single shot could core a dozen bioships at once, while the battle barges were constantly teleporting plasma warheads directly inside the Tyranid vessels, instead of space marines. Cato Sicarius wasn't too pleased with my innovative use of teleports, so I told him to land and defend the Hive City's walls. It would come to a melee fight eventually, and the guy was a superb swordsman. Captain Khan and most of the Blood Angels and Death Watch Astartes received the same task, supported by Silent Sisters and Lamenter Tech Marines. There was even a company of Dark Angels, all fitted with Multimeltas and Storm Shields, waiting beside the Knights of House Lancefire. It would be the safest place on the battlefield, but perhaps the worst too. And then the horizon grew dark with Tyranid hordes, and artillery shells began landing among the first waves. Our drones and ground attack crafts with servitor brains took off to launch incendiary bombs and missiles over the rolling terrain of horrors. While the skies filled with bombers and fighters vying for air supremacy with Tyranid flyers. Our corvettes were ordered into low orbit over the Hive City, providing an extra screen against spores and flyers, as well as precise loss cannon fire of lower energy output. There wasn't much I could do right now, except hope my strategy was solid, and that the wall of firepower will be enough. 
There were thirty bane blades and sixty doom hammers forming the bulwark against the terror, and sixty Macarius Omega armed with plasma cannons, backed up by fifty hundred sentinels and three thousand armed sentinels, six thousand guardian turrets and thousands of chimeras and hydras and manticores, all unleashing hell towards the invading Xenos. And they just melted and broke, especially when the knights added their colossal firepower and the wall turrets entered effective range. I smiled and focused on winning the orbitals, as the ground troops could take care of themselves. This was how humanity should fight everywhere, and while the Tyranids were the object of the lesson, the recipients were those Astartes and officers taking part in the fight, and seeing what we could do when we were not sabotaging ourselves. And when the fighting reached the walls, I handed over a chronoglave to Lady Valaine and sent her and her death watch guards right beside Cato Sicarius and Captain Khan, and gave the Inquisitor the miracle she needed. The Emperor protects, dear Valaine. Pray hard and strike the Xenos, and you will see. I whispered in her mind while Ludvius and Rafin prayed hard near my sounding board. I will need the angel to make this work, because healing was not among my abilities. Did I cheat? Lie and steal? Of course I did. Nothing our dear emperor wouldn't do. In a golden glow, the sanguiner appeared beside Ludvius and stared at the three of us with dead, stone eyes. The space twisted, bringing the shadow light out and touching his free hand, making the warp construct increase in power a dozen times. He became more solid, larger, and grew armor plates over the golden body, and the dead eyes flickered almost alive. Almost. Not yet Primar, but soon. Death will not bar my way. Go and help humanity, angel. And do heal Inquister Valaine. Can't have the mother of my children be a dried husk with half-cyborg organs. I said towards his mind. The angel smiled sadly and poked the ancient artifact almost curious. Then he teleported away, slashing hundreds of tyranids on his path and illuminating the hive city walls with his golden aura. Wounds began to stop bleeding and even restore themselves, drained imperial guardsmen and terrified PDF soldiers were invigorated and motivated, and his forced sword could slash with beams a dozen kilometers long, evaporating half of the enemy force in only a minute. Among the golden glow covering the entire Hive City, the Silent Sisters were now visible as dark spheres, and a dozen more people in the city were not glowing, instead looking normal, dirty and poor like most Hive dwellers, but not glowing. Well, that was an easy way to detect blanks, so thank you, Angel. Those blanks vanished in my labyrinth before the superstitious locals could grab them and have them lynched or something. I guess we could repeat this miracle on the next hive world, probably Castabel if it was still standing. New seemed CH-130. Can't say I was really surprised when a silver-haired beauty, with rosy cheeks and newly grown deep blue eyes joined me in bed, eager to repay me for the miracle. Lady Calistrati was now grumbling beside me, for giving the other Inquisitor the idea of sharing my bed. Just wait your turn, pretty lady. There's plenty of P.E.F. to share. I answered in a genial voice and drew the woman into a deep kiss while fondling her with grabby hands. Fine. It's not like the two of us will be enough anyway, the black-haired model allowed in a softer voice, struggling to regain her breath. Indeed, I had Sister Letitia on the menu tonight as well, the glorious siege and the glowing finale having determined the elder silent sister to join my family and produce a hundred children to defend humanity. Well, nothing like seeing the immensity of the task ahead, I guess. Letitia only had to gaze at the roiling ocean crashing towards her to realize we needed many more of us to stop them. And this Tyranid Hive fleet was still among the smaller ones, even if divided into a hundred tendrils to reach for food in more places. Damn bugs were sustaining themselves by foraging, which was both clever and a weakness. Soon the last remains of Hive Fleet Kraken would destroy the Necron world of Sarlacc, and Trazen will owe me another favor for eliminating yet another rival. But Necrons had a million tomb worlds or more, each of them a match for an Imperium's forge world. The Necrons possibly had enough numbers to match the Tyranids in their stasis vaults and plenty of advanced weapons. Plus those enslaved Tans, each of them a match for a Segmentum battle fleet if unleashed. 
and defending Hive worlds one by one was slightly futile in the long term, except for the immediate gains of requisitioning millions of women for my colonies, plus setting up less corrupt governments indebted to me and my house, cleaning up the underhives and upgrading the defenses to modern standards. For wherever my fleet went, I had absolute judicial power as commander of a crusade, plus inquisitors and astartes to enforce my edicts. It seemed amazingly stupid to me for a hive world to have more than 100 billion people, yet muster less than a million as soldiers. On my orders, the new governor had to raise a billion soldiers over the next 100 years, and the local tech priests' covens were also tasked with raising a billion new acolytes, engine seers, and tech priests to support the militarization. The PDF troops were given under the jurisdiction of the Adeptus Arbites during peacetime, increasing their ability to patrol every corner and enforce imperial law by a million times. Then I ordered the construction of a dozen underground hives with a fortress on top, about 10 kilometers from the main hive city, such that overlapping fields of fire could protect each of them from invaders. It would be the work of generations, but already Avalos was twice as productive as before, and that will keep growing as more and more people got technical training as tech priests. They also had blueprints for system corvettes and a planetary reality cage to be constructed once they had sufficient numbers and materials. A week later, we arrived at Hive World Castabel to find only four Hive cities still resisting the immense hordes surrounding the battered walls, while a fleet of starved Tyranid bioships were blockading the planet from astropath messages or warp engine ships. It wasn't even hard to destroy the lethargic Xenos, first clearing the orbit with Nova cannons and heavy lances, then scouring the Tyranid hordes on the surface with our corvettes and bombers. I wasn't about to sacrifice millions of guardsmen to liberate the devoured hive cities, so those infested cities were just melted into boiling slag, to be mined for metal once they stopped glowing. Reorganizing the hive world into a productive place took longer than cleaning up the starved tyrannid armies, even if a thousand corrupt officials, priests, and nobles had to be burned publicly to restore morale. However, Castabel had been heavily militarized already, and had many factories and manufacturums producing weapons and munitions to keep the Tyranids away, and all they needed were a few billion servitors and tech priests to increase production, both on the ground and from their future shipyards. From here, we scoured the Jericho Reach for an entire year, often finding only devoured husks of planets, cultist worlds, and a couple of verdant worlds being devoured just then, like Phonos. Well, it is why the fleet carried so many exterminators torpedoes to purge the Xenos and Heretic with holy fire. Then we headed north, passing by Sternak to aid with a band of Nergulite Chaos Marines lead by some guy naming himself Mephidast, which was much too easy after his blighted cruiser appeared deep inside the sun. We kept going, liberating planet Obliterax from another Tyranid tendril named High Fleet Jormungandr. More ships joined the crusade when we reached Hive World Sephrax, including five heavy drop cruisers hastily prepared for me by friendly Forge Worlds. Well, I wouldn't say no to a couple of Navy battleships anyway, plus a dozen battlecruisers equipped with warp-less engines. It was how things worked in the Imperium, crusades gathering momentum with every glorious victory, or the survivors fleeing in shame and terror after getting mauled by superior forces. From there we headed towards Gidron II, and then Sarposia, and reached Forge World Megire just in time. This world had been on my gift list, and they were sort of prepared, even massing thousands of system corvettes and dozens of Arc Mechanicus cruisers, and they had orbital defenses on gigantic scale, including forts with Nova cannons, minefields, and vortex torpedoes to shoot at the largest hive ships. The arrival of my crusade only hastened the victory, and introduced me to a new inquisitor lady named Zaretta Underscornjairai, whose name sounded Spanish but was most likely Japanese in some distant past. Or possibly both, who knows? She had Asian eyes and rich blonde hair, which kinda made me drool a little. Sadly, there was little time for meet and greet and something else, or Lady Jairai simply didn't like me. Sounds impossible, I know. But who can tell what's in a woman's mind? It might have been the two other inquisitors beside me, holding babies in their arms. But they looked so cute, so it can't be that. Probably it was, though. 
I made a note to appear single and lonely the next time I meet her, and perhaps not flirt with the psyker lady in her written use. Probably it was in bad taste. Still gave Zaretta a dozen expensive gifts, because I was rich enough and powerful religious relics were useless in my inventory. And maybe the advice to get herself a squad of Death Watch Marines from Ejida will come in handy one day. You never knew when you might need some troubleshooters on your side. So you're not always successful, Lord P.E.F. Lady Valaine murmured while glancing at the departing Lady Jairai with something of a wry voice. I sighed inward and declined to answer. Sometimes you had to lose a battle to win the war, and I was dealing with too many unknowns. It will be as the Emperor wills it, my lady. Miracles can happen. I answered in a gentle voice and kissed the baby girl. Little Viria was a blank like Valaine wanted, and when she'll grow up she will be her mother's shield. The boy cooking in the oven was a blank as well, and he'll be the shield for all humanity. Whatever the angel did to Valaine, it surely worked great if all of our children will be born blank. Lady Adria's boy was completely normal, if a tad too big. That boy will likely be a giant, and thus we named him Hercules. He had my blonde hair and his mother's eyes, which will certainly be useful when I sent him to seduce the daughters of dozen rogue trader dynasties. And while we waited at Forge Maguire for repairs and a dozen Catacan regiments to be equipped to my standards, a certain infocyte named Calixa arrived on Andrea's battlecruiser with news and feats worthy of a whole adventure novel. Most of those involved trying to create an alliance with a rogue trader house based on the rich mining world of Nusim, and then the brutal murder of said rogue trader, the planetary governor, the mining bosses known as the Ore Masters, most of the miners themselves, and almost half the planet. Sounds bad, but it involves a genistealer cult known as the Rusted Claw, and a crashed void ship infested with genistealers. Luckily, for the good guys I mean, Sly Marble was there, to even the odds. So, my dear Andrea has inherited her own warrant of trade, by marriage and inheritance or vice versa. Plus the ownership of a mining world rich in adamantium and other precious metals. Sure, those nobles signing over the transfer may have been slightly broken and coerced, but then such is life in the 40k universe. Sometimes an anvil named Sly Marbo drops on you and crushes your dreams. As it happens, I had a forge world right here always in need for minerals and able to provide servitors and tech priests in exchange for a sizable portion of those minerals. I could bet a throne on that. 